I told my wife, I was like, listen, we can't just move for deer. That seems really or stupid. Can, or can yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> Pack your I'm shit, like, Sarah. We're moving. <laughs> like, this is, I'm like, really? Am I that obsessed with whitetails? The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Man, it's almost food plot season, Jared, and Deer Grow is one of those products that has really changed the way that we plant food plots and the success we've seen from them. No doubt. I've been, you know, trying to plant food plots my, my entire you know, whitetail hunting career, which is a little shorter than yours. But the minute that I started or that I, you know, I realized that I could get Deer Grow back into some of these remote plots where I couldn't get lime or fertilizer, especially in the 50 pound bag, you know, format, mm-hmm. so everything was changed. You know, I could get into these spots uh, moving forward with a, with a backpack sprayer and that since escalated to these 40 or 60. Uh, gallon sprayers and we're doing upwards of you know five to ten acre food plots just with your grow and having phenomenal success yeah and i mean with the price of fertilizer lime diesel everything this year i mean what better way to get in there and grow a successful food plot at about a third of the cost check out deer grow at deergrow.com and we're back hey on our podcast episode 132 Nick still in South Carolina. Yeah, soaking up the sun. I, I did talk to him. Did you? Other. I was going to say, wait a minute. After the last podcast, I was supposed to make sure he was still alive. I checked. I, I, checked. I forgot. I was the mom. Yeah, <laughs> so, he's got to. He's got to mark himself safe on that. I stuff. know. I know. He uh, <laughs> now he's they're getting settled in and uh, mm-hmm. you know grocery shopping, checking out the pool, checking out the scene. Maybe he'll come back with like a, a southern twang. Getting settled in. I don't know if that's a southern twang type of area. Yeah. Oh yeah, Charleston. Is it? Yeah, for sure. That's down south. That's like Southern Bell territory. Yeah, but it's on the coast. It's a lot of, yeah, it's a lot of Ritz. <laughs> Bunch of uh, <laughs> Outer Banks type people. I, I I don't, I have no perspective. I was literally there for six hours. We got off a, <laughs> a cruise that stopped there and it was, it was in the winter. So it yeah. was cold. We stopped and got some beer and looked at Smart. And it's then, cool. It's, yeah, it's a cool place. Um, It definitely is like old Southern charm. Charleston area. Let's do that too. I don't know. Freaking nail jeans, man. Yeah. Get in the the old lip. Yeah. Get water. Up. Well, I got this fake tooth here. See, I got my tooth back in. Uh huh. Yeah. Got nice. It. Got a temporary. The old for, faker. Temporary for a month or so, and. Is that what it'll take to to get it? Uh yeah, yeah. So they they built this one with like composite. It was pretty impressive. Um, I don't know. It's kind of an insurance thing. It's like because apparently you're only, they they only cover uh, one new crown like every five or seven years. No, like that's how long it's supposed to last. But my insurance has changed. I think yeah. since the last one. So I don't know. It could be like a thousand, thousand, uh, I thousand still think, bucks. I mean, it's still pretty bad because I like our dental insurance costs like nothing. But then I go in for a crown and it's like a thousand bucks. Yeah. Well, there just isn't good dental insurance. I don't. I don't think it exists. I would agree with that. Yeah, or at yeah. least that's what they're telling me. So. <laughs> it sounds right. It sounds uh, I don't right. know. Well, that's where my FSA account's coming in pretty handy. Because mm. FSA, right? Yeah, FSA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, HSA. HSA. Yeah. Health savings. I was account. thinking of farm. Farm service agency. Farm service. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so my HSA accounts that because I can essentially pay for it with. Yeah. Uh, it's a business expense, kind of. Yeah. Um, but yeah, got that squared away, and it has rained. We got rain yesterday. So Two much days rain, ago. and well, almost an inch of rain, and, and more coming. <laughs> So praise the Lord. And you could hear the plants screaming for that. I know. We timed it right. So we both got beans in on Friday, and then I finished on Saturday. Yeah. I got some screen in on Saturday, too. <clears throat> um, and I mean, dude, it was dry. I know. Dust, Super dust dry. Bowl. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, we hit that rain good. We got another bout coming in in the northern part of our farms tonight, and then I think more sometime this weekend. Yeah. So, I mean, it plenty of rain in the forecast. That'll at least get it going. Um, yeah. So, I don't know, because you end up, you do Roundup Ready Beans, right? Yeah, I planted the real world beans. Mm-hmm. Real you, world beans. Yeah. Do you go, when do you go back in and spray? Or do you spray? Uh, I Googled it last night, because I, 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 it's yeah. like three to four weeks after planting. Makes sense. So, like, July 4th to July 10th, I'll go in and spray. Yep. And and I planted a little later, uh, so I I had intended to plant like three weeks, two, three weeks like ago. Like Memorial Day. Uh-huh. And so we sprayed and put fertilizer down, and then it just dried, dried. out. So mm-hmm. I was like, well, I'm just going to hold off. And so I've got a little bit of greenery coming back, but I'm sure with this rain, you know, it'll it'll yeah. bounce. And uh, so, yeah, three, four weeks will be my plan. Makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, I mean, hell, not long after that, spraying for summer plots. If I, I might do it at the same time, just start nuking everything. July, 
eh, yeah. I'll, I mean, it'll I'll, be second week of it'll July. Be, it'll be right after. So I'll, I'm, I'm planning on like an August 1st plant date this yep, year. That sounds right. Again, weather dependent. It's, it's real hard to tell because it's like if it's, if it's real dry in August and September, you want to have planted mid July. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if it's adequate rain, you will, you know, so, so sometime August. between mid July and August 1st, we'll get, get them in. Yep. It makes sense. I'm not tilling either, though, dude. I've had I've had real good luck with just uh, spray and my, so I checked my clover the other day that I planted in uh, May. Yeah, May and in April. I, you know, you call it a frosty, but it wasn't frosting mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. And also, all I did was put uh, put my seed down and I put my fertilizer down and I sprayed gly, mm-hmm. and it looks looks good. All things considered, with the rain, it looks pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's what you'll do for your brassica. Same thing with the brassicas. You do that for your cereal grains too. Same thing with the cereal grains. So typically my cereal grains are going into save a plot that I tried to plant. I mean, that saves a ton of time. Yeah. Like if I could just go nuke it and fertilize and seed and not have to worry about disking or drilling even. In. Well, and the main thing is weed prevention. I'm sure. not turning over turning the soil. Turning over soil. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the main thing is seed size. So, I mean, yeah, if you if you put enough oats down, they're going to grow. Uh, yeah, I would grow my truck seed. Uh, yeah. and But but certainly with uh, clover and brassicas, it's you know, as long as you got a, a timely rain shortly after, it's, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and it helps that the plots. It's small seed, before. so it works into that so- seed to soil contact that's real right. easy. That's the main thing. Yeah, versus your beans and your corn, which are much larger seed. Yeah, so that's what I rented the drill. Mm-hmm. There was a great plains drill. Dude, mm-hmm. I, oh, that thing's nice. $25,000. I mean, that, that's a Cadillac. And I don't know why you'd ever buy one. I mean, it's yeah, it's kind of inconvenient to, to yeah. you know. But I mean, if you can get it, or your your you know county has it, and they were cool about it. They're like, yeah, you know, he gave it to me last Monday. Mm-hmm. You know, the the neighbor that was using it just dropped it off at like the church parking lot. Yep. <clears throat> and I was like, hey, it's not going to rain here for another week. Can I hold off for a little bit? And he's like, yeah, it's, you're you're good. It's fine. Damn, that's awesome. It took me about four hours to put those twelve acres of beans in. It was a seven foot drill, mm-hmm. uh, and they have a ten. Uh, which that's a beastly machine. Would have gone a little quicker, but yeah. you know. Whatever. Our guest probably is using bigger machines in, in his neck of the woods. Yeah, I would assume so. And got, got some of, Iowa equipment. Yeah, Iowa equipment. So it is, what is it, June 13th? Yeah. June 13th, so midway through June, you're listening to this, I don't know, it's June 20th or something like that. Yeah. Um, crazy to think that we're almost in July. Uh, we, we've got racks on bucks. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a really racks, good one on racks camera. Racks on bucks. I just, I have one or two cameras out just, just for, just to, you know, scratch the edge. Yeah, just a little tease. I've got, I've got a slammer on one of them. Yeah, that deer's going to look good. Yeah. You know, as long as he doesn't, uh, doesn't throw just short tines, I mean, he'll be, that'll be a good deer. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, that's the, we don't know. We don't right? know. But he's looking good. He's framing up for 150 plus. Yeah. That'll be a good one yeah. for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, lots of things moving. Uh, I signed my timber contract this week, mm. so I don't know when they'll start taking timber off. I'll know at some point in the next few weeks. Sold your timber. Sold my timber, um, or select cut, you know, and obviously strategic, some, some strategic clear cuts in there as well. Um, but that would be a big move on that Ohio piece. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, to really change that. So, I roll, mean, we're into Roll some of that point. into an Illinois farm. Very possible. Yeah. We're on, looking. On the, on we're the looking. horizon here. Yeah, we're looking. So, yeah, man, things are going to happen fast here. I mean, before we know it, we're in July, and yeah. I mean... we're li- You're late. It's already, it's already too late. I know, <laughs> man. It's it's freaking nuts. So... But starting to pick some stuff up, picking new boots up. I got my new 125, uh, you know, heads on my mm-hmm. arrows. We're start, starting to get back in a routine you know, here. I put, I put my uh, my recurve together last night. Mm. Might probably get out and shoot it a little bit. A little string up. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it'll be good. But uh, we've got a cool guest today, um, somebody that most people listening to this are probably going to recognize. Uh, Josh Bomar is on the podcast. And, um, you know, I think that obviously if you – so a couple things. Um, you know, one uh, – Again, most people know of Josh and his background, him and Sarah on the hunting side, but maybe they don't know Josh from a personal aspect. So we're going to probably get into that a little bit today. And then obviously talk about some of the things that have come down the pike even the last you know year or two from Josh that maybe haven't put him in such great light. Um, and, you know, I think we've had this discussion before where, you know, when you talk about being in a spotlight sense, right, um, you're you know, everybody's going to be super critical of you. Um, and so, you know, whether it's, you know, something small or something big, you know, or just the way that it gets twisted online anymore is probably the biggest case. 
Um, you know, it's it's hard to take uh, to to your point a lot. There is no authority or there is no censorship filter out there on a lot of this stuff from an approval standpoint. So things are just said and thrown out there, and it's kind of up to you as the the listener or the watcher to interpret it as as true, yeah. right? Um, so what's going to be cool about this is, you know, I know what a few weeks ago we talked to Brandon McDonald to kind of some of the the Bomar stuff that came up. You know, now we're getting it from the horse's mouth, right? Yeah. Which this is the source, um, and so you know, it, not even just hovering on these kind of specific topics, but, you know, Josh and Sarah are coming from a point where, I mean, they've got a lot of people with eyeballs on them. Um, and so just maybe hearing from Josh's standpoint about some of the things we talked a little bit pre podcast about some of the comments and things like that, you know, it's not, um, it's not something that is just a super easy place to be. Um, and you know, you kind of have to have some tough skin, especially in, in this space, I think. And I mean, we've even as small as we are have, have found that out quickly that you just kind of have to like, yeah, yeah, okay. That's your opinion, dude. You yeah. know, well, ignore it or embrace it. And I'm, mean, there's, uh, you know, which of those two approaches is, is right. I, I don't know, but, um, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. So, and I've talked to Josh a few mm -hmm. times on the phone and like, uh, we're going to give him a chance. Seems like a, a really great guy. Yeah. You know? And so like from our from our perspective, like certainly, and I would imagine that there are some element of this is like, dude, Josh is killing maybe two, more 200 inch deer than anybody. We I, mentioned that more a than anybody, podcasts, maybe yeah. more than yeah. anybody, dude, like ever. I don't yeah. know. Consistently. And like, dude, who, who doesn't aspire, right. To kill some of the biggest deer that you can. And, uh, so, and Josh is actually from Ohio originally, mm -hmm. which we can relate to. And so, you know, there, there's a jealousy aspect, right? There, there has to be, it's like, dude, this guy is, which is jealousy spawns questions of like, how, how is this possible? Because we all know how rare a 200 inch deer is. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super rare. Right. So then the questions start to come up and, and part of it, and it'll be cool to kind of hear Josh's take on this is, you know, some of the things that have come up recently from this Nebraska outfitter business to then all immediately when that happens, well, then of course other things are going to come into question, yeah. right? Like, well, what else is yeah, happening? Yeah, sure. It, it's just the, it's just the immediate thing. It's just like if somebody dopes when they're doing sports, immediately they do a strong performance the next year and they're like, well, and dude's doping again, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, it certainly it just makes happens. you question. Yeah. I mean, and that, that's what happens, but I, and I don't know, but you know, before we make our own judgments, you know, we're going to, we're going to, yeah. we're going to talk to Josh and, and hear his side of it. So yeah, be awesome. Let's get Josh on. Let's roll. Okay. Well, thanks for having me on guys. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, dude, we appreciate it. it it's funny. I, you know, Jared was kind of saying earlier there, you know, we try to open this podcast up and it's gotta be torture for you to sit there <laughs> and we're talking about you without the ability to try it. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my gosh, I have so much to say on each topic. Yeah. It's like, I would love to cover all of them. You know, yeah. obviously with your guys' previous podcast with Brandon and uh, there were so many questions brought up about us. Well, me, particularly. And, and honestly, I don't mind diving into each and every one of them. Um, for me, I love sharing and helping people. So when you talk about 200s, you know, I was like you guys, I just dreamt of doing it. And I finally figured out some of the, I wouldn't say secrets to, to getting a 200, but I figured out the work that it took. You know, a lot of guys, when it comes to chasing big deer, they're running east looking for a sunset and they could run really hard. They're never going to see it. And so there's some certain things to be able to align yourself to be able to get into that right spot. And then, you know, you can work hard and it will pay off eventually. And uh, we can dive into all of that. It'll be fun. And and I know you guys are from Ohio. It's where I grew up. Obviously, that's huge. And uh, there's some really big ones in Ohio. And they're, they're not easy to find just like anywhere. But uh, Ohio is special to me just because obviously I lived there pretty much my whole life. Yeah, man. Well, dude, out of the gate, how many 200s have you killed? I have now killed six. Oh my gosh. That's insane. And is there anybody that you know of that's killed more than you? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of people that's probably killed more. Um, spook span is one of them. I mean, that eh. guy has, has killed a lot of 200 inch deer. Um, in terms of like people that, grow them, you know, like I'm doing like on my own farms and doing all that. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if anyone does it. Spook travels a lot and shoots them all over the place. And he does shoot a lot of them on his own farm um, too. So it's, it's kind of hard to say, but uh, honestly, other than Spook, I don't know of anybody. Cause I know? mean, we hear, we hear it from, well, even like a guy like Higgins, right? So Don's killed, I don't know, three or four. 
Um, but he's one who's openly admitted, like, he's, you got to go find them, right? I mean, he's not growing them necessarily on a single parcel uh, or, or a group of parcels that he's constantly yeah. like, I mean, he's out same, same looking is true with like Adam, Adam, Adam Hayes, Hayes. <laughs> yeah, you know, in Ohio. And for sure, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if there's guys who, who don't have like a, so, a, a following or like a, a, an online presence, you know, because th those are just the guys who are like notable for promoting the fact sure. that here's how you do it. Here's what I've done to do it, you know. Right. Well, in coincidence. Yeah, I, yeah, go ahead, Josh. I, I've shot every single one of my 200s on my own ground. See, like, and I think wow. that's that's the quick because you know you bring up Spook. Spook's also a guy who you know has been in the limelight for not great stuff in the past as well. Um, well, frankly, that's that's, and I don't, he might have been a, a a little bit ahead of my time, but like that's all I know about Spook was the fact the that Kansas Tennessee yeah yeah issue yeah, yeah. that's yeah. what a lot of people I think know him for. And again, goes back to kind of the pre podcast when we're talking about Josh is like when you're in this kind of a limelight. Sometimes the things that happen negatively are the things that you end up getting most pegged with, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, as soon as that happens, you become a target of any sort of investigation of anything. It It is kind of plagued you for the rest of your life. And I mean, enough time can pass to where you're like, okay, that happened 25 years ago and, you know, it, nothing's happened since. And it can go away. It could become part of your story. It doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing. Yeah. You know, for Sarah and I, you know, we battled that with the whole Nebraska thing for, gosh, for almost a decade. And and we've been under a microscope ever since, and nothing's really happened, you mm -hmm. know. And so that that helps. But, I mean, dude, it does not help shooting giant deer. I mean, sure. as soon as you shoot big deer, I mean, every neighbor that you have is going to call and, and say, he's doing something shady over there. I never got that deer on camera. I mean, you name it. Um, I'm sure they're doing it. And same thing with Spook. I mean, Spook, where that came from with with that history, he shot the largest whitetail in history on camera. And it had, have you guys ever seen that that hunt, that no, video? I don't think I have. Oh, my God. It is still to this day, arguably one of the best hunting videos ever. It'll send chills down your spine. He <laughs> shoots at spot and stalk on the ground at like nine yards. It was like a 250. Jeez. It was insane. Kansas and I, I don't know the intimate details of that situation but basically what ended up happening if I can summarize and I my god I, I'm ruining this if I, I hope I I don't say anything um, oh so uh -oh. fell off the wall back there but <laughs> I hope I don't say anything out of out of context but basically what I heard from that was he shot in Kansas on his own ground or a ground he leased using a landowner's tag and it was a year they switched like the rules where um, you still had to draw in that same unit. Mm. Um, and in years previously, and I think it was as simple as the lady printed off the wrong tag type of thing. Mm. Um, but, but what ended up happening was he got on the cover of North American whitetail and did all this stuff and got really famous and his camera guy didn't. So then his camera guy, you know, turned against him mm. um, because and held footage hostage, forced him to pay him more money, did all this crazy stuff. And then, it just, it got really bad, really fast. Wow. You know? And he was the first person to have a worldwide ban um, on where he couldn't hunt anywhere in the world for like <sighs> years. Wow. It was crazy. It, the story's pretty sad, to be honest. Like um, the justification for what was done to him. And, and the truth is he took him to court and it's just been fighting him and he's been winning now. And you don't see that anymore. Like, yeah, you don't he hear about like, it at all. No, and he just won a massive deal against the Tennessee um, thing. I mean, he is coming out on top now, but again, unfortunately, damage been done. Is, is this the same incident damage. that like we were referring to? Is this just yeah, a, a so. misunderstanding with a Kansas tag? Yeah, the it's so it's so stupid. I mean, it like the again, you know, if the law is broken, and regardless of the of the deal, I mean, you should pay your fines. You should do all that sure. stuff. But, but mistakes do happen over a, a yeah. by the wrong tag is kind of silly. I mean, there was no illitent and malicious behavior and, you know, and that's, I'm pretty sure it was huh. the, the first year it changed, you know, the rules and all that stuff. But again, wow. I could be a little bit inaccurate. Yeah, Cause I don't know. Fact. I mean, that's definitely the question is like, cause, cause you know, laws get broken accidentally. I think all the time it's, it's the, cause intent. I think he got, and, thrown and we just certainly don't know the, the Lacey act at him for, for something in, you know, I don't know if it was transportation of, of wildlife, like, 
you know how we well, can't. Dude, and here I am in that court of like, well, that's what I heard. Yeah, I know. And I mean, <laughs> and that's I, and I, the, hate, I don't want to be that guy. But I think to Josh's point, I mean, you know, the fact that he's been winning – uh, damage has been done. Like uh, nobody's even. I mean, if you would ask, well, I would we say, we had no idea that these court cases were even going on. Well, I was going to say, if you ask most people right now who Spook Span is, they have no idea. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the problem with today's world is like um, a lot of the guys that, that he films most of his hunts, but he never put them on YouTube. Yeah, and um, until I would assume recently, I, th I think he's probably going to start or has put a few. I've seen a couple of them on there. Maybe it's not even him. But if you're not producing content where people are consuming it I, my gosh that's a whole topic in itself you know it's uh you know a bit like chuck adams and all that stuff a lot of people wouldn't know who that is exactly or do you guys know who jack frost is like that bow hunter no he's he's one of the most accomplished bow hunters of all time he's done like the grand slam oh my gosh with the bow many times and i mean insane but nobody knows because he doesn't film his hunts hmm. yeah. and and that's the problem is your legacy is kind of tied to the amount of content that you're producing and sharing. But guys, it is, as you know, when you start filming your hunts, it makes everything a thousand times more difficult oh, yeah. to be successful. Yeah. yeah. And so, oh my gosh, it is, it is, it makes it almost impossible. <laughs> that's and, why Jared uh, and I don't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, I don't think it was because of the level of difficulty. I'm sure that was a factor it was it was the fact that the level of difficulty made it less enjoyable uh right. for us uh, for us you yeah, know i was like man i you know i'm having a hard enough time getting on these deer as is and like to have to fumble with all that it's just a distraction i'm like well, i yeah, just i, I want to focus on hunting it wasn't a it wasn't a challenge thing it wasn't like difficulty challenge as much as it was like when you go out there and hunt you know if it's you and i out spotting and stalking and strategizing like that's fun if I've got to tell my camera guy what to do and if he steps on another stick, I'm going to break his neck, like that's not fun anymore, right? Yeah. That's that's not enjoyable. Well, and we don't enjoy filming. Like we enjoy the hell out of hunting. Like yeah. that's what we love to do. Uh, I don't enjoy filming stuff. I don't enjoy, don't get me wrong, I like watching it after the fact, like that's super cool. It'd be cool to have those memories and like you're saying that, you know, that legacy or whatever. Um, but I, am I willing to sacrifice my my peace of mind the focus that i have like during those couple months out of the year or during the hunt to, to do it the, the answer for jeremy and i at this time is is no mm -mm. you know but i certainly admire people that have the passion for both and it's like I, it's times i wish i had that but i i don't yeah <laughs> for me it's the complete opposite like i would never shoot a deer not on video yeah. ever like there's I, you know how many deer have survived literally late season i had a freaking almost it was pushing probably 160 at eight uh, it was he was coming through at like 14 yards and I was full draw on him with my longbow and ready to smoke him. And my camera guy wasn't on him and I let down and that was the last day of season. Mm. And, and so the, the camera is the most important part of the, the hunt for me, just because I get so much from being able to re relive that experience Yeah. And for you guys, you go on a hunt and you take a thousand photos, right? Mm -hmm. You take a thousand photos and then you go back, you know, maybe a year or two later and you bring up an experience, you end up showing one to two photos from that trip. You take a hundred deer photos and you bring one and that memory just gets consolidated down to that one photo. And then you start losing the details of the hunt mm -hmm. because you just forget life comes in. And that's what I love about filming is you don't lose any of those details. Yeah, it's annoying to have a camera with you and all these experiences and or all that extra effort it takes to get an extra person and a camera in close enough to bow hunt and be successful, you know, into the bow range and be successful. It's difficult, mm. but gosh, dang, when you get to relive and watch that experience, it's, it's so rewarding. But for me too, you know, I think where this stems for me is like my grandpa was a very, very, my entire family is very, very accomplished bow hunters. And I loved going to grandpa's house and hearing deer stories. Yeah. And he would tell in such vivid detail of all this stuff because he wrote it into in, in, like a journal, he wrote a book, oh, a yeah. journal, he wrote all this. So he could, he never forgot the details, the temperature, which way the wind was blowing, all those things. And for me, I was like, gosh, I just wish I could watch this. And yeah. Watch one episode of grandpa. <laughs> and for, so for me, I was like, my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids, they'll never say that because they can watch every animal I ever shoot. Um, in vivid detail for many camera angles and be able to, 
to to experience it as if they were there. And that is that is what's so exciting for me because now I just share that with the world mm. and people that may never get to experience it now get to experience what it was like yeah. to to hunt a 200 inch deer or go to Africa or do those things. And so I I take great solidarity from just the fact that I can harness or harvest the animal on video and be able to share that and experience it. And And for me, it's one of the most rewarding parts. Yeah, I I totally understand. I mean, I can definitely relate to that. I I think, uh, and and this is not at all to, um, to, uh, to, to belittle what is, is possible like in the Midwest or like, especially Iowa. I I think like one of the major deterrents is like, you know, I mentioned the level of, of difficulty, um, you know, Jeremy and I are from Pennsylvania, right? Where, where uh, the opportunity at deer like the ones over your shoulders are, they never happen. Like that, that's not real. Um, you know, we start getting into Ohio and yeah, okay. Now, now we have some opportunity. And Jeremy and I uh, in the past five, 10 years have been expanding our uh, our access, our opportunity. Like, you know, uh, you know, just uh, fr- from the connections that we've made and, the, and some of the properties Jeremy has bought and, and whatever, you know, we, we've gotten more opportunity. But the reality is, um, you know, in I'm 30 years old, Jeremy's 39. Mm-hmm. And in our whatever, 15, 20 years of bow hunting, I mean, dude, we can count on maybe two hands the number of deer over four years old that Jeremy and I have, have shot. Mm hmm. Right. It, it's it's not none. And it's it's a number I think we're probably proud of for the access that we've had. And we certainly passed on a lot of, you know, three year old type deer. But mm-hmm. dude, the struggle is real, you know, and, and we've we started to go out to the Midwest. And but the reality is that it's a week at a time at the very most. And like, you know, we're at a point now where, uh, you know, we're trying to get our dad's exposure just to what that can be like. Um, and it seems like, man, if if we if we had constant exposure to big deer, which nobody does, I'm not saying that that's what it is, but like, I think we can all acknowledge Iowa and Pennsylvania are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so if I could go out on on a daily basis or even on a consistent basis in a state like Iowa, where we have consistent opportunity to to capture footage worth capturing, uh, especially, you know, the harvesting Mm -hmm. of those animals, I think we would be more inclined to do it. You know, if it was like, man, killing big deer seems possible. It seems like something we can do. Um, filming them is, is not a far second, but we're still grasping like the, is it possible to kill these big deer? You know, (laughs) I think, I think it comes down to kind of where you are. So when I was in high school, so this would have been, I graduated in like Oh three. So probably like 2000, um, my buddies and I filmed every hunt that we did, right? I'm talking like doe hunts, you know, bow hunts, late flintlock. I mean, every hunt we were on because it was, you know, it was the cool thing for us to do. We had a blast rewatching those. And a lot of it came, you know, Josh, I'm glad you brought your grandpa was, you know, in probably the late eighties, I would say, you know, my family started VHS videotaping our deer camps. Right. And so like, even now, like I've digitized them. And so my kids are seven and 11. And so like before, like around Thanksgiving, I'll get them out and like watch like the old videos and stuff. And it's so nostalgic to me. Like, I mean, I, I'd give anything to be like back in that, like deer camp atmosphere side of things. But, you know, so when I got into the high school side of things, it was like those kind of things is what drove me to like, Hey, we should film this. This would be cool. And even still 20 years later, like watching those videos are, you know, I wouldn't shoot half of the deer that I shot back then. Right. But it was, it's fun to see why I captured it and what was, because it was just fun. Whereas now, you know, the challenge to me is to go out and kill mature buck. Um, You know, so there's a lot of boring hunts that I would film basically because of the encounters of mature bucks that I have, you know, during a given season. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think no matter whether you're shooting a doe or a 200, you know, filming it is either going to be the priority or it's not, right. you know, it's like, oh, I got a 200, I'm going to film it. When shit hits the fan and everything goes a wire, the camera's going to get thrown to the side, you're going to shoot the deer and it's not going to, it's not going to work or the cameraman's not on it. You're going to shoot. I don't care. It's happening. Right. And so it's, I think I think um, if you're going to film, just good is good enough. Mm-hmm. You know, I think a lot of guys, the production level that we kind of try to take our stuff to, it was never the end goal. I mean, we were just like, hey, what what can I afford? I can afford a GoPro, right? And boom, I'm like, okay, well, then I'm just gonna I'm just gonna, how I'm gonna film my hunts and and just doing the best you can with what you got is really where you start. You can advance through it, but dude, it's 
the the people I that's the problem with today's world is like especially and I'm guilty of it myself and the juries we make we, you guys have been able to see these really big deer get shot on camera and it almost feels normal um like oh that's just what's normal to see on YouTube now yeah. if it's yeah. not 170 inches then why yeah, who cares? Doing? Well, you don't see the years of preparation and struggle like yeah. in, in a seven minute YouTube video. You just see, you know, and some of us are guilty of just fast forwarding to here, 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 here he comes. <laughs> oh, screw this. I don't care. I just want to see the yeah, shot. And, yeah, yeah. And, and gosh, that, that part upsets me because I, I remember the day when just getting a deer with a bow was a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, and, like I grew up where whenever you shot a deer, you took it to the check station. Yeah. Check station. And that was the best part because. I mean, you get your buck, and if it's and it was a little eight pointer, didn't matter. You know, you're driving it through parading Absolutely, it through town, man. And and uh, you get to the check in station, everyone's admiring your bow kill. It's it was a big deal to get a deer with a bow, and uh, and and I miss those days, you know, because now if it's not a 200 inch deer and it's not filmed from 18 camera angles, I mean, no one really cares. Yeah. And and I. And that's the reality of it is what makes a video popular when it comes to deer hunting is, you know, the for one, the story. If it's got a cool story, it's got history that makes it entertaining. The difficulty of the weapon that you're using, you mm -hmm. know, makes it entertaining. Like if you shoot a doe with a with a longbow, I mean, that's yeah, it's cool. Cow. Yeah, it's cool. It's difficult, you know, um, and or it, that's why rifle hunting, you know, on YouTube, it has its places because there's rifle hunters that want to watch it. But it's just it's really hard to make those videos engaging and watching just yeah. because the, the, the world online has been polluted with so many hunting videos now that it's hard to, to, I guess, stand out. I yeah. Know. What's unique it's, about it? Yeah. There's no, it's hard to make it unique. And so you got to get creative <clears throat> with how you film or you got to get, you know, um, increase the difficulty of what you're chasing or you just shoot really, big stuff to be unique i guess I, and it's hard i don't i don't like it but. i think the production quality is a big thing that sets people apart mm -hmm. uh you that know and the story and I storytelling think. Is, yep. is a critical component of that i still think that today there's very few people that uh do a really nice job of putting together a very high level production mm -hmm. uh like yeah. you know I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's some I don't know about, but it's there's probably you know five or six or seven people out there that do a, a really nice that you know when I find a YouTube video that I'm not fast forwarding through because mm -hmm. there's all kind of people that put and I'll watch them you know like uh, just just a little do it yourself like mm -hmm. uh, those hunts are cool uh, and I'm glad that, that people do those. But what sets some people apart, you know, there's a, a class of guys that will do and and Josh, I'd say you guys are one of them that have just like uh, ultra high production value mm -hmm. um and the story carries through yeah that, thank you it's it's hard you know i mean <clears throat> a lot of people think oh well, i don't have a camera guy and an editing team i i can't do any of this stuff and you know i i filmed and edited all my own stuff for eight years yeah so like i a lot of the videos you see now um you know like the shorts and all that stuff i do a lot of that editing um i have camera guys and editors now um that are they you know i'm teaching them the pacing and all this stuff and then the big level, like the big like crocodile hunts and all of those, they're all in on that. Um, they're doing a hundred percent of those, and uh, and it's just working in that story. It's hard. It takes a lot of effort, but anything worth having, it always takes effort. You know, it's always going to be the next level of of difficulty, next level of overcoming, and in order to get that out there. And uh, I love that challenge. Anything that's challenging, it's exciting to me. And the camera side of things, I'm like, okay. Like this year with the turkeys, you know, we filmed them with this phantom camera, which it sounds like an airplane taking off. Like when you turn that thing on, a turkey can hear it 150 yards away. <laughs> it's like, and it takes 90 seconds to turn on. I mean, the, the, with all the gear that we brought into the woods, it was like, I think 200 plus pounds of gear. Jeez. We'd have to drive it in with the vehicle the day before, set all this stuff up. It's a two day process for one hunt, all to just film a turkey. And and then <laughs> it finally all comes together and, and, it, and it works. It's like, holy smokes, with all the different camera angles, GoPro and the decoys and and then everything works, you know, that's what makes turkey hunting with a bow exciting for me now, you know, just because uh, that level of difficulty made it made it challenging, but yeah. exciting to watch. And those videos did really well for us on social media this year. And uh, so it's kind of funny to kind of see it. But yeah, yeah it's uh, 
we'll probably try to do something crazy like that with deer hunting this year too. But. So Josh, do you have a cameraman with you now, like most of the time, or how do you guys, what, what's the, what's the process for filming hunts these days? Yeah. So, um, depending on the setup and whatnot, but usually 90% of the time I have a camera guy with me, okay. uh, the 200 I killed, um, two seasons ago, dozer, um, I self filmed, um, I self filmed wires, um, that deer I self filmed, I've self filmed a couple of my big ones, but it's only because, you know, I was hunting every single day right. or it, they, it's Christmas and the pressure's right. I'm hunting. I, no one's available. Yeah. It's usually the only time I don't have a camera guy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so now I have a camera guy and, um, or camera guys. Sometimes I'll have more than one depending. Usually in the deer woods, we only bring one. Right. And, uh, and then they, they'll they edit the video and produce it. Yeah. Is it kind of like whoever's available from a small pool of people that you, you know, you, that you work with? Or is it like, hey, it's it's me and this guy. Like, he's the only one that can stick by me and it's, you know. Yeah, I have, I have two full-time um, camera guys and editors now. So that's what they do full-time. So they'll they film me and that's part of the job. I don't care if it's a Saturday and it's your son's birthday, whatever. I'm, I'm always within reason, you know, sure. obviously. But it's like we got to hunt if yeah. the time is right we got to be out there and so that's kind of the 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 the, the setup that we have um and it's worked out pretty well and these guys are good hunters um you know most of them they they everybody follows the exact same protocols that i follow when it comes to you know scent control and everything else so it's uh it's it works <laughs> that, out pretty that's nice. like the hardest part uh. dude. we because we i you know and we can go into it if we want but you know so jeremy and i tried to film some, some hunts early on right and we the same deal we brought on some camera guys you know some guys that uh you know you know you know had, had a passion for hunting had you know had some uh, some filming skills and and it's funny you know how quickly you realize like the differences i mean even an experienced hunters like josh i'm sure between you and jeremy and i we all do some things a little different like, sure as far as like, well, i do that for my scent control i do mm -hmm. this or for my access i do mm -hmm. I, you know this is how we do it when i'm in a tree this is how it needs to mm -hmm. be uh and to try to plug a cameraman who you know may may not have that level of of experience or of uh you know, even I think passion for the yeah. hunt itself. In some cases, it's it's funny to realize like it's for us. I started finding like Old Spice in the shower, and and I'm like, oh, I'm like, yeah. what is this? Yeah. I was like, we're on a freaking deer hunt here. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I yeah, I think it goes back to the fact too is like if you're as ate up with it as we are, why in the hell do you want to be filming? <laughs> like I w I'd want to be in the tree that's, stand in that's November. The that's thing. it. <laughs> It, it, that's the other thing you get a camera guy that loves to hunt he'll not live through the lens and that's the hardest part for camera guys they'll yep. end up doing this and get into the experience <laughs> you know, a lot of dirt like oh oh crap uh, yeah uh, oh, oh crap you know because yeah. they're, they're experiencing it so there's a uh, it you either get a guy that's so experienced um that's seen so much stuff die that he doesn't care it doesn't it get him worked yeah. up you know like one of our, our guys, um, Bill Jackson, right now, he's extremely experienced and um, has done this for many years. And, you know, he lives in the lens. My other camera guy has never hunted. So he doesn't, he he doesn't know. Yeah, doesn't fathom it. Of a, mm -hmm. of a Boone and Crockett deer stepping into the field. He's like, oh, there's the subject to film. Yeah. And boom, 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 I'm just going to do it. So you see the different Tate, like the different like um, fingerprints into the videos that they shoot versus you know, a hunter versus non hunter, but it, it kind of creates a, a neat dynamic and an interesting viewing perspective. So I, I there's, there's arguments for both, but yeah. at the end of the day, if you're just starting out, just good is good enough. Your yeah. buddy, your buddy that d isn't working, grab them, you know, yeah. have them film you. I mean, you just gotta eventually you'll work your way up, you know, into bigger level productions, but hook, hook your phone up, you know, yeah. your, your bow whatever you could do just get get it done and film it and uh you'll eventually hone your skills of filming just like you hone your skills of hunting and you'll get good you know with enough practice and repetition i mean i would have rather and i did for a long time i self-filmed i'd i i just i couldn't fathom somebody else being in the tree with me i just I, like i'm just super particular of when i'm in the tree and how i control my own movements and everything i couldn't think of having somebody so i just i, I it may not have been as good a quality but i would have rather self-filmed than had somebody over my shoulder and that was yeah. just me yeah. in the stand no i totally understand and i and i honestly do really enjoy self-filming uh, but man, it, 
it's it tough. Will cost you, it'll cost you a deer. Yeah. If you do it long enough, it's going to cost you a deer yeah. because there's just that extra element of I got to get the camera right. And you watch Dozer, that Dozer hunt of mine. Oh my gosh, that deer almost got away, and I would have died because that deer never broke daylight. First time he broke daylight um, during deer season was the time I was sitting in the blind and he came out in front of me in a food plot that he'd never daylighted in. Jeez. And and it's a fun story. We can get into it if you want, but man, he was coming in. And when you get closer to the rut, I mean, it is almost impossible to self film and actually produce something halfway decent. Yeah. And he was just working his way down this edge. And I set it all up, went full draw. And I look over to before I shoot and he's leaving the frame. So I had to let down, crank mm. the camera. And, and then right before he left the, se the second time, I executed my shot and got him. But it was this close to not getting it on camera. And that was my last chance um, before he was gone. And those, the, your mature bucks, your target deer, whether it's, you know, uh, it doesn't matter the size on his head, as long as he's mature, you're, you're not going to get very many opportunities at those things. No. Yeah. And you start adding in other elements like filming and all that stuff. I mean, you got to be understanding, like it could cost you the hunt and uh, that, that makes it very difficult. But at the same time, you know, what, when it pushes through and you get it on camera, it'll be one of your favorite hunts of all time. Because now yeah. you can relive it anytime you want and your friends and family can experience it and they can share in the story with you. And, hey, I watched your hunt where you shot Ocho or whatever is the deer's name. And, mm -hmm. and gosh, that was so cool. And you made such a great shot and blah, blah, blah. And that's that will bring a whole other element of enjoyment to the experience and to the animal just from the camaraderie amongst the community or just your family just experience it. You don't have to have yeah. a large following to enjoy sure. it. Josh, one of the things that, and, and maybe this isn't, you can go through it with us from an evolution process, but, you know, obviously most um, industry content is is sponsor backed, right? I mean, that is the funding source for that. And, you know, you and Sarah obviously have some of your own products out there. Um, but it, at least to me, it seems like you guys have kind of gone a little bit further away than the typical, um, you know, cookie cutter, like, Hey, sponsors are going to fund this show and that's how we're going to do things. I mean, do you guys have some partners that you still continue to work with? No, we went sponsor free in 2016. Wow. So, and I'll tell you the reason, the reason was for us, we, this company, any companies that, that we were going to work with, they all wanted a lot more than what they were paying for. Sure. They have all these parameters. You got to post, you know, X amount of times per week and you got to mention us so many times in a video. And we used to do this. You can watch our old videos. And the the show ended up being about what we were using, not what we were hunting. Mm -hmm. And that is when I drew the line. I said, I, this isn't worth the amount of money for me to make this this unbelievable experience in, of, of hunting this particular animal that I've worked my freaking guts off trying to get this deer and doing all this stuff. And the history of this deer is now diluted down to I only got him because I was shooting a uh, Matthews or yep. I was only, hey, boy, this broadhead man really saved me. And I'm like, what? No, I hated it. I hated it with my soul. Um, <laughs> all the product plugging and all this stuff that I was forcing into these videos. And when it's organic, it's nice, you know, yeah. like gut shot that deer. Thank God I was using a five inch broadhead because it, it really saved me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. when things are relevant, you yeah. know, it makes sense sure. and the viewer appreciates that. But God, nothing irritates us watching a video more than seeing a product being forcibly plugged. And it's a we, lot of the agree. content out we there, agree. man. Yeah. It, it, it's <clears throat> it's tough to stomach. Um, because you feel like you're watching a, a 15 or 30 minute commercial, you know, yeah. and it's just like, it, it takes away from uh, the hunt, the experience. I think it, a lot of times it's disrespectful to the, to the animal itself because you're immediately trying to give praise to a product over the animal that you just harvested. Exactly. And that is the problem I had with it. Exactly what you just said. And it bothered me. And so we said, you know what, we're not going to, we're not going to deal with this um, anymore. And so anyone, any of the top dogs that you see in the industry that are doing big things, I would say, if I was to put a number on, I would say 80% of them make all their money in the non hunting space. And, oh, in terms of like their actual financials personally. Yes. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Successfully. It's a lot of people make their money elsewhere. Josh, then, I, I would say that about the hunting industry in general. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> even the manufacturers. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Even, uh, even us, you know, we yeah. own archery companies and you yeah, know, yeah. archery and all that and stuff. Um, none of that would be able to fund, you know, all the stuff that we would do on the hunting side at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and Jer- Jeremy and I are in the same boat. Oh, I guess, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you are a little more successful than we are, but, but yeah. you're a, a rarity. Yeah. I have like three or four businesses in the, in the outdoor space That's that right. are funding That's right. things. That's right. Yeah. But there it is, are. it's, it's not, I mean, one of them couldn't do it. Right. I mean, that's why there has to be multiple in that sector. Yeah. Well, and dude, that's, you know, I don't know that that is the reality. Like you hear so many people are like, even reach out to us and I'm sure they do to you too, man. How do I just get my foot in the door? Like with the outdoor industry, how do I, you know, mm-hmm. and it's worth cautioning someone up front. It's like, well, listen, you know, not very many people make very much money, you know, yeah, and it, and it feels weird because, Josh, I think that you guys have probably come under scrutiny. And I, I've seen it even from Jared and I. I mean, just Jared and I are very transparent guys. So, like, when we talk about buying a farm or, or Jared's family owns a 1,000 acres in Ohio, like, you know, to the to the guy who doesn't know us, maybe it comes off as us being arrogant, right, and saying, well, look at us, look at all. But, but from a background standpoint, how those farms or how these things have happened, it's like, Dude, we busted our balls. I mean, there were a lot of sleepless nights, a very stressful marriage for me to start multiple businesses to where they are able to provide for me to go out and buy a piece of Ohio ground. Well, and, and whether oh, we yeah. did it directly or, you know, my family. Family wise. Property, you know, that's a, that's a, I'm a victim of, not a victim at all, but yeah. like I benefit from my family. Yeah, it's like third or fourth generation cattle farm. And, but that's that's the reality i mean do people come from all different kind of situations and mm-hmm. like you know that's just the reality well and i want to spin that josh because jared and i you know we we looked at um one of the first podcasts you and sarah did on your background but i i don't think people in a like i said we're transparent right people are going to look at you josh and they're going to watch your stuff and they're gonna say josh comes off as kind of a d-bag here like he's just sure. arrogant about everything right sure. humbling though and, and you don't have to go into super detail, but tell us some of your background, man. Because to me, when I listened to that, I immediately was like, you know what? This dude's way more relatable than I thought two weeks ago, even. Sure. Well, I, I grew up in Ohio, obviously, on the back road, dirt, gravel road, um, and was a country boy through and through. You know, my parents did did okay. I mean, they were just modest middle America or, you know, middle class, I would say, if not, maybe on the, the lower end. Um, and but again, my graduating class was 122 people and I didn't grow up rich by any means and have all this money. If anything, I grew up. Yeah, I didn't know at the time, you know, but I grew up on on. I don't want to say lower income because obviously my my parents watch this stuff, too. And I, I don't want to. What did your parents do for a living? Well, my mom cleaned houses and my dad um, clean or was a plumber. Okay. Mm-hmm. It, it, so and so that's what what they did. But you know, what happened was in 2008 when the economy collapsed, they lost everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I graduated high school in 2008, and so I go off to college and I'm in college. I come back. They bankruptcy happens. They they took everything and my parents had a little bit of money saved to where they tried to build a house on my grandpa's land and they didn't have enough money to finish the upstairs. And so they just had the basement, you know, blocked off from the floor. So I come home and I'm we're all sleeping in the basement and I'll never forget this. This was a turning point for me. And we all had to take turns waking up at night to stoke the fire because there was no heat or electricity. There was electricity, but there was no heat at the time we were using the the. Um, the wood burner to mm-hmm. the basement and I'm sitting there and I'm going to school for exercise physiology, kinesiology, all that stuff and studying biomechanics, nutrition. And, and I'm trying to become, you know, a trainer of trainers basically was my dream job at the time. And I realized really quick, I'm like, I'm not going to be able to support my family or help anybody um, by having this job to where, you know, I, I'm going to have to run my own businesses and do all this stuff. And I remember sitting there and watching my family sleep all in this basement um, in this one room. And, and I was like, I, I can do better, you know, and I, I, I can do something big enough to where I can, I can make this happen for my family and my life and everyone around me. And so I, uh, that next day I drove down to Columbus and I just started driving from, 
um, gym to gym to gym trying to get a personal training job. Because I'm like, I'm just going to start working right now. And uh, and there, I get to this one place and uh, they all wanted a personal training certificate and I didn't have one. Um, but I'd been studying this stuff and I was training people in college and I was like, gosh, dang it. I'm like, I, I know way more than most trainers do. I'm like, and I'm studying this in school and, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just frustrated. Well, I finally find this, um, gym. I get lost, find this gym, uh, it was Metro fitness. And, and, uh, it was so funny. I, I show up and, and I'm like out of gas money. I don't have anything. I'm like, this is the last place. And he's like, all right, man, well, we just had someone quit. Um, you can you can get this job, um, but you're going to be a trainer of trainers, basically. He's like, I need a managing position. He had no idea. I was like 21. 20 years old, <laughs> I was way older, you know, yeah. 20, 21 years old. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, yeah, no problem. Um, he's like, there's one thing. Bring back your personal training certificate tomorrow morning. And, uh, like, and yep, then, got we'll, it. We'll get, yeah, we'll be good. I'm like, OK, no problem. And I'm like shitting a brick at this point now because i'm like oh great a course that normally takes six months i have 24 hours to get i'm like uh oh so i'm like finding any personal training certificate that'll let me just take the test because i didn't need to study all the other stuff i knew it from studying in school so i find this one court or this one place that lets me take the test i, I get a 98 on it and i bring in this fresh copy like <laughs> oh i've had this the whole time you know mm -hmm. and uh i fill out all the paperwork and he finds out that i'm like 21 years old He's like, no, no, you cannot have this job. There's no chance. Um, he's like, you're going to be managing my staff. He's like, no. I'm like, dude, just give me a chance. I'm like, I won't let you down. I'll outwork anyone that's ever worked there. He's like, all right, fine. And so he gives me the job. And this is an important part of the story because I want to, I, uh, and we'll get in, I'll speed it up as we get through this. But this part's important because now I get a job in Columbus. My family lives over an hour away. And I don't have a place to live and I got a job downtown. So I can't commute back and forth. I don't have enough gas money. My car was an old Chevy Impala. Um, so there was no chance um, that I, I could make that trip every day because as a personal trainer, people want to be trained before they go to work. Right. It's 5 a.m. Yep. And they want to train after they get off work. And so I needed to get closer to the gym. So I ended up getting the job. I found a place in in on Ohio State University. A guy subleased me his his place um, to where I I just paid him, so I didn't have to have all this upfront money or anything. Right. I just paid. Him. It was nice. And I get there, and the guy tells me, "Hey, there's a competition going on right now for the most personal training um, sold uh, in the next. You know, it was like a three month competition. Wins a free trip to Mexico." But you're already a month in and it's through the whole whole corporation. He's like, so odds are you probably won't do well. I'm like, I'm I'm jumping in, you know. So I worked seven days a week, freaking open to close. I my life was at the gym. I ended up beating everybody in the sales except for one person and one and ended up making it on that trip to to Mexico. And then um I just I and then I and then uh coming back, we started. I broke the company record with the most personal training sales ever. We sold like 27,000 in one month in personal training. And I have to tell you this because I have to tell you what I did. And I know people watching this are, are hunters. and They don't care about this. But I'll tell you, this is the secret for selling personal training. I would test their body fat percentage. <laughs> and it was 20%, right? Mm -hmm. And they're 200 pounds. So <laughs> I would go and pick a 40-pound like dumbbell. And I would, I said, okay, well, you're 20% body fat. And so that means you have 40 pounds of lard on your body. I said, I'm going to just stay here. <laughs> you and fat I piece there. of shit. <laughs> oh yeah. I was not, I was not polite about it. I grabbed this 40 pound dumbbell and I make him stand up and I make him hold it and they're holding it. And at first they're like, Oh, what? I'm like, that is how much fat you have on your body right now. <laughs> and, and they're, and I'm like, and they're trying to put it, I'm like, no, no, keep holding it until I'm done. I'm done kind of talking about what I can do for you. <laughs> and so now they're struggling, you know, they're holding this and it's getting heavy and I'm going through it. I said, all right, now, now put that down. And they put it down. I'm like, now imagine if you didn't have to carry that around with you yeah. for 24 hours a day. I'm like, give me your credit card, you know? And so it was it yeah. just That's a good like sales pitch. That's awesome. It, it worked. <laughs> Sell that me was this the thing. Yeah. It, it worked every time. And it wasn't to get their money. It was to show them that, listen, guys, you're carrying this around. You don't have to. And let me help you. And I did. I helped, I mean, 
hundreds of people lose tons of weight and help them develop their best body, blah, 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 yeah. whatever. But I knew that that wasn't going to be the, the, my secret to, um, mm -hmm. to being able to support my whole family. And so, uh, I, I did really well at the company and then I started my own businesses on the side, you know, in-home personal training. Yep. And then I, I, my first business, which got stolen from me. Um, I was very grateful for this actually. My first idea was a business I called supple match. And so this is a, a fun story. This is my very first, very expensive lesson. Um, the idea was as a personal trainer, I was recommending supplements to people and people were hiring nutritionists to do this. I'm like, what if I invented an algorithm that basically you just plug in, um, you answer all these different questions based on your answers, it would pump out what supplements you, you would need. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, this is 2009. Right. Pre-apps. This is pre-apps, pre, I mean, pre-everything. I mean, this was revolutionary stuff. And I called it supple match and where I'd make my money it was who would pay for the advertising. Sure. Um, of what brand of vitamin D would show up. And so I paid this gentleman, um, I won't say his name, but I, he, uh, I paid this guy and to, to build this platform for him. And we, I got him, the algorithm did all this stuff, got it all set up, got the website. And, and then basically what happened was, um, once it got finished, he took it and ran. No. And, yeah. And so, the next year I saw that exact thing on a big network marketing company's page where they were advertising it and mm. he sold it to a network marketing company. I don't know how much, but it was probably a lot because it was, it was a really good idea. And I remember, gosh, I remember thinking that was my win. That yeah. was my one good idea. I'm not going to have any more. And I remember really beat myself up on that. And then I realized I'm like, okay, I'm very young. I'm 19. I just learned a very valuable lesson in all this stuff. This is all, I'm kind of jumping around in the story a little bit. It'll all kind of come together. And, but so what ended up happening was I just took that instead of looking at it as like, wow, I got really screwed. I said, wow, what an unbelievable lesson to learn so young. Sure. This, this is really awesome. I said, now this will never happen to me again. And so I took that moving forward and I kept trying different businesses and I don't want to get into details of that. It'll get boring for everybody, but it, they kept failing over and over again. And eventually one of them worked and I did a two day NBA fitness. And this is where I started making my first real money. And this is where I would move in with a family for like two to three days. And I would teach them everything there was to know about fitness. I would take them to their local grocery shop or grocery store and teach them how to shop and do all this stuff. And I gave them rules. I called it do it for the after photo was like the program. And um, it was all so stupid looking back, you know, and, but it was uh, it worked really well. And so I would charge like three thousand dollars for this, which was yeah. a lot of money. But the way I told him, I said, listen, I said, I'll do your entire programming for the entire year. I'll write a meal plan for all of your 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 family members and which was a lawsuit waiting to happen. My God, I was writing diet plans for a 10 year old. Uh. I'm like, this is horrible, yeah. horrible. I cannot believe I did this stuff. And uh, I said, but, and I, and the thing was, is I would do this for an entire year if they just referred me for one person. Otherwise it's over when the second I leave the house and they would always refer me one person. That's all I needed. Yeah. And dude, you do two, two to three of those a week. Yeah. Like you're making bank. Yeah. And I was like rolling in and this first time I started making actual real money. And I'm yeah. like, holy smokes, this is great. You know, because I I made really good money at like 70 grand a year, probably at my personal training job, mm -hmm. which was really good. But I'm not I'm not like changing my family's life by any sure. means, you know, and and so then this business, it started taking off and it's doing well. And I'm starting to earn six figures. And I'm like, yes, this is awesome. But then I realized I was still trading time for money and I mm -hmm. didn't have time, you know, and then I ran out of people locally. So then I had to start traveling out of state, which then I couldn't do as many, many clients. And, and so it was like, oh my gosh, this wasn't the secret. Sure. And so eventually, you know, during this time I ended up meeting my wife, Sarah, um, and Sarah is an absolute rock star. She has her masters. Um, and, and I mean, just a genius, um, with numbers and all this stuff. And, you know, I was a math tutor in college too. So, I mean, we were both good at numbers and whatnot, but she, she had something that I needed, which was, you know, a uh, very detail oriented, very structured, 
Um, I was just kind of like this crazy, mm -hmm. um, born with an idea until a complete exhaustion and didn't work, come run down this idea. And I was just all over the place. I mean, I know you guys can't tell from my personality yeah. or not anything, but, <laughs> but I know that's a shock. <laughs> but, yeah. So when I met her, things that that was really the catalyst for me. Um, and we and we I had this online program. I was I was selling online training programs at this time. Um, and that was kind of my new business system that I was selling to where I was generating a lot of income because I started weaning away from the two day MBA of fitness at this point. And so. Sarah, she didn't have a large following at the time. It was like 150,000 followers um, compared to now. She has over a million, you know, and and I said, hey, uh, and how we met, that story is really fun, but it'll it'll make this podcast 20 hours long if we got into every <laughs> detail of it. But, uh, but anyway, before she got her new job, I said, why don't you just let me show you the system that I built and we tried on your following. And it was just selling personal training, meal plans, all that stuff. And so, again, this is, long time ago before 2014 you yeah know, 2015 way before social media was like this big thing where there's a program sold on every corner right and so we replaced her income you know in seven days which she would make in a month and we started scaling this business big enough to where we bought our first nutrition company and then that first nutrition company was natural science creation which was great um, we did pretty well. We built that for a few years and then ended up just selling it back. I mean, we did over a million a year with that company and we ended up selling it back to the guy that we bought it from for $50,000. Jeez. And the reason was, was because I had a bigger vision for a new company that we were wanting to start that were selling protein powders, pre-workouts, all this stuff. And he didn't want anything to do with it because it wasn't scientific enough. It wasn't you know, it was too saturated of a, of a market. And, and I, I could see the vision. I was like, I need to do this. So we sold it back just to get out of the business. And then we started up our next business, which everyone thinks is Bomer Nutrition, but it wasn't. It was actually a company called 100 Degrees Nutrition. Hmm. Um, and that company failed. It was manufacturing issues. Uh, basically, how that happened was we pre-sold a lot of product. Um, the guy promised April 1st deadline. We didn't get our product till June. So we sold a bunch of product, pre-sold product in you know March. Then all these customers hated it. We had to give all their money back. Then we get product that was that was not correct. It was all Jeez. jacked up. The labels weren't right, consistencies. So we took the money that we had made and we invested into that business and it just pff, tanks. Mm. And we're sitting there and we're like, what are we going to do now? You know, I'm like, oh, crap. Well, I guess we go back to selling personal training and and all this stuff. And and I'll never forget, Sarah made me um, protein shake that was hot. And she called it, you know, protein hot chocolate. I'm like, this is disgusting. No one drinks protein shakes hot. Like, this, is, <laughs> this is so nasty. Unless it's no been one. in your car, for, like, unless it's been in your truck in the sun for two days. I've had my yeah, fair share. Like, That's why there's a yeah, reason we don't I, use uh, milk in the summer. Uh -huh. we, we switch back to water. <laughs> nasty stuff and so i was like no i'm like i'm not trying so i try it and i got the vision i'm like this is going to be the next big thing and she's like nope i'm not doing it she's like we just lost all that money with that other company forget it i'm not doing it i'm like well i'm doing it on my own and, she, and so we get in this bickerment argument and she's like fine i don't want anything to do with it and so i started bomber nutrition and i went down this rabbit hole and god that story is so much longer and and more interesting for a fitness audience, I would assume, but it's important to understand where my money came from because that 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 line of where it came from has a lot of learning lessons into it. But the long story short, we were the first people to invent protein hot chocolate, which was like now very mainstream. We were the first people to put protein in coffee and we engineered our product where it was more digestible and better and tasted great. And uh, so Bomar Nutrition, as as soon as we launched the company, Sarah saw the vision because I re, re transformed how we do labels. Everything was just totally different than the mainstream. And uh, and so she got the vision. She hopped on right away as soon as we launched it. And we bought six months of inventory and we launched it actually at ATA. And we sold out of six months of inventory in eight days. Jeez. And um, and so that was uh, that was a big, a big learning lesson for us. And then basically what ended up happening, we ended up scaling that business. 
um, over the years to be one of the largest nutrition companies in the world, um, direct to consumer wise. So, I mean, I obviously, think- you know, circling that all around per what we were talking about. I mean, Bomar Nutrition is Josh and Sarah's money source. The main the, the main, main the main yeah. like the breadwinner like jared and i talk about it all the time between a stone road media or a page <laughs> dairy mart like you know those are our breadwinners sure we make money with other companies or other lines of revenue but like there's always a foundational piece of yeah. of the 80 yeah. yeah the 80 percent. yeah so yeah. Bo- Bo- yeah bomer nutrition definitely makes most of our money um you know i mean bomer archery does really really well too like i mean we're very blessed to be able to say, you know, we've done millions of dollars in sales with nose buttons and all that stuff, which is great. Um, but it definitely doesn't um, compare to like Bomar Nutrition. Mm-hmm. And so how we bought all of our farms and all this, because um, I don't I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but, you know, you, we can get into the, the hunting side of things. But, you know, we bought all of our ground. Basically, um, we bought one Illinois farm in like 2016, but all of our ground we bought after 2019. Oh, wow. Um, that's that's when we moved to Iowa was in 2019, which we did, that brings up uh, putting uh, pregnant does on our farms. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> that no. that was a funny one, by the way. But no, we, we own, um, well, we did own almost 4,000 acres, you know. That well, that's what I was going to ask, Josh, because like yeah. I've heard mixed, um, and again, it's all third hand. It's like, well, you know, Bomar only owns a 160 or he only owns it. You know, I have no idea. Are you comfortable sharing, Joe? I don't mean to over ask. Like how, how much? How much uh, land do you guys own? Yeah, I, I don't mind. Um, so as of last year, this year we sold some ground. We owned almost 4,000 acres divided across nine farms. Wow. So All in Iowa? The, or Most of it in Iowa, but one big chunk was in Missouri. Um, we sold 1,500 acres of that in Missouri, and then we just sold another piece um, in Iowa. And and then so we've got probably 2,000 plus acres left divided across you know probably eight farms. Wow, all, so all in south central Iowa. Yeah. No. So that's another <laughs> secret to killing big deer consistently. I spread my farms out all over the place to get a yeah. wide variety. Well, so you're, that's you're what I was going to ask. Person we've heard say you're that. not. So you're not hunting each of those farms. You're not hunting the same herd. Oh God, no. Yeah. No. I mean, I'll I'll pull a two hundred. And here's the other thing: only one of my farms I've ever bought had a two hundred on it. Um, every other one of my farms never had a two hundred on it. Um, before I bought it. Yeah. And so this is going to be a really good conversation to have because we'll dive into how I find 200s and how I grow 200s and all this. And but, it's not um, out of pregnant does. Let's just clarify that. Well, yes, of course. I've never put a pregnant doe on my farm or any high. Well, she wasn't pregnant at the time. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 So we'll, we'll make that very clear. But also, you don't have to take my word for it. I mean, the, the numbers don't add up, right? Yeah. Like we moved to Iowa in 2019. We bought most of our farms in 2020, 2021. You know, and so the deer would be three years old if I did that right away. Well, so, um, and I mean, that it, just saying that, even Josh, I mean, so this is this is rel- relatively new in terms of you coming onto a piece of ground. Uh, and I think this will be a great discussion is like in 2019 or 20, you know, here it is three years later, four years later, and you've already killed. Well, so yeah, it's five of the, of the math adding up. You said six, 200 inches since two, 2019. Yeah. And dude, if I could have had two, two tags. Um, in, in, in Ohio, I would have killed two, 200, well, pretty darn close to two, 200s in one year. The, wow. in Ohio, I killed this deer here, which I called wires. He, uh, green scored two fifteen. Um, that deer, um, had 30 inch beams, which is pretty crazy. Jeez, it's, nice. yep. Yeah. It's, I, that's my, one of my favorite deer. Awesome story. If you guys haven't watched that, um, shot him in gun season with a bow at like 70 yards. Um, it sucked. Uh, the, the way it had to go down, but really good story. Only five acres, and it was on my own ground. Wow! Um, it, all the neighbors were trying to kill this thing. It was—it's a cool episode if you haven't watched the Hunt for Wires on YouTube. Um, he officially scored like two twelve um, and netted two oh seven. Uh, but very, very, very proud of that buck. That's but that—that was my first two hundred. But I would have killed a two hundred in two thousand eleven on two acres if I wasn't a moron. Um, it's <laughs> this, we'll tell the last story. So I absolutely, um, I had, I, I got later, right before I moved, I got into hunting urban deer mm-hmm. and I figured out if you, but get property, even if it's one acre and you can bait in Ohio. So this, this, made oh, a yeah. huge difference. um, you get next to a park, one or two acres, you just need a deer to get to its mature age of five or six years old. They just can't die. 
And so they need low stress and an age in order for them to grow big racks. And obviously nutrition plays a role. Thing about urban areas, you don't have to deal with a lot of coyotes and predators. So their stress levels are naturally lower despite the human and sure. endangerment. And so I started trying to find city ground um, as much as possible. And um, and so I had this I had this big quarry I was able to hunt. Um, and it was like 400 acres, but didn't have any giant deer on them. I mostly just hunted predators and coyotes trying to get them with my bow and stuff. And, um, but I was going to get a big deer and, and I got this other place to deer hunt just by knocking doors. I used to knock doors from daylight to dark on the weekends, just trying to find one spot And this. And I, I found a park. Well, it was like, um, a nature preserve. It was yep. only a couple hundred acres. And I went down every single house along there trying, and I finally got these one people to let me look for sheds. And this is a secret um, to getting permission hunt because almost actually all my ground, well, the ones in Ohio, I never paid for any ground. I always just got permission. And how you do that is uh, this will be really great for people that don't have any money that need to get ground. And then we'll kind of get into the 200s and all this other stuff. Um, but I want to segue to this and I'll just briefly cover cover this and we can come back to it later because mm -hmm. I don't want to get off the topic of the, the 200s. But anyway, I would knock doors and they let me look for deer antlers. So I said, hey, I know you don't want to run them over with your tra tractor tire or whatever. Um, at this particular property, I was just like, do you mind if I look for deer sheds? I'll only be five minutes and I'll leave. They said, yeah, no problem. I looked and I, I didn't wasn't planning on finding any. I just I just wanted to get that right. interaction with the landowner. So I come back. And I say, hey, would you mind if I put just a trail camera up and just see what deer are back there? And I'll share them with you. We can go through the pictures together. I'll make sure the camera's not facing your house or anything weird. And I just, the spot's so good. And and it borders this park. And, you know, I've heard of a big deer back here. And, I, oh, yeah, we see them. They're real big. Well, I'll photograph them with this camera and we can take a, pic a look at them. And so I put a camera up and throw out some corn. And I'm not even thinking about anything. And I leave. And <laughs> They're like, what's this guy getting at? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I leave, I come back and we're checking cameras with them and I'm just sitting down with these old people and we're having a genuine good time looking at these trail cam pictures. And there's some good bucks, you know, some one forties and nothing real big. And, um, and I said, would you guys mind if I hunted one, just one buck? I mean, I'm not going to shoot more than that. I'm not shooting any does, nothing, just one old deer. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and he might not even show up, you know, I'm hunting another spot. They're like, you know, and this is three or four times I've met this guy. Right. Like, yeah. You could shoot one. And it'd be, I was like, okay, thank you. And so I leave and I'm trying to hunt this other spot. And I got this like 16 pointer. That's like pushing like 165. I mean, he's a real, just real short times, but a lot of points, you mm -hmm. know, I'm like, oh my gosh. And I only had two cameras and this was in 2011. So I was not doing really well at this <laughs> point, you know, money wise, this was kind of pre in the middle of me trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And, uh, and so I was like, God, I need another camera. And I totally forgot about that other camera. And so I, I go back over there to pull the camera and I pull the camera off the tree at that little spot where the old people are. It's only two acres that borders the park, pull the camera off the tree. I'm heading back to my other spot. I'm like, you know, I should probably see what's on here. There is a 220 plus inch deer in there every night eating in daylight. Jeez. Like, what the? F it's got freaking points everywhere, 20 plus points. I'm like, holy crap. And now keep in mind, I hunted with a homemade longbow strictly at this time. Wow. So all I had is this homemade longbow. And there was this old dilapidated barn that was all busted up about 30 yards from the spot that my plan was I would just hide in there to shoot to this deer. And it's in, this is in the morning. So I'm like, I call my dad, dad, I need your Matthews. I said, I can't shoot 30 yards with my longbow. I can't set this stuff up close enough to where I'm going to be able to shoot it, but he's coming in tonight. I need your Matthews. He gives me his bow. I drive home, get his bow. I come back. I practice. I get 30 yards. I know the corn's out there. I shoot 30 yards. He's got these old super crappy Montec G5. <laughs> worst, worst broadhead in the history of broadheads. Agreed. A <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Horrible. And, and I'm like, I don't know how many years it's been going in and out of this quiver. So I, I a crawl lot. in, I hide in this blind freaking right before dark. Here he comes. I'm like, holy crap. He's here. I'm like, I'm not screwing this up. So I, you know, I go full draw and I'm like, put the pin right on. Boom. I shoot and my arrow 12 rings him. 
perfect shot right tight to the shoulder and smokes him. I'm like, I just killed a 200 inch deer. My dream has came true. My grandpa is going to be so proud. And then my dad is going to be so proud. I just, I did it. My dream. And I call him up. My dad, my grandpa come out to the farm or come up to this little property and we start tracking and we don't find a single drop of blood. I'm like, wait a second. I'm like, I know I saw that arrow go right through this. And so we checked the trail camera. Sure enough, you see him running off and the arrow is perfect. I got a pass through and I'm like, what is going on? I'm like, this is so weird. And uh, I'm going to send you guys a photo right now so you can see this just so you have this. So, you know, I'm not lying because you can confirm to your audience and if you on on this deer, because this is going to blow you away. You're texting how this deer survived. Yeah, yeah, I'll text this to you. All right. And you also see the size of this deer. Um, so we I looked everywhere. I took work off for the next seven days. Oh. Let me just get this oh. just to look for this deer every day. And we could not find this buck. All right, let me send this to you. Okay. This is this is gonna blow your guys' mind. So the picture I'm sending you. And Josh, this is not the double drop time, right? I watched that hunt the other night. That's an Ohio deer as well, right? Yeah, that was an Ohio deer. That deer was like 178. Different that was one. my that was my first booner. Yep. Which I've got so many stories of the booners I've screwed up on. Um and the you guys just see all the 200s hitting the ground. There's a lot of stories where they're not on the ground because of my screw ups. Yeah. Um okay, so here. All right, I'm sending this to you now. So this is him three weeks later. And I want you to zoom in on, it should be got coming it. to you. Yep, got it. Okay, zoom in on that and look behind his shoulder. You can see where there's pus. Yeah. That is the exit of a broadside shot on the ground. Right there. Yes. What? So, I mean, the, is that not a good shot? Yeah. Wow. And How he was, is that and he was alive? Just perfectly broadside from you when you shot him? Yeah, perfectly broadside. I mean, either way, with an exit wound where that's at, I don't see how you can put one in them and not kill them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I didn't get a picture of him for giant. like two weeks. Yeah, it's a giant. And so th I'd, I'd call this that a 200 inch. <laughs> so that, that picture you're seeing is a still from a video. Okay. And I'm 23 yards from him right there. And this is where this story gets really fun. So there there was a, a fence that kind of went around this property it was just like a single wired fence and um and i said man if i wounded him and somehow and he can't jump maybe he's not coming in here so i tied a hole in the fence yeah. next night i got him on camera i'm like oh my gosh then i started doing the math at the time i thought he would have been the new world record with a longbow so i'm like oh i'm gonna hunt him with my longbow i'm gonna be this big shot that kills the world record with the stick bow. So, so I moved the bait to like 23 yards and, and, uh, I could not get on this deer. This was pre cell cam. So I didn't have cell cams right. or any of this. Stuff. So, um, I learned so much from this deer. Oh my God, I'm so grateful, but I finally get my chance and he comes in at 23 yards and I just have target panic. Like you've never seen before. And it's so <laughs> I like buck fever, everything. And I get my chance and he's quartering to me the entire time. Now this is, I have two days left to be able to legally hunt this property because the people sold the farm. Sold the property. Oh no. And, and I'm like stressing, trying to get this done. And literally as I'm hunting, their moving truck starts backing down the driveway <laughs> and I'm making 200 yards away and the deer sees it and he's kind of freaking out. You know, this tells you like how city uh, this deer is. Oh yeah. And so I start freaking out because he's freaking out. And so then I go full draw with my longbow. And as he's quartering and turning away, I shoot. And I couldn't stop looking at his antlers. And the, the arrow just goes right through his antlers. Like oh. a <laughs> totally with the shot. And uh, I'll send you. It's on video. I'll just send you the video so you guys can, can appreciate the level of, of horrendous that this is. And oh. you guys can laugh at all I've my got, misery. I've got an pain. Android, so it's gonna look shitty, but we'll get the idea. Ugh. Dude, I love oh I love that area. I hunted what was it, two yeah. 
was it last year? No, two years ago that I, at least two years ago, yeah. two years ago, I hunted probably a 215, 218 in that Columbus area on a, on, on city ground next to a Metro park. Um, yeah, it's, it, that's the real secret. I mean, is just finding ground, but anyway, so it's tough, man. It, it's really tough. Yeah. Well, you got to work for the people. You got to mow their yards. You got to clean their gutters. You got to do a lot of stuff, which we can get into later, but I, I don't want to segue from the, the 200 side of things real fast. So anyway, that was my first 200 that I screwed up on. I missed him. Um, ended up finding his shed. Um, the one shed scored 102 oh. to give you an idea of Whoa. how big oh. this guy is. Um, wow. And, uh, so did you end up yeah, getting this deer, Josh? Nope, never got him. Did not get this one. Did not, oh, I should have. That would have been, oh. and that was the moment that I realized I'm like, that was the moment I stopped hunting strictly with a longbow because I was longbow or nothing. Use compound, you're a loser. Like that was my my whole idea. Um, and sorry, turn my phone on. Sorry. And uh, I was like, if you use a compound, you're using training wheels. What a sissy. <laughs> Yeah, you know that now, was that was my whole. Now my that's whole the crossbow attitude. crowd. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so so then I realized I'm like that deer meant so much to me. If I had shot it with a rocket launcher, I would have been. I would have been <laughs> grateful, you know? And I'm just I, that haunted me. And I'm like, screw this! I'm picking up a compound. So then I started hunting with a compound, and that's the first deer I killed with a compound. Um, and for many years was that double drop. Double deer. drop one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so. And so that was exciting. And, uh, but anyway, so then, um, so fast forward, I started honing in um, on how, where to find these big 200s. The, now, Wires, he wasn't a city deer. He, that was five acres, but it, it was close enough to a place that didn't allow hunting about a mile away. Yep. That I think he, he sanctioned over in there. Yep. Uh, and made his little sanctuary. And there was enough little pockets where people couldn't hunt to allow him to grow. Cause, and God's honest truth, I tried to kill him the year before. He was like 160. Jeez. And, um, dude, it was crazy what he blew into. And, um, yeah, I could send you guys videos of all that stuff. It's yeah. kind of fun. We've posted transformations on on um, Instagram and whatnot. How, but, how old so do you anyway, think he is there where you killed him, Josh? Oh, he was five. Five. Yeah. yeah. So he was he was five. But that's where um, – so that year I killed him. I just honed in on where to find these 200s. I honed my skill of getting permission to hunt. By working for these people for free, I started spending a lot of time in the ghetto. I know this sounds stupid, but <laughs> really, you know, oh yeah, those are some really good spots to find permission to hunt as long as they own the ground. Like yeah. that's the other part. That was the hard part. Just Do they low, yeah. in, low income areas are yeah. really good. We can get into that um, if you want. But dude, city hunting those sections are really, really, really powerful. Kill two hundred, step on a needle. You just you never know. Yeah, you just gotta take <laughs> sacrifice. So, you gotta sacrifice. So this was, I think, 2018 was the year I finally honed in on this, and we moved to Iowa in 2019. So that year, I had another deer um, I called Kong that I was hunting. Um, I used to get a lot of permission on church properties. Yeah. So another secret, I would go to them. I'd go to the congregation and said, "Hey." Um, and we donated back then tons to churches and, and we didn't have a whole lot, but we still would sponsor inner city schools with yep. Thanksgiving dinners. And we could afford about 27 um, turkeys to 30 turkeys a year. And which was to us was a lot of money, you know, to go buy that many Thanksgiving turkeys. And we would donate them to the churches. And we worked a lot with um, the women's shelters and donated socks and underwear, anything we could, could afford. I mean, we did all this stuff long before we ever made any money. And, and those churches typically were pretty responsive to letting us, you know, deer hunt and their little properties. And, and then we would donate the meat, you know, to a needy family yep. of their choice and pay for the processing. And so it wasn't always free. It always had some sort of strings sure. attached to it for the owner, but they have value and you need to give them value. So there's going to be strings attached to it. Yeah. But um, anyway, what, so that property, I, I had permission hunted a church property and I had a one nineties deer on camera there. And I thought I was going to kill that 190s way more than I killed this deer. You watch that video; it was impossible for me to kill that buck. It every odd was stacked against me, like, and it was such a great story. I don't want to spoil it for everyone. It's a long one too, but long story short, I ended up getting this deer. Sarah tagged out already that year, so in Iowa you only get one, or in Ohio you only get one buck tag. Yep. So none of my family, they all worked, so they couldn't really show up when they needed to hunt. So I put one of my best friends on, on, um, uh, 
on that deer, which was Mark Minshaw. And he owned a bow shop. He was my bow mentor for, um, taught me so much about tuning a bow for like four years. Um, very grateful and a really great shot. And he went in there and he killed that deer. Um, and he's, and that deer scored 193 and yeah, so it was big. Um, so that was the year I kind of honed in on finding two hundreds and realized there's a lot different strategy to it than, than, um, everywhere else. And then 2019, you know, I move. So, so in, I, but in, I, I, so obviously there's a strategy in Ohio, right? You know, and, in, in that, but now you move to Iowa like how does that apply your strategy to find in 200s cuz it, it seems like you weren't finding them in o, in Iowa you're growing them the hunter podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery dude where would we be without our Hoyt bows probably shooting crossbows <laughs> or, or a Matthews yeah <laughs> one in the same yeah. but in all seriousness we love being Hoyt guys because you stand out when you're in this room full of other people that shoot these other types of bows I feel like the Hoyt guys just stick out. Dude, it's just a legit bow. I mean, th th especially that carbon riser, man. I mean, I, I know that they've got several other aluminum lines as well. But for, for me, I'm shooting that RX-5 uh, in the carbon model. They've since come out with the RX-7. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love being a Hoyt guy amongst a C4 of Matthews guys. So we're out there, I think, pr proving them wrong, shooting 80 pounds and, uh, you know, killing stuff. Hey, man, if you want to get serious, get Hoyt. We're talking now transformation from you found you figured out how to find 200s in Ohio. So, and so you've killed one 200 incher in Ohio at this point, right? That's correct. The year yeah. was roughly 20, 20, 2018. That, deer, that was 2018 and uh that deer scored he was the 215. Yep. It, it wasn't wires, right? Yeah, it was, was wires. Yeah. So, so that wires deer is the one you killed in Ohio. That's your first 200 incher yeah. that you killed. That was my first 200 inch deer. And your body killed a 193 and then you left Ohio. And okay, that's where we're at. I'm caught up now. Yeah. And so we moved to Iowa and we buy a farm. We buy a house in this near the city. Purely for and deer so, hunting. I was Josh, ask you, yeah. Is it, is it purely a deer hunting move to Iowa? hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. My buddy killing that 193. I remember thinking up to myself, I'm like, you know what? I put in all this work and effort all for one deer. If I move to Iowa, I can put in the same amount of effort and get three deer. Yeah. Mm. Like mm -hmm. that doesn't make any sense. I'm yeah. like, we're moving to Iowa. So, but I, <laughs> I told my wife and I told my wife, I was like, listen, we can't just move for deer. That seems really or stupid. Can't, or can't yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> Pack your I'm shit, like, Sarah. We're moving. <laughs> like, this is, I'm like, really? Am I that obsessed with whitetails that I'm going to move strictly for the deer? And I'm like, uh, the answer yeah. is yes. Of course. But yes. I couldn't <laughs> justify that with, with my wife. And so I said, let's go visit the city. And so we went to West Des Moines and we absolutely loved it. Amazing school districts. We didn't have kids at the time, but we were like, you know, we'll have kids. Amazing school districts. The people were just, there's a thing people say, Iowa nice, it's real. There's no traffic, even when it's busy. It's so, I was like, this is the place we want to build a family. I mean, this is amazing. The gym environment was incredible. Like, it was weird. Like, you think Iowa's just a bunch of cornfields, but it is, everything's new and clean and just really, really good. Mm. And so we moved in 2019 and I was like, okay, we loved our house. Everything worked out perfectly. Um, we lived on like 10 acres, uh, near the city. And then we bought the neighboring 10 acres. So we ended up getting about 22 acres there, but then we bought, we, then we went and we found our first farm. And okay. so the first year we bought our first farm and then I leased one farm. Okay. And so the farm I leased, that was really difficult because there was no food plots on it. It was just all CRP summer grass. Mm -hmm. But that year is, that is where I killed uh, lightning back there was on that lease ground, which I later, I bought that year. So I ended up buying that farm too. Mm. So that's why I technically can say I've shot all the deer on ground that I own. Mm. But that year was the year I got, I killed him. Technically I leased it, but by the end of that year, I had owned that farm. Wow. But it was all summer grass, no food plots, nothing. Um, and I didn't grow that deer. He just got that big. How know? far so, from your house was that? Were those properties? over two hours yeah 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 that makes so, it a challenge again, man dude you're telling me so that's step one i spread my farms out because ehd hit us the first year i said this is different we don't yeah. have this in ohio yeah i'm like 
this is weird. I'm like, okay, so now how long is it going to take for this farm to get reset? Right. Wow. Yeah, this five is years. Gonna suck. <laughs> I'm like, this, no. So yeah. I own farms all the way out in Appanoose County and all the way out in um, Ringgold County, which are hours away. So most of my farms, one direction is two hours, this direction, two hours. We did it down in central Iowa, um, up near, uh, up. I mean, literally, they're all spread out. Hmm. I do not own ground very close together, and this is important. Um, but the real secret, and and we're bracing I'm, for it, Josh. Don't lead us into this thing and let us down. Come on. Uh, I just I hate to say this because <laughs> this is going to screw me for the future. But well, not that many people listen to the podcast. If that helps. <laughs> well, this is this is really this is really special. So most people want a neighbor like a Mark Jury, a Lee Lakowski, a Josh yep. Omar. Mm -hmm. Those are the worst neighbors you could have. If you want to kill giant deer, you need to go to the lowest income areas, the where it's brown, it's down counties. And you're going to think that is the dumbest thing in the world. But let me tell you why this is so important. Because if it's brown, it's down. The first 140 that comes by, that person shoots them, mm -hmm. shoots that deer. Mm -hmm. They're not hunting it. And so you get a Lee Lukowski or Mark Dury or you plug it in, you know, a Steve Snow. I mean, my God, the, all those, the, the greats, those guys, they have every resource, every time they have every camera, every food plot, they leave all the grain to kill those deer. Right. The odds of you getting that deer is very rare. The odds of deer reaching maturity is high. But the odds of you having the sanctuary or the best farm for him to live there is very low. And so step one to finding a 200 is go to the areas where it's browns down, low income areas, because you're going to be the only guy with a food plot for a quarter mile or miles. You're going to be the only guy that can leave grain. You're going to be the only guy that has the best of the best farm. And for deer, including 200 inch deer, their currency, if we were talking like money, their currency is their age, their body size, and their antler size. So you think about in terms of currency with people, our currency is money. Mm -hmm. The more money you have, what do you get? The nicer house, the more convenient house that's located close to the city. You get the better food. You get to eat at the nicest restaurants. Mm -hmm. Well, you take that same concept and put into a deer, what do they get? They get the best bedding areas. They get the best food plots. The best farms the that are pressure. set up for their habitat. And so that's how you build a place. You don't necessarily grow a 200. You, you build a place. You build it. They will come. And in those areas, over a course of miles of acreage, it, those big giant deer will move into the best farms. Mm -hmm. But if you got a Mark Jury as a neighbor, you got a Lee Lakowski, they got they – got, endless resources and unbelievable opportunity everywhere. Right. They're not going to just stay on your farm. So it's better to own small farms, build them up, get them big in the low income areas where no one else is doing food plots. No one else is doing those things. You'll pull in the best of the genetics and then you just don't shoot booners. That's the other thing. I mean, you don't shoot them I, when they're four years old. I yeah. think Josh to the, you know, obviously we joke now about the whole, you know, pregnant does thing, but yeah. Per that strategy, right? It makes yeah. sense why neighbors of yours would say there ain't no way he's killing those deer naturally, and so, because right. your strategy is not buying in what is known as a prime area, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is. I avoid those areas. I mean, your neighbors are only seeing one twenties and one forties, and that's what they're killing because it's a brown and down area, right? It's not. Yeah. You're not in the neighborhood where you're used to seeing hundred and seventy inch plus deer. Right. Mm. I actually just sold my farm that <laughs> that was had the best neighbors on the planet. Yeah. Central Iowa, right outside Leon. I mean, freaking everything you could ever want. But all my neighbors were excellent deer hunters and I hated it. I had a 200 mm. on that farm that um, the first year and I screwed up at 40 yards and freaking long story, but um, screwed it up. Um, and and I hated that farm because of yeah. that reason. The neighbors would always kill giant deer. All my farms were all my neighbors, you know, are traditionally the blue collar, which I love these guys are hard workers. They work too much during the week and they only get to hunt the weekends. They're not going to hold out for a booner. 
if they see a boner, they will shoot it, but they're going to shoot the first 140 that comes by and they're very happy and proud of that. And those are my people. I love those guys. I want those as my neighbors. <laughs> that you makes know? sense, man. I mean, when my, you, my man, when you, when you think about <laughs> awesome it, it, it is, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense from a grand well, scheme of what you're trying to do. It's, it's super interesting because it, it, it makes perfect sense, you know, and you know, it's not rocket science, but it, it's interesting that you came across that strategy or and i'm curious to hear how long it took you because uh you know i don't i don't see the same being possible in a bait state like ohio you know which is where you came from because that that is what they do you know any uh it doesn't matter what you buy any track can be the best track for a week when i dump five thousand pounds of corn right and so this the track the secret with ohio is enough spots if you want to find a 200 every single year you need 60 to 70 different spots yeah, <laughs> that's the numbers that I came up with based on what I found. And everyone that kills deer consistently that are 200 plus, they have between 50 and 70 different spots, different deer herds, different locations. Yeah, and it is, it is like the Eskers, um, yep. Hayes, all those guys, and that kill consistently really big deer. They all have an, it's a numbers game. Yeah, yeah, and you got to get a ton of spots. And with Iowa, you don't necessarily. It's still a numbers game. But to kill a 200, it takes in way, way more effort and way more work because now your farm, you have to build all the things that make it the, the best place that a deer with the most currency wants to live. Mm-hmm. Well, how are the summer grasses? You know, what food are you planting? Um, are you only leaving grain so your farm sucks all until late season? <sighs> you know, like you got to build all this stuff up. And so how I strategize all my farms, I plant apple trees. I mean, I planted 627 apple trees wow. on all my farms and oh, it's crazy. And so planted all those trees. I, I plant food plots, um, strategically based on how a certain deer is being patterned. So some deer you get early season, some deer don't move in till late. If I got a deer, for example, superstar, I killed two seasons ago that two, I, two of four, two of six, I can't remember. Um, I think he officially went like two Oh one, but that deer, he loved me early season. He left me late season. So I planted all my food plots without even knowing if he was alive or dead. I planted everything in the area he wanted for early season. And, and the secret with that is you plant very high water rich foods. So a brassica blend, I plant kale. I plant everything that holds a lot of water because traditionally early season, if it's dry, they don't want to have to walk all the way down to the bottom of places to to drink every time they eat if they can get a lot of moisture from their food Mm -hmm. you're going to be in a much better situation that they're going to be hitting your food plots Mm -hmm. but then i do it better i put a watering hole hole on top yeah you know i freaking dig a giant watering hole and you can do this with a shovel it would suck you don't need a backhoe yeah but you know, bribe the guy that's got a backup with cleaning his yard, do whatever you got to do to get him to come over. There's ways of doing everything I'm saying Mm -hmm. for little to no money. It's just a matter of if you want to work hard enough. And that's the part that just gets hard because it's like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to dig a watering hole. Well, you can't complain then, you know, if you don't have one, it does suck. But anyway, so the point is, is I would plant all those or plant the food plots, put in the watering holes, position my food plots to where that watering hole now is very valuable. It's far away from all the watering sources because the step one with killing a 200 inch deer is you got to find a 200 inch deer. Yeah. A lot of guys have giant deer on their properties and they just don't know they are there because their cameras aren't the right spot. Right. I, I learned this a ton in Ohio when we could bait a hundred yards can make all the difference. Oh yeah. I mean, double drop time deer, for example, I had corn out in this field all season didn't have it flipped it over on the inside of the fence to where it was in the timber. And then boom, three days later, I got that deer on camera. He was there the whole time. He just never walked that edge yeah. back and forth. I moved the camera 50 yards and it got into his realm. He didn't feel comfortable come to find out because people were poaching off the cemetery. Sure, They were yeah. shooting at high powered rifles. Yeah. And so he was smart and wouldn't come out into the, the field. And so, it's crazy. So a hundred yards makes a difference. So with season, you really got to front load your time with cameras to find the deer. And then once you find a deer or a potential 200, that could be a 200 in years to come, you got to make sure everything's set up for that, um, for years to come. And that's what, what we've done with all of our farms. You know, we've optimized them with TSI work and food plots and grain and 
and you name it, we've done it. And then I feed them in the off season. So the day season goes out, I make sure those deer have everything they need from a nutrition standpoint. Um, the second their horns drop till about, I usually pull all my stuff like the end of March, just because you, with turkeys, you know, I don't want yeah. any, any feed on the farms for turkey season. Then turkey season's over, I go back to feeding. Mm -hmm. But a lot of guys, they don't start feeding until their horns are popping. Yeah. And the reason is, is because it's not fun to get shed bucks on camera. Yeah. But if you break down the year, the entire year of, of a deer's, of a deer's life of, of that year in terms of antler growth, a lot of people don't realize is that time when they shed their antlers to that point of like April, that is when they're induced the most amount of stress. Oh, absolutely. And as a bodybuilder, if you have high stress levels, the number one thing that you learn is you do not build muscle very easily. Yeah. You, you put your body in a, a, a state of preservation. Disease not literally disease, but like dis-ease. And then that creates an immune system response that's just not good. You're not as healthy. You won't grow. And so you give that little window of opportunity for them and you get them feeding from the time they drop their sheds, you know, until there's enough vegetation growing. That right there will allow you to get a huge bump in, in their um, antler health and everything else. Yeah. And so there's, there's quite a few things we can circle back on and kind of go over, but Let, let's do, the, let's do this one real quick. And the main question I have, Josh, is in relation to, you know, the neighborhoods that you're looking at, I know you said like lower income, but ultimately what you, what you mean is, is it's one of two things or, or both. Is it the hunting style that your neighbors are uh, employing or is it literally the quality of habitat or lack thereof? So for one, for a 200 inch deer, the, they, they've got to have the genetics and all that stuff, right? So the things I look for is body weight, body size. You get a place that grows really heavy deer and you can see this from the road. Like, geez, that's a freaking big doe. Look at the size of that thing. It seems like this section of area, there's just like monster body deer. Mm -hmm. Those deer are going to grow bigger racks than most deer. And the reason is, is their bone structure is bigger. And and so bigger bone structures, bigger skull plates, bigger antlers, they, they won't necessarily look as big. Do you see that happening, Josh? Them. I'm sorry to cut you off. Do you, I mean, I can't say that I've necessarily been like noticed pockets of bigger deer just oh, see yeah. from county to county. You see that a lot out there? Oh, for sure. Oh, hundred percent. Interesting. It, you just got to look, look with intent. And most people are looking at their antlers, not looking at their body size. And so you go out there, like some of my farms, if I shoot a 220 pound deer on it, that's a big deer. Um, out on some of my my farms the the both 200s i killed off this one farm the one weighed um 286 pounds the other one to 290 pounds Jeez. and so monster body deer i mean i the taxidermist uh, for the one he said he had to make a custom mold just because around where this part of his neck right here right at the base of the jaw was 27 inches around yeah and, and so you're talking about huge bone structure and that's where you get really, really heavy deer and they just grow antler a little easier. What, what, but, what do we think is the, is the reason for that? Well, no structure? different. Yeah. I mean, you're talking like five miles, one direction, five miles, the other or big, bigger. Cause, cause everybody knows, you know, you know like Canadian deer, the further North you go there. Yeah. Bigger bones and further South is the smaller they are. But I, I hadn't necessarily heard like from one County to the next. Well, I mean, I think it's just tied to nutrition overall. It's like, if you go to Southeast Kansas, right. I mean, there's some giant body deer in Southeast Kansas where we hunt, but if you go to some of the other parts of Kansas, you won't see nearly as big a body weight. It's probably nutritionally oriented soil quality carried over into the natural forage and and obviously crops in the area it's too. primarily nut nutritionally based i would assume yeah because go down there, to the coast of, to it though. yeah there's, there's gotta be because i feed all my deer the same and they leave the same and it's just some farms in these little pockets just consistently produce 280 plus pound deer what are you feeding and josh protein just protein bone more nutrition <laughs> bum, bum our pellets uh, well, protein is not the number one thing that makes a deer's rat grow um so a lot of people think that but it's not it's actually more mineral based calcium based um you feed die cow which is yeah, an immune phosphorus mm -hmm. 
I, I, I look at a deer different. I don't look at what grows his antlers. I look at what makes him the most healthy. Yep. What can I feed him that's going to give him the best chance to fight off things that are going to stop his antlers from growing? Mm -hmm. Sicknesses, stuff like that. So I feed him probiotic rich foods. Um, you know, analogics is good. You can make your own stuff. Um, probiotics, um, a lot of minerals that help like fingernails grow, things like mm -hmm. that. That's all that is, big fingernail. And then um, immune system supporters, different vitamins and minerals that are best for those. And so this stuff's not expensive, which it sounds like it is, but it's not. It's just the problem is, is you've got to get close enough to where that deer will eat that stuff at least a couple of times. I was going to say, that's the big thing that people, because people will put one feeder out on a thousand acres and they'll be like, oh, well, you know, I, I'm feeding that thing. Well, I mean, the deer's eating a lot of other stuff. Right. versus that one feeder is it, is it a proprietary like blend josh or you said analogics is, has some stuff or um, I use i'll send it to you i don't want to give away Fine. all the the good stuff Fine. you know but just but yeah i'll send it to you off podcast and you can feed the same stuff i feed i honestly don't know if it makes a huge difference to be honest yeah well but the, why not you know why not max them out on these things that they need because protein's yeah. the one thing everybody jumps to and although critical most deer shit out more protein than they need, right? I mean, they, right. they take in so much of it. There's only so much their body can process. It's not like if you gave them, you know, you know, 40% protein yeah. all the time that they're just putting that straight to well, body and the, antlers. The, it's it's going to waste. The precautionary measures of or like the uh, protecting them from things like uh, – uh, whatever it would be, worms or even like limes and tick disease. And I don't know, maybe those things are way more resistant. Well, stress, I mean, to Josh, it's certainly stress oriented. I mean, there's a lot of things. I mean, even just a water hole that is easily accessible during a period of drought is a huge stress reliever for, for an yeah. animal. Yeah. And I mean, I get made fun of for doing this all the time, but I put fly traps all over my farms. Yeah. And I'm guilty it, of it, making yeah. fun of you for it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, sure. And I deserve it. It looks stupid. Of course, I'm shirtless and that doesn't help things, you know, and, and, and so that makes it way worse. But man, I mean, I kill four or five million flies off my farm. You know, that's got to make a difference. That can't be fun for well, them. Well, I mean, look and at again, the, sure. the, the tick aspect. I mean, we've all seen a deer yeah. that, you know, it, its ticks are just, you know, or its ears are just covered in ticks and stuff like we know that makes an impact on on the stress of that animal well, dude, uh, I from think a health side. I, 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 you're the biologist, so you tell me. But like, dude, look at even in third world countries. I know humans get like worms in their Absolutely. stomachs and intestines that like yeah. eat a majority of their nutrition. They don't have the ability to like apply that to their own health. It's it's they have a parasite. Right. Correct. Um, it, the same happens with deer, right? Absolutely. And, yes. It, Ruminants, it, worms. And, yeah. And to my knowledge, there is no way to address that without over medicating the animal. Well, so right? for like a from a cattle standpoint, they feed things like Safeguard. Yeah. Right. And we would do it when we did research at at the University Deer Pens and stuff. We would feed our deer Safeguard pellets to to help with that deworming process. And you things. controlled the amount that they were getting, though. You right? would mix it in proportionary to the Proportion. protein feed that they're getting, and that goes back to what Josh was saying because in a in a fenced in two acres right i can control what that deer eats yeah there's some clover but other than that he's eating the pellets right there's nothing else in the in yeah. there when you take that deer into a real world setting you know he's browsing he's nipping he's doing everything the whole way from his bed to the feeder back like it's hard to control sure. how much he's getting yeah and that's that's going to be where you've got to front load a lot and have like when my farms when it starts out in summer to find the deer, I run 15, 20 different, you know, feeding sites. And I don't run mineral in the summertime um, other than very select few spots on my farm, just because it's a real pain in the ass covering all that stuff up, making sure they're tarped yeah. and palleted. And that way, no deer get to them in, in Iowa. We have to do that. Um, and so it's a, it's a pain. But I find the deer. Once I find the deer, then I start honing in on that to where he's feeding there every single day. So then I know the nutrition wise, he's getting there. He's getting as healthy as possible. He's most likely to fight off the HD and all of those things. And so that's where, that's where finding the deer is the hardest step in that scenario. Yeah. And, but it's not impossible. It just takes a lot of scouting effort and understanding deer behavior and know, knowing like, okay, this deer is most likely to live here because this is the best bedding area and you start there, but sometimes they're not there you know it's kind of deer kind of have their own agendas a lot of sure time. yeah and, do, do, and uh but I, sorry go ahead. forgive me i know we're kind of off the 200 thing for here just for a minute but this is this is really interesting are you uh with your bait sites feeders i assume right you taking feeders and you're no. filling them no 
I, I run everything on the ground because I cannot get those big deer to hit feeders very consistently. Interesting. So, so how how frequently are you having to? I mean, that's got to be a constant maintenance for twenty different feed sites. It's it's a lot. So yeah. that's just one farm, and there's eight farms. And so what I do is I take <laughs> I have yeah, and so I have a giant seed tender. And this thing is at 12,000 pounds of feed. And I drive that thing all the way back there, do the site and do all that. And I do about once a week, um, depending on whether it's dry or not. Okay. And so, dude, it's it's a lot of work. It's I, a lot of effort. And, and then I'm doing all of that also while, you know, working a full time job, which, oh, yeah. you know, for my own businesses and companies and stuff like that. But it's it's a freaking buttload of effort and work to be able sure. to do all this. But that's just what it takes. You know, if you if you want to consistently try and find and and get a 200 on camera. So what is it? I mean, literally like what is the quantity? So like, let's say on a hundred acres, how many bait stations do you have and how much, how many pounds are you putting out at a time? Okay. So I would say, again, it varies. If it's going to rain, I won't put out as much because it'll rot. If we don't have any rain for a long time, I can put out three, 400 pounds, you know, at a time. Yep. Um, in the winter time, what I do is I'll do, and this is what I would do in Ohio. If you put out corn piles in Ohio, I found a lot of those big deer hated corn piles. Yep. They have negative neuro associations. A corn pile equals an arrow going in their back strap or their mother being shot or a whole lot of stuff. And a thing I found with big giant bucks, and this is a common trait, not everyone, but it is common enough to where I, I am confident to say that most big giant bucks, 170 and up, are isolated type of deer that do not like social stress. Mm -hmm. They do not like being around other deer. They Agreed. come out into other parts of the field that all the other deer aren't. They avoid deer kind of like a loner. I think they're nerdy loner deer that don't like to be around other deer. And that may be a reason why they live so long is because – they're not where all the other deer are. Do, do, you think, so, do you think, Josh, on that same breath that there's a few times a year where there, there's an, some exceptions? Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. There's always exceptions, but I don't let the exceptions make the rules, right? And so whenever I see out of all the deer that I've ever got on camera that were, you know, 180s to 200s, the biggest, the most mature, they're all loners. And I'm like, okay, there's been exceptions where they come out in the field late season and there's 100 deer out there and they're in the middle of them, Right. Yeah. And so that that's just when when they have to survive, right? All the rules go out the window. But if they have a choice, is what I'm making a difference. Or yep. where Good I point. make my great point. From. Yep. And so if they if they have a choice, what do they choose? If they choose solidarity, that's interesting, you know. And then you set your farms up to where you got to make sure there's enough of those solidarity places for him to be able to live. Sure. And other mature deer, because that's the other thing. Just because he's got 200 inches of horn on his head doesn't mean he's the most badass on the farm. Right, absolutely. I literally, we have on videos, horrible. We had this buck I called the general because he always had this attitude. We watched him kill a 180-some inch deer that was going to be 200 next year. Killed him. Wow. Like, it's the craziest thing we've ever seen. <laughs> Freaking killed him, and I found that deer dead. It was a huge triple beam. I'll send you a picture of this thing. Jeez. Freaking unbelievable. And we passed him. Because he was going to be 200. Just, just in a fight, killed. Josh? Like, or were they already locked up? Or you just watched the, from the start of the interaction, you killed him during a fight? Killed him during a fight. Well, so what happened was he was, my camera guy was the one hunting. And this buck, he was in there to kill the general, but it was too far away. The general was on a doe and this big 180s deer comes out and the general squares off with him. And he didn't fight him. He was really malicious with how he did. He kind of like came up to him. And then the deer turned to like leave. He's like, I don't want to mess with him. And when the deer turned his back, he ran his horns up into his guts. Whoa. And then and stabbed him and then flipped him like he weighed a freaking feather. Jeez. And then the deer gets up and he's all hunched up like he's gut shot. And oh. he's trying to walk away. And he freaking comes in and hits him again, right? Sends his horns right through his broad, broadside, oh. flips him again. And the deer is like hanging, barely hanging on, gets up and is trying to make it to the edge. And then the buck hits him again right in the ass and just shoves him into the timber. And then he, when the deer fell oh. down into this ravine, he just came out <laughs> and then went left. And wow, went back to his dude. That's insane. It, it's Pro horrible. It probably yeah. happens a lot more than we, we – maybe not a lot, but, I mean, do, do, deer die and other deer are the culprit a lot of time. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And so that that whole story, that segue was only to explain where you got to make sure you have enough spaces on your property. Last, to where... last question I have for that, Josh. I'm sorry. I know we're getting yeah. to a point here. How do you feel about shooting does? I, you know, that I think that's like a big part of and we, we can just glaze over it here. But I mean, in terms of making room on your farm, you know, does probably occupy a lot of space. So it, when it comes to the does and bucks and ratios and all that stuff, I, I, I struggle with this because I don't shoot very many does, mm -hmm. if any. We struggle because with I'm it too. Big deer, yeah. You know, and I'm like, for me, I'm like, I don't, I don't Spoil really shoot a hunt does. to shoot does. I get it. Yeah. If I'm hunting, I'm trying to kill the big deer. Yeah. And the farms where I've went and eradicated the does, got a bunch of people together. All right, shoot all the does. Boom, boom, boom. Those farms suck. They end yeah. up sucking. Yeah. And I'm like. Right. And then you do any research, any biologist that runs, you know, high fence places or worked on them, they'll tell you a lot of the genetics come from the doe. Absolutely. And so I, that makes me a little worried about whacking does. I'm like, which one of these had that 200 inch buck? And I've killed a lot of big deer by knowing a certain day within a two day time frame, they come to the same spot to breed a specific doe. I learned this in the city spots. That Kong deer, he would show up every single year on November 8th on the dot. It was weird. It was November 8th. The latest I ever got him was um, November 10th. But it was always within those two days, almost to the day. And I know it was because he came into that area to breed a doe. Yeah. And I shot that doe. And he stayed the year we killed him because there was feed there. And it was a harder winter. And so he stayed and then my buddy killed him. But that deer specifically came in there to breed a doe. Right. Why else would he show up the same day every year? No summer picks, nothing. November 8th, boom, he's there. Yeah, and they knew it. And, and so, God, I just get so I, I get so weirded out about it because anyone that knows anything about deer all say you should shoot every doe you possibly can, shoot 100 of them. And I just, I just don't do it, man. It's I think like, a lot of it is too in the area that you're at. Like, I mean, if your neighbors are are smacking does, I mean, I don't know. I don't think you really have to anymore. I just, it, it, it's well, not nearly well, as big of an impact. We've made pretty good points, I think, on either side of it. You know, we started off by saying you got to, you know, they're loners. You know, they need to have room. They want to be secluded. But we also like, uh, we're not sure how we feel about. You know, shoot, shooting does. So it's well, like I, I, we don't I think know. I think what happens is is you see like right now when the does are with their fawns, they will take some of the best habitat priority. Like those dominant does will push into the best habitat. Sure. They'll occupy that. But as you get into the hunting season, I mean, those does and fawns will bed thirty yards from your food plot, right? They they don't care. Like they they're just they're comfortable there. It's easy to get up and work. That that buck wants to have his space, and he's probably buried a little bit deeper and stuff, and and away from it, but. You know, I, I really think that even in the summer when you see bachelor groups, a lot of times I don't see that giant buck with a bachelor group. You know, maybe there's a bachelor I, group ahead I of them. Yeah. The yeah. He just like doesn't want to be buck, around like, them. Like, why are you with the does? It's so weird. Yeah. It's not often enough, but I do see it a, a frequent. Well, I think it's I because those oh. does are in the prime habitat with their fawns. And so is he. He's not leaving it. Right. He doesn't feel the need to leave it because it's his space. Absolutely. That's such a great point. You know, and that's that's interesting. It's I've never really thought about it like that with the does. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, to circle back on that, I, if I had to put a strong stance on I would if I was really try to make my farm as buck friendly as possible, I would shoot all the mature does that had fawns that were button bucks. Um, like when the fawns were young, because studies show a lot of those bucks leave the farm. Yep, they're getting kicked um, out. They're getting kicked out. So you kill them, you kill the mom, they stay. Um, there's a lot of things that I just don't feel morally great about. Like yeah. I don't like shooting a doe with babies. Like sure. it's weird to me, mm -hmm. but the research shows that it's right. Yeah. And so, God, it's weird. So I, I don't know. I have different dilemmas on it, but none of my farms get overran with does. I just, when the, the herd's a little thick, I leave more food in the winter, which sucks because then it gets a little more expensive. Mm -hmm. And, but then it's funny because EHD has a way of coming in and just wiping the farm out yeah, eventually. Bounce. Yeah. And then it just it does way more damage than I ever could. Yeah. And then post DHD, three to five years, you'll have your best, best farm ever. Yeah. Um, Least amount of deer, most amount of resources and space. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so you'll get the biggest bucks a few years after EHD. But the problem is that everyone usually has all their farms in the same location. They're not willing to drive two and a half hours to get to a farm or do any of that. And it's it's enormous amount of work. It's a lot of pulling over on the highways and falling asleep just to, before you can get mm -hmm. home. Like I, I, 
how many times I pulled over and slept for 10 minutes trying to make it home after putting in a 15, 16 hour day. Yeah. And it's just, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of, a lot of time and commitment and a lot of cell cams because you can't go driving out there and checking cameras. Yep. And I so agree. You start running cell cams. And when you can't bait, it's incredibly difficult. Yeah. You know, because now you're putting in, um, you're putting in cameras over scrapes and, mm -hmm. and watering holes and trying to cover food plots. Well, for that area, you need four to five cameras for where you would normally just have one bait site with one camera. Yeah. And so it, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of work, but um, boy, it, it really pays off in the end whenever you get that opportunity at that giant buck. But the biggest thing that I think most people do is they shoot four year olds that are one seventies. Yeah. When it comes to two hundreds. That's you, a you tough can't. thing for most people to pass. Dude, you, me, I grew up on a dirt road hunting with a longbow where if I saw a deer with two antlers, it was the best deer yeah, ever. Dead. I mean, my first buck was a, a half rack. The next year, I just wanted to kill a full rack. Yeah. I came from that position yeah. to where if I saw a 140, are you kidding me? That was the biggest deer in my life. I was mm -hmm. like, this has got to I'm shooting that thing. But you make that decision to shoot that young buck. You cannot be mad and be pointing fingers at the people willing to pass them and bet on the deer that shoot 200s. And for me, like if I'm shooting a 170 or 180, that deer is going to be old and mature six. Even when they're five, I don't shoot them when they're that big. Um, and dude, I, I always bet on the deer and it usually doesn't pay out to be honest. Yeah. Most of the time they don't get bigger. Most of the time they, um, they, they don't live, they disappear on me, but you have to bet on the deer if you really want to grow mega giants. And that goes, no matter, that doesn't, oh, if I had a thousand acres, I would do that too. Most of my farms are two to 400 acres, mostly 300, you know, 260, 300. I have one 600 acre farm. Um, and dude, my deer always go to the neighbors. They're always on the neighbors. I'll give you a statistic. It's a, I'm slightly guessing at it, but like dude, we own about a thousand acres in Ohio. Okay. So, this, and this is the bait, you know, being put into this. Um, I think, uh, I think the ratio is over a seven year time frame. I'm going to say damn near a hundred percent of them have gotten killed by the neighbors over corn piles. Damn near a hundred percent. It's, it's at least 95. Mm -hmm. It's, and those are lot. and those are four year olds that we've passed, you know, ranging from, and we don't pass five. I've never passed five year old deer. Um, not that I wouldn't love to, right? It's something I maybe in the right never scenario, but I, I, well, I, I never passed five. Yeah, well, and but, it's so, just it's just the bait thing. I mean, that's and so like everything that you're saying, I'm like that's right, you know, in Iowa and any and probably any other non bait state. But that bait is just such a factor. No, man. I mean, it's still really hard to get a big mature deer to come into bait. I just I don't think I think they get killed think, at three and four on bait. Well, it depends where you draw the line of four of mature because I know a lot of guys kill four year four year deal off corn consistently. Yeah, that's so a tip for you, I want to make sure to share this with you that I did in Ohio that really helped. Um, put hay down first mm -hmm. for those bucks that are wary of those corn piles. Put a big thing of hay down, maybe like a bale or two yep. of good alfalfa, and then sprinkle the corn through all that mm -hmm. instead of a big corn pile. I had a lot of success um, in Ohio doing that that way because basically what it allowed them to do is be able to, you know, browse a little, they had to work a little bit for it. And it wasn't this big, bright yellow pile mm. that just scared the crap out of them. Mm. And I had to learn that, you know, over the years of, of trying to figure, I'd find a big deer. I know he's there, but he would never hit the corn. Right. You think it just it makes them more comfortable with it? Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and it's the food lasts a little bit longer. And no then doubt. it also if you put mineral out uh, over that hay, the straw will absorb that. So if you're a little late on your feed one day or you don't still it ran out, of the day, it gives them something to be able to keep coming back to your spot. Yeah. And that makes a difference. But honestly, knowing now, like how I hunt in Iowa with all the food plots, if I was to come back to Ohio, I would hunt how I hunt now in Ohio. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be. And the reason is if I had apples to apples you know mm -hmm. the reason is is like compare big tracts of land same type of thing because that's going to be different they like a wide variety of of their palates they like a wide variety of food choices and everything else so 
they just feeding you deer corn is terrible for it. Sure. You know, long term, especially yep. in the winter when no they doubt. don't have brow. Absolutely. Things. Yeah. And so you, you plant that paradise, then all of a sudden, you know, you now have the greatest um, farm for that deer to live. And you'll pull deer in from corn piles all over the place. If you've got the brassica plots and standing corn that you mow and all of that, which is a great resource to be able to have come late season is mowed corn. Yeah, it's it takes a little more effort just because it's a lot more in, involved. But I would do it that way. But if I was chasing two hundreds in Ohio, I would hunt mostly city. That's going to be your big, biggest bang for your buck. Yeah, that makes sense. City deer, small properties, two to five acres, um, 0.5 acres. You just need enough to to be able to bow hunt. I think that uh, my opinion would be that mowed corn may be the exception where I agree with you. I think that because uh, we have you know we have the large track we plant. And I, and I don't know, there's, uh, um, there's always more we could do to make, to make the farm better. But I mean, we've done a lot, you know I mean? I've, I've got a lot of standing food, a lot of what I think they want, a lot of cover in the form of timber stands. I mean, it's, we've put a lot of work into the farm yeah. and that statistic of, you know, the 90, whatever percent is, is still true where it's like, they'll leave that stuff in a heartbeat, whether it's to go eat at the corn pile themselves or, and earlier I mentioned those those exceptions, unfortunately, the main one is like opening day of gun season. It's right at the end of the rut. You know, the cold, the temperature is cold. They will follow a doe and the doe is going to the corn pile. Like the, that's where they're going. Yeah. And that's where they get shot, yeah, you know, that's what, uh, to, to take in consideration is that. Man, and, that's, uh, and it's not like with a bow necessarily or even a crossbow most of the times, but it's like, dude, I, I can sit a hundred yards away with a center fire rifle over a wall. corn pile that I've been, yeah. Yeah, sorry, straight a straight wall, wall cart cartridge that I've been monitoring with a cell camera. You know, so, some of those tools we employ, employ, uh, in and just and murder them right during the most vulnerable time of the year. You know, and so it's that is why I sold my Missouri farm because yeah, yeah. their gun season is right in the rut. Yep, right in the rut. They screw that. And so that's in Iowa. We don't. There's no one crossbow hunts because it's illegal unless you have a um an injury Disability. or something. Huge. So, which is huge. It makes a big difference for bow season. Sure. No baiting, which makes a big difference. Well, dude, Ohio, no just for your point of reference, it's like, I think we're at 70% of the archery harvest is with a crossbow. What? Yeah. Yep. 70%. That was last year's statistic. Dude, that, that breaks my heart. You know, I, I love, I, I'm not against crossbows. I personally love crossbows because it gives the opportunity for no young doubt. kids we agree. to be able to get it. I love the corn pile idea, allowing bait, because now you don't need a 500-acre track to be successful. You know, it allows for those little kids to get out there and get in the outdoors. I do think that it's a powerful message or a powerful opportunity to be able to introduce people to the outdoors and have them be successful. Sure. However, with that being said gosh dang man it just doesn't feel like archery to me you know no. it's definitely a double-edged sword you're not wrong it is because if i had to pick one whether it's allowed or not i would probably allow it just if just for the kids you know sure. and, and but for a normal healthy dude that's just not wanting to put in the effort and work to to learn how to shoot a, a stand-up bow and do all that stuff like that's where i'm like dude you could have done that with a compound. It would be more rewarding too. No different than shooting it with a longbow or a compound or instead of gun hunting, you pick up a crossbow. Maybe that crossbow is more rewarding, but gosh dang, man. Yeah. Well, and for, for the kids and the disabled, like did we, we wholeheartedly agree. I think crossbows are, are an excellent, uh, you know, me, means to that. And I wish you could have both. I, you know, I really wish that those people could have the, the kids could have the opportunity even over baiting and stuff. But right. the reality is it, it takes away from from other people. I mean, that's just what it is. It's a, it's a give and take type of deal. And it, it's yeah, and I mean, I'm sure of that 70 percent, some of those people, if crossbows were illegal for the general population, would fall back to a compound. Right. Because, you know, they, it's just the easier yeah. way was. But a small still, percentage. I mean, you're talking about a massive amount of deer being harvested that would not be harvested during the archery season. A small percentage. I think a majority of that number is ex gun hunters or current gun hunters you know, who are looking to expand their season. I can't, I can't mm -hmm. blame them. I would do the same thing. You know, it's like I can pick up something that's uh, very usable, much like a gun. Well, yeah, then give, give the compound guys their uh, two weeks early, you know, or give whatever them, it give is. Them. Yeah. Yeah. That's because at the end of the day, it just increases the bottom line and revenue for the, I mean, Kentucky month. does it right. So Kentucky's bow season will open September 2nd, but the crossbow season doesn't open for two weeks after that. Oh, see, that's perfect. 
at least you give the guys a, an advantage. It'd be no different than if they legalize spear hunting, which would be a great idea. You know, you want you want to maximize profits with minimal with minimal losses, right? So whether it's a spear, compound, whatever, the lesser the weapon should get another season that is separate from it's like a preseason because it, would you guys buy an extra tag to be able to hunt two weeks early an yeah. extra 20 bucks? Absolutely. No, I wouldn't even think yeah, twice. <laughs> well, and dude, it, it comes down to, and, and Josh, we talk about this like nonstop. I'm sure our listeners are tired of hearing <laughs> about it, but like if I had to choose between uh, the crossbow thing, uh, you know, crossbows with the season that it is now and, and baiting a hundred percent, I would vote to get rid of baiting a hundred percent. I, I, if they ever brought baiting up to be legalized in Iowa, it would ruin would the state. It, it literally right will make or break a state. Like mm -hmm. it, it's what it makes Iowa the best state. And it's what would make Ohio, I think one of the best states or the, if not Agreed. the best state. The, the amount of effort in order to get the deer to come to a location that you made happen is so much more difficult. With yes. The food plots and yes. The Absolutely. And, the, and, the and you guys talked about this before the podcast started with, all the effort that goes into that, a lot of people are like, I'm not willing to do that. I'll just sit on a trail over this weekend and shoot the first nice buck that comes by, and that's going to be good enough for me. Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to deal with all the finding someone with a tractor or, or yep. disking it up. Or I, I mean, my God, it's so much work, and I like that, which is also why I like buying farms and hunting farms in the areas I talk about is because a lot of those guys – it's not that they don't have the money or the resources. It's just they work so dang much. They don't have the time. Yeah, they don't have the time. I mean, they just don't have the time. Mm -hmm. And nothing against them. You know, I, I love those guys. Those are my people. Yeah. Like, I grew up doing that. I know exactly <laughs> what it's like. And <sighs> and they're hard workers, but they're, they're not passing a 150 um, on their one farm that they got permission to hunt. That's right. And they get to hunt the weekends. You know, yeah. they're taking the rut off. And those guys can still kill your big ones. No doubt. And, and there's nothing do. wrong with that either. I mean, do pe people, no. yeah, everybody's got a different circumstance. So, and a reason that they hunt. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, the biggest, the yeah. biggest problem you're going to run into with those areas though, is poaching's really high. Yeah. So my God, my farms that are in the poorest area, they get whacked with rifles. Mm. I mean, deer on the side of the road, people find out I own the farm and they yeah. try poaching my deer just because they hate me. Yep. Jesus. Um, Bite me, dude. It it comes with a whole slew of issues, and you call the game warden. I literally got the vehicle on camera, on video. Here's the vehicle. Here's the people. They said they were looking for their dog. It's not against the law. I'm like, what about them tearing up my fence? Like, well, did you get video of them tearing up your fence to get their vehicle through? I'm like, well, no, but their tire tracks go to it. But yeah, well, we don't we don't have definitive evidence that they did wow. it. They said it was like that. They said it was like that before they got there, and that's why they drove through. Yeah, but and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? But then they'll freaking stake me to the wall. Film you something. guys taking a dump in the woods. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they'll stake me to the wall and, and, and for 10 years or whatever it is. But I have actual video evidence of everything uh, that A plus B clearly equals C. There's nothing they could do about it. Wow. And, and it, it happens all the time in those places. And so hmm. that's where – you just you deal with that unfortunately but crazy josh on your farms and you don't have to tell us like which ones but you know of the uh what five iowa 200s have any of them come off the same farm yeah i've killed i've had two farms i've killed where i where i've had a 300 acre track that i've killed two 200s off of and then my 600 acre plus track i've killed two 200s wow. off of and cool. so the one was with my stick bow last year. Yeah. And I remember that super one. Small. And yep. so that's kind of like multiple farms. They're just, it's one big one. Big you know? one. Yeah. Um, and then, but it, it's the thing, man. Usually it cycles to where it takes a few years to get them to grow. But every year it gets better and better because I do more and more work. I figure out the farms. I figure out where these big deer like to live and I optimize. Like, oh, I've been, I run a lot of cameras. I'll figure out this is the bedding area where the most mature deer on the farm likes to live. So then I can optimize it a little bit or I, uh, I get better at putting cameras out. You know, I'll optimize trails and customize trails that create intersections. So then you know when a big deer moves in. And I think a lot of guys get big deer on, on, on that have big deer on their farms. They're just not getting pictures of them because they just don't know where to put trail cameras. So, so, what, so what's the secret, Josh? Where do we put our trail cameras? Oh, well, I can tell you. So 
if you're new to hunting, the number one thing you want to do is, is go to the very basics, you know, look at a trail heading to a field. If it's a, uh, this is basic hunting 101. It's, it's good to have this foundation before I get into the okay. next topic. Basic hunting 101, most deer don't use the same trail to go to the feed as they do leave the feed. So when you go to a trail heading into the food, look to see which direction the tracks are going. Now, again, like I said, there's always exceptions. Sure. Ones, right. You'll see most of the tracks are, are going into the field. Then you know that that's an evening trail. Most guys, when they if they would go back there, they would figure out where the bedding area is eventually. Where does that trail go? It intersects, whatever. Sometimes it's obvious. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's not. That's the other thing. There's sometimes there's a ridge that just is a deep slope and it's got a nice little flat spot because deer do not like to lay on hills. Yep. A lot of people right. don't realize that, but they do. South facing slopes, total BS. They don't like to lay on the, the south facing slopes are the best place to find sheds. The deer love to bed there, but they, if you actually look where they bed, they'll it's bed flat. in these little pockets yes. that are flatter. And again, survival's number one. seems like they they'll even their- dig them out too, Josh, like on the south facing slopes. Like if there's a spot up against a tree, they'll dig, they'll pod it out over years and, and that's where exactly. they'll lay. And so sometimes, and that's where things get interesting because those big giant deer, they'll go find that little spot, right? It's not this obvious cedar thicket mm-hmm. where all these deer come out of. That's not where those big 200s live. And so they'll put cameras on those trails coming from the cedar thicket and they get a bunch of does and little bucks. And they're like, oh, my farm sucks. Little do they know they got a 200 that just comes on a different trail, but they never put a camera on over there. And so that's where you optimize trail camera location by how one you can set up your farm. But I'm I'm not going to talk. I can briefly go over that watering holes, multiple pinch points. But, blah, blah, but blah. before you move from it, Josh, I think it's funny, like the world trail camera. I, I'm thinking in my mind, like, what's the last time I put a camera on a trail? Yeah. <laughs> I don't do yeah. it very often. Yeah. I'm looking for something that's pulling deer to yeah, a, a, scrape. Loca- a scrape, right? Of the plot. A bait location. Mm-hmm. Like, you know. I, right. And so, so here's the, 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 the secret. It, it, it's common sense, but a lot of people don't do this. You want to optimize your chances of getting a deer on camera by having multiple reasons it can walk by your camera. Yeah. And so when you look at something like that, it's like, okay, well, what will a deer go out of their way to go through a hole in a fence? Yeah. You know, yep. um, corn yep. piles, I'm telling you, are not the best way to get big deer on, on camera. I could not I tell you how many times I agree. I got giants on camera in Ohio that were nowhere near a corn pile. They never came to a corn pile, corn piles a hundred yards away. Yep. They're hitting a scrape. They, they're afraid of them, whatever. So, I'm not going to reference bait in terms of where I put cameras now, cool. obviously with Iowa and everything else, just because it's not going to help. I think the majority of people, you put a camera on a corn pile, it's pretty self-explanatory. So yeah. So yeah. that's how you, you do that. So <laughs> that's when, you get it. Actually, <laughs> yeah. when you come, when it comes to actually finding deer and, and getting big deer on camera without bait and feed is what we're going to talk about. And so that is the best way to do that is creating the best places to go. And so what I do is I go in during shed season and I look where the rub lines are. I'm like, okay, here's a rub line. All the rubs are on one side of the tree. They're all heading to which direction? I'm like, okay, they're all heading to a ag field. So this is mm-hmm. a morning, a morning trail. I'm like, okay, so if he's on here in the morning, where is, or, or an evening trail? I'm like, where's he coming from? And then I look far enough and I think about this. I'm like, okay, he's probably betting somewhere in here. So then I find a natural barrier that that deer would have to go around. A lot of times it's a creek yep. that's, that's steep on both sides. And then what I'll do is I'll run a camera on, on one of the main trails that's coming from that area, knowing that this deer is massive based on the shredded tree. You can analyze a rub and know it's it's really deep gouge. It's got sticker points on his bases or he's got funky brow tines. Pretty standard to have a big rack if they got a lot of sticker points. Again, exceptions don't make the rules. And that If it's sure. smooth, if smooth barked, probably a big typical, doesn't have a lot of trash. So keeping that all in mind, I'm like, okay, this deer is probably big. So I'm going to put an effort into trying to find him. So then I go walk the creek bed, say it's by a creek bed. I find where the main trail is crossing. If there's multiple trails and they're close together, I will block, cut trees down, make it to where one trail is there. If there's not a good crossing, I make a crossing. 
I use a shovel and it, it doesn't take as long as you think because you're trimming off edges sure. and you make it five, six, seven feet wide and just make it a more gradual. It doesn't take a lot of effort to make it to better than everything else. Um, now I'll just take my skid steer and just go in there, but then it ends up getting stuck in the bottom and <laughs> makes a massive mistake. But funny, a lot that's a lot of my situations is ends up in that, you know, disastrous stage, but <laughs> It doesn't take a whole lot with a shovel to make that crossing and you run a, a water crossing. Now, what I would do is I would back that camera off the crossing to where I'll get them crossing, but then I'll also put a scrape to where I can get a scrape and the crossing. So maybe he crosses somewhere else, but now he'll come and hit the scrape or I'll put that and I put that scrape where there's another intersecting trail. Yeah. So then I, there's three reasons. He could be on this trail, not going across. I'll get him. He'll be hitting the scrape. I'll get him. Or he's coming across the water, the, the barrier. I'll get him. Plug in fence crossings. So the fence is up all the way. I will take and cut a section of the fence out. You don't want it too narrow. They do not like feeling trapped. So you make that thing 10, 30, 40 feet wide. And then I'll put a scrape right over the, off the actual post itself, you know, give them another reason to go there. If there's a fence is really dilapidated and all jacked up and there's a lot of crossings, then you could block the sections off, run some fresh fence. Deer will walk hundreds of yards out of their way to not jump a fence. Yep. Imagine catching your sack one time on the fence and you would walk 200 yards out. I'd of Walk a like mile. Deer. I've got a deer on the wall right there that might've done that. <laughs> Full velvet yeah. in Ohio. Yeah. You aren't taking any chances either, that's you know. Right, that's I want, right. I want to see that deer when, when the podcast. I'll send it over. to you. Yep. Yeah, but so again, they go out of their way for that stuff. Um, plant your food plots to where there's natural pinches in there, to where you can maximize camera location, cover the food plot, watering hole, tight pinches, those type of things. And it just goes back to woodsmanship. You know, you got to be a good deer hunter to know where to put cameras. And so if you don't know what you're doing. Um, there's, you got, you're not going to have very much luck with cameras and you probably have big deer on your property. You just don't know where to put them. So you one, you either have good enough woodsmanship to know where the big deer are, buck rubs, scrapes, optimized locations, where you found optimized locations, like in terms of bedding, feeding, those type of things, where you found big sheds, you know, you find areas and clues to where these deer are living, how they're traveling. Um, take take um open up sections through cedar thickets and nasty taking freaking take a chainsaw in there open them up create uh natural lanes all this stuff and just my rule of thumb with cameras sometimes it is on one trail most of the time i have two to three reasons why a deer would trigger a camera and and that is the the real secret there because flame the deer i killed last year my 206 that buck that deer hated cameras hated them I had to hide those things. And when he would see that camera, he would never trigger it again. Hmm. He would go, what? oh, I'm out of here. And he'd be gone. And so then how I, I, knowing that was what he did, I positioned my cameras differently. I hid them better. And I had to run big, giant batteries for each of them because I couldn't go in there. And, um, and so I would take a shovel, dig out a battery, and bury a car battery or bury one of those big batteries. Yep. So then I knew. Once that camera was set, I never went in there. And um, there's different strategies for different deer, but it all also goes back to conditioning the deer with cameras. Um, so that's why I love feeding in the off season. That's really important. Um, feeding in the off season, I can condition those deer. If I can find him that, bam, there's a camera, a cell camera going off. Boom, boom, boom. He's conditioned to it. It doesn't hurt him. He's not afraid of it. The radio frequency is leaving that he can sense. He's not worried about it. And then that really helps. Flame, I could not get him to feed uh, in the winter uh, or um, all summer. He would come in and, and get to the edge and he'd leave. He'd freak out. Uh, but when he was three and four, he didn't care. He would come in and eat and freaking, it was like, oh, this deer is going to be the easiest deer in the world to kill. And he was fine. But then when he turned five, maybe six, I'm not sure if he was five or six. Dude, it was a freaking like a different deer hmm. lived in him. Interesting. It was so weird. Do you and see that a lot, Josh? Do you think like uh, 
you know, I know a lot of, especially like, uh, our, like our dad's age group, like they, they're all, well, it's your, they know, the you know, they're, uh, have issues with the cameras or whatever. And like, I don't know, we've been hunting with cameras our entire, like the deer that we're hunting for the most part have seen trail cameras their entire life. Like, do, do you think that there's a, a really negative connotation? Like, I, and I'm sure some deer are different than others, but I mean, are you, are you concerned about the deer knowing that the trail camera's there for the most part? I, I know you said that on for flame, but just generally speaking. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you're seeing this a lot. It's almost like the deer are evolving to hate cameras. And, um, and the reason, the reason I think it is, is because of the cell cameras, like, was, I'll have a cell yeah. camera spot and I'll run two cameras, uh, one on top, one below. This is before I ran external batteries. And when that, I wouldn't get a picture of that deer with the cell cam, cell cam dies. And literally I go back in there like a week and a half later, he comes in, boom, boom, boom. Hmm. I'm like, okay, what's up with this? So it's gotta be frequency oriented, right? Exactly. So that's a product I was trying to freaking figure out how to invent was a product, a product that blocks radio frequencies, but still allows you to have cell signal yeah. because if you don't condition your deer and he just randomly moves into your farm, they are freaked out by that. And you see this a lot in, when you're hunting, you'll see a deer walking through the field, stop, look over at the trail camera, change his course of direction. Does do this too. walk around the camera to where they don't get their picture taken. Yeah. Now, why would they do that? Yeah. And they're sensing something that we can't, you know, understand or feel and they feel it's dangerous for whatever reason. Sure. But if, if you condition your deer in the summer and the off season for Iowa, for example, with feed and running the cameras, well, then that obviously can help you in the long term running cameras in the fall over scrapes and everything else. They're not as freaked out. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Cause yeah, I mean, we hear we hear that a lot when we start talking about, I mean, is it a radio frequency? I mean, I, we're probably not the guys that, I don't know, maybe you are Josh, but what is the frequency that's put out from a trail camera? Yeah, it's a it's a radio frequency. It's an R. I think it's RMF, a radio magnetic frequency. I can't remember the exact what it stands for, but because I was looking into designing my own cell cameras um, at the time, this was before Tacticam came out, and I was trying to do a lot of research into that. And it, I ran into I because I knew that that was a major issue, and I couldn't figure out a way to block it without obviously ruining my signal. Yeah, sure. We can reduce it by a lot, but we would reduce our signal and the cameras would die faster. Yeah. And then when Tacticam came out, they they just kind of they disrupted the market with their their um, strategy. And it was genius. I mean, I couldn't make a camera for less than ninety dollars and they were selling theirs for one hundred dollars. So it was crazy. They were basically sure. giving their cameras away for free. Yeah. But then they made their money on the subscription. Side. Yeah. yeah. That was genius. Well, and the guys. Tacticam has not done anything as far as the, the RMF, right? Mm -mm. Okay. No. Someone should. I hope someone listens to this and figure that out. Because well, that's that like the main things. thing. We've talked to some other guys. DeQuistio was one of them that mentioned. He's like, "There's definitely. I'm telling you, there's something up with these cameras." And it, it's same thing you're saying. And you know whether they're developing something. I, I, I mean, no I know idea, Garmin but. is supposedly working on a satellite one where you don't have uh, cell signal that you'll be able to transmit via satellite signal because, like, they already have just you know your different signal, devices. Though, right? Yeah. So I mean, I'm sure it's still signal, has some signal. sort of you know, frequency wave that's going out. Can they test that? Can you literally? Oh, I guarantee that there's some sort of, yeah. you know, EMF type tester yeah. for that. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I have really issues with a lot of these big deer with cameras, man. And like, like that deer lightning, I only got five pictures of him ever on a camera. And so like five total pictures. And, wow. you know, just the thing that cameras do is allows you kind of reverse engineer like where you, where they are, if you study the weather data and all that stuff. And so I do rely heavily on cell cameras just because of the locations of where my farms are in sure. relation to where I live. And I have people that watch my farms and keep an eye on them and good neighbors and stuff that are like, Hey, someone's on your farm. And you know, I hunt them down and, um, and get them. But that's where the cell cams can make such a big difference. But dude, when you get a deer that doesn't like cameras, it becomes extremely difficult to kill. Yeah. I mean, oh my God, because now you're not working with real time data. You're working off of, okay, well, the weather seems a little colder today. The barometric pressure is higher. You know, we got a front moving in in two days. I guess I'll go over here where I have no idea if he is or not. Mm -hmm. And it makes, makes it really difficult, you know, but it also kind of, 
trail cameras are a double-edged sword as well because i miss the days of going sitting in a tree just waiting for something to walk by and yeah, i, I have yeah, no idea known. Sure. Yeah, it's I like, I do think cell cam. I mean, they a huge huge avenue uh, avenue for most people using them. But I do think in the last couple of years at least they've crippled a lot of my opportunities because I'll over rely on them. You know, it's yeah. like oh, I'm just gonna wait. You know, and by the time he shows up, it's too late. It's like well, should have been there already. You know, can't make the move now. Let, let but, alone what we're talking about is like whether the deer has an issue with it. or Yeah, not. I'm 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 basing too much of my when I'm gonna hunt on them versus you know, frankly, my instincts as a hunter, let alone the potential issues of like, you know, one thing that Jeremy and I discussed more Jeremy than me, but it's like, we would pull cards, you know, from a variety oh, of different this brands of cameras and realize that like, we'd only been sent a portion of the pictures that the camera actually took. And it had to do with like the speed and quality of the SD card. So it's like at the end of the yeah. season, you'd pull the card and maybe check it. And you're like, oh, I've got 2000 pictures here. And I had only sent me 600. Well, of them. And it was because 95% of the cards sold out there are not to the standard that these cell cameras needed. When we found that out, I dumped my bag of cell camera or my None uh, of them SD were. cards out. Every single one was a low quality yeah. card. I'm like, I don't know. I've been buying, buying these for and years. And I didn't think it was a big deal, but I'm, I'm literally talking the card would have 8,000 pictures on it and I would be sent 1,200 of them. Wow. From a variety, yeah. right? From, from a variety. From Tacticam, Tacticam from Spartan, from Raconix. From yeah, I mean, even it your didn't matter. too, yeah? Uh, they were pretty good. Yeah. They were still some miss, but I mean... Like, I think Reconyx, because, you know, I it was It wasn't like, scientific, but we just, you know. Reconyx, I had 8,000 pictures on a card, and I was I got 1,100 pictures sent to me. I mean, there were there were complete chunks of time. There were deer, there were mature bucks that I was like, holy shit, I didn't even know this deer existed. I know the Spartans were bad on it, too, for sure. And so I, I upgraded to these cards, which are three, four times the cost of, like, a normal SD card, and I still don't think it works. I still, I, I it just... It can't yeah. process the picture coming to the card, sending it out. And meanwhile, like, let's say it's even on a 30 second delay or two picture burst. It just, the camera yeah. can't process it fast enough. And somewhere along the line, it drops the picture on the card and it never reaches the app. That's just how yeah, it that's, is. That's a software issue, I'm assuming, probably with oh, those guys. All absolutely. they need to do is just, if the motion is being triggered, they just bat, they should just batch the photos. Well, so that's what it, Stealth was doing. My stealth would do what they called instant group. So it batched the photos. There's instant and there's instant group. Yep. And instant instant group. was no good. Yeah. Instant group would batch them. And then as soon as the, the triggering stopped. The sequence. Boom, the whole sequence. It group. sent all yeah. of them to me. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Stealth Cam. Dude, where would we be without our cell cams? I would definitely be divorced at this point. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I mean, the fact is, is I spent more time checking cameras than I actually did hunting prior to cell cameras. Now, at least, my wife can enjoy me being in the comfort of my own home, buried in my phone, checking those pictures. Yeah, 100%. And, dude, when it comes to uh, trail cameras and definitely cell cameras, reliability is, I think, the number one thing that we're looking for. Stealth Cam just has a long reputation of reliable cameras, and ultimately, that is the most important thing to us. They have to work. In terms of reliability, there's not a better camera on the market than Stealth Cam, whether you're talking about the Fusion X, the Reactor, or the DS4K Transmit. And most of them are under 200 bucks. SouthCam.com. Check them out. Well, Josh, uh, I was going to ask, because, I mean, our, our audience will probably murder us if we don't at least uh, ask about the Nebraska thing, listen, right? You want to uh, unleash everything Nebraska, we totally can. Well, so. I don't. In, in audience, a lot of it is just we don't. We don't know a lot about. Again, it's the it's kind of the third well, sure. party well, sure. yeah. thing that happens, right? So let's 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 get it out there. Let's like wherever sure. you lead us through it, right? You're the well, you're the ask first away person. What you guys want to know? I'll be happy well, to so, share. Uh, what what you, happened? <laughs> well, you mentioned you mentioned briefly, like how long ago did this happen? So it depends how you count the years, but it started like in twenty. 14 or 2015 was the first year we went out there. So okay. if you count that year, like 2015, Eight 2016, years. 17, 18, 19, 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023, we're talking almost nine years worth of time that we're living in the ninth year now that this is finally going on and it's over. So the, the gist of it was, I mean, we went to this outfitter in Nebraska and that guy was highly recommended to us from a bunch of different TV people that were going out there. They said, this guy's the best of the best. Yep. We get out there and I mean, it, it is unbelievable. I'm mule, mule deer hunting okay. and first mule deer I ever shoot was 186. 
um freaking awesome wow i was very proud of, proud of that we got it on video it was like 95 yards and i got him i was like it was super pumped 95 was, yard shot yeah holy yeah. balls and, yeah i smoked him and we watched him tip over and and uh and this was my first or second day there i mean the dude was meticulous on all of his deer he knew right where everything was i'm like this guy is awesome, you know? And so we become friends and he's like, dude, I got big whitetails too, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, okay, yeah, let's, uh, let's do a whitetail hunt, you know? And so Josh, real we started quick, right, forgive me if I asked stupid questions that we're going, I just, I really don't know the whole story. You, you, sure. um, I see where I start this. You got recommended the outfitter by somebody that somebody said oh, yeah. TV shows, a TV show. They said, yeah, you should go check this place out. And they own most of their ground or lease a lot of it. So they leased like 250,000 acres. So Holy the guy's an agronomist. Geez. So huge farm. He's an agronomist? Yeah. So he's an expert with, so he, he worked with all these farmers and then in exchange, he would give them like deals or whatever, or partner with them and lease their ground. Okay. Uh, actually how he did it was every time someone killed, he would give the farmer like, I don't know, 2000 bucks yep. or something. Um, like a commission. And so he's like, for every deer he's like yeah you have all my ground so yeah the dude ran over two hundred fifty thousand acres and can we say names uh, and stuff is that okay or? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, was, it was hidden hills outfitters hidden hills outfitters okay yeah. and, and what was the and guy's name the, that ran it uh jacob jacob okay, okay. and and yeah, he had jacob. i assume an operation like there was guys that helped him run it and two hundred fifty thousand yeah, so acres his, mostly is his family and stuff you know and okay. so i mean first impressions i mean dude we love their family we yeah. love that experience we love jacob i mean honestly they were really great people and i hate to say that like publicly because i'm gonna get eaten alive but you know we didn't see him doing anything crazy well, dude, we're like we're listening unbiasedly I, yeah. we don't know them we don't know anything about the I'm operations so. totally fine and so like and again this is over the course of years so we start hunting whitetails and of course he's putting feet out i mean his can, truck can you bait in feet. nebraska and that's where we got in trouble you can but you can't hunt within 200 yards of it Mm. okay yeah. so you can bait in nebraska all season yep. long but you can't hunt yep. within 200 yards of it you can even take a high power rifle be 201 yards away Yerk. and shoot them out of one pile and totally legal okay okay no line of sight nothing so i helped him put a ton of feet out little did i know what the stuff he was doing behind closed doors and again he was really successful a lot of his guys killed giant bucks mm -hmm. um mini booners all this stuff. Sarah and I, we'd help put feet out. We'd go hunt 200 yards away from it. We just weren't having the success. We'd leave. Other clients come in. Boom, they kill Booner. And I'm like, dang it. You know, I'm like, oh, we just bad timing. You know, we and come that, back. And that's okay, right, Josh? That, that's, uh, that was going to be my next question. You were allowed to set up 200 yards away. Whether you mm -hmm. shot him off it with a rifle from 200 yards away or you, you could just set up on the trails leading into it, that's totally yeah. legal. Totally legal. Got it. And okay. so... Yeah. And so that's, that's what we were doing, you know? And so I didn't think anything of it. I was helping them put feet out, but of course, fish and game, you know, fast forward. I mean, they got tons of evidence of me dumping feet on the ground and they're just like, see, look, you did this. I'm like, well, well yeah, but that's right. legal, right? Exactly. And okay. so this is where it gets, it gets screwy. So year, I mean, we're doing this for years and we're just not having any luck. I mean, we're not killing any white sure. We go spot and stalk. We kill mule deer. It's yeah. all spot and stalk. Yeah, we start hunting whitetails. We're just not getting any deer, mm -hmm. and then we leave. Freaking guy comes in, boom, shoots this big monster, one eighties, two hundred. I'm like, God, we come back, not kill anything. And are like, you seeing deer when you're when you're coming back? They're just out of bow range, I assume. Um, sometimes. I mean, we saw some good deer for sure. Yeah, you know, but they busted up or whatever, and and so it started getting pretty suspicious in different times. You know, it was it was fine. I was like, okay, then he, um, deer were shot and hit bad and they would find him right away. And I was like, okay. So it's kind of like you see at a party, you see people going into a room, but you never go and look. That was really what we were just it, the whole scheme of things we were guilty of. Josh, you when, know, when, when you got, I'm sorry for butting in whenever you guys were you hunting primarily like 200 yards away from corn? Was that the strategy or was that just every once in a while? That's where, you, I mean, 200 yards is, is a long way. I mean, obviously with a bow, yeah. especially, but was that, sure. the, was that the primary strategy was let's get 200 yards away from the corn or is Catch that them coming to it? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was the primary strategy, but not every spot's the same, you know, it depends if we are morning or evening hunting. And I can only, yeah. I can totally understand if it was, that's, we'd probably do the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ohio strategy. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, it wasn't it wasn't like there was anything too bad. It's just the, the problem was is all these different um the, the way Nebraska was a lot of deer lived in the hills. They would be like on the drainages and river systems. So we would just hunt further down from in the drainage system yeah, or right. river system. Yeah, that makes and, sense. Uh, yeah, it was it wasn't that difficult. And so anyway, so little did we know he was under federal investigation during this whole time. And so there was there was people undercover at his place. There were people. Mm. And I mean, what were they assuming, Josh? That he was poaching deer. So they they thought he was finishing deer off with rifles, which he was. Okay, so they somebody thought, gut shot one with a bow. Like to your point, they find it. He was shooting it with a rifle to put it down. Exactly. So some of this stuff, you know, morally is understandable. Like yeah. I get it. There's yeah. gut shot deer laying there in the hills. We'll come back three days from now, and I hope he's dead, or I just shoot him right now with a rifle. I get it. I would. I understand the decisions that that he made and why he made but them. But by law, that's poaching. Yeah, got, by law, got that's it. considered a poached deer. Got it. And so, and then putting clients over bait. You know. That so, was so like, when you left, people were coming in and killing those deer, but that's because they were sitting over top of the bait that was put out. Yes, exactly. So that was the typical success. Well, we're filming all of our hunts, so that's not even an option for us, even sure. if we wanted it. Because it's kind of hard to hide a bait pile. Yeah. You're like, oh yeah, there's he's just coming into this it's alfalfa. Been, it's been done. Yeah, some people, some people just don't give a shit, and they show it. That anyways. log looks delicious. <laughs> yeah, that's wow. They're eating a lot behind that log over there. That log must be really good. Yeah, you yeah. know, the terrain doesn't allow for that kind of mischievous behavior. Mm. Mischievous whatever the word is and we're filming all of our stuff and sure. we only both so it's it just it wasn't it wasn't even happening it wasn't an option for us and so then what ended up happening as we're progressing like through all this and i'm starting to chase some bigger deer we've seen some just not having any luck you know then we it was gosh we did this for till 2016 2017 i can't remember when they they raided us and so that we're driving from Nebraska again, unsuccessful. Ray, did you which guys again, personally? We were, if we were illegally baiting and and poaching deer. We we would have a huge success rate. We were his highest paying clients, his most famous clients, because we paid full price for every hunt. We had the largest social media following. He had the most to gain from us being successful, and yet we had the lowest success rate of all of his clients. Sure. Like, Highest paid on the books, I bet. I mean, I'm sure they did a dive into it, but like he's probably not accepting a higher non-cash payment from people he's willing to put over bait. I, you know, I, I don't know that that details of yeah, what sure. it was, but I mean, the thing is, I'm is speculating. He so force, yeah, yeah, he never forced anything on me. Like that was the thing. He's never like, dude, you know, I could throw a little feed out here and increase your odds if you want me to. Never, not once. So the reality of what it was with him is these clients wanted the bait. Like, mm. hey man, we he just let it happen. Hey man, I want to go shoot some deer at night with spotlights. Okay, I'll take you. Like that was like the stuff that he was mm. doing. Mm -hmm. Um, which I again shouldn't have been doing. It's sure. messed up. Sure. Shooting a deer at night with spotlights, all that stuff. Shooting deer with wrong tags on purpose. It's all horrible. And Josh, obviously, it, I'm gonna state the question that people are asking, and I assume we all know the. You didn't know the shit was happening. Well, that's honestly not a hundred percent true like because some of the stuff we suspected to be true like finishing deer off with rifles the odds of people being successful um over and over and over again and i know they're not great hunters you're making it yeah two and two together mm -hmm. yeah i mean we did not know he was shooting deer at night sure. we, we we didn't know the big stuff you know the the shit that i would have kicked his ass over i would have been like dude I, I, this, what are you doing? This is serious. Sure. Like we're going to freaking duke it out over this. Cause it, mm -hmm. this matters. To me. Now I'm saying that, you know, being this big beat my chest type, I wouldn't beat the guy up by any means. Right. I mean, we were friends Yeah. and, and I love that dude and his family and everything else. So again, that guy, he was just doing whatever his clients wanted to be done. And we suspected some things going on, which is why that conspiracy charge got hit with us. And quite frankly, I believe it to be true and fair because we should have pride. We should have known better. It literally says in the document, we should have known better. And see, the problem <laughs> that that all of this came from was one of the original articles that came out about us. And I'll finish the story, but it's important. They wrote the article as if I was Jacob Heffley. Yeah. They mistaken my name with Jacob Heffley, and then they said I was a part of this biggest uh, poaching ring in history. I poached 118 animals, blah, blah, blah. They 
they took my name and, and replaced it with Jacob. And then all these other articles got written based off that big yeah. one. It was well, the there, there's book. your third party just vomit oh, wow. out there. Yeah. And so that's where all this got taken out of hand because all poaching charges got dropped against us. All baiting violations got dropped against us. Every hunting violation got dropped against us. All we were guilty of was conspiracy, which means we should have known that this stuff was going on and we kept coming back. And God's honest truth is true. I mean, yeah. we, we did. We knew something wasn't right and we and we still came back anyways. Yeah. yeah. And so, but God, the dude went to freaking prison for that. I mean, he served his time. I mean, it's... He's out it's, now? He, yeah, he's out now. He did his time. And, uh, the, and so, again, I, I don't want to sit here and beat the guy up because, you know, he served his time. Sure. He's a good person. He's a good family man, a dad. Mm-hmm. Um, he wasn't, a, he wasn't really a hunter, was he, Josh? Dude, he was a badass hunter. Was he? Freaking, oh, God, yeah. Man, because why I say that is, like, some of these guys, like, it, you know, we've met him in Kansas and stuff. Like, some of these farm-type guys, dude, they don't know. Like, they're like, some hey. Of the, some of the outfitters, you mean? No, no, no. Just, like, the people we lease or know that own land. Like, they have, no, they have no concept of what the hunting laws are, right? They just go and do, like, if they're like, hey, yeah, you don't want me, you know, you want me to spot this at night? Like, they, they don't know, right? Yeah. The fact yeah, that he no, knew, this guy, he knew. Yeah, this he knew. guy was an excellent deer hunter, yeah. an excellent turkey hunter. Ugh. I mean, one of the best, honestly. I mean, the dude, because you can tell how good a guy is based on how good his camera work is, you know, like in terms of where he puts cameras, like yeah. why'd you put a camera right here and all this and the woodsmanship of this gentleman mm. and this family He's were talented. exceptional. Just became which, the pressure of making money, I assume. I don't even think it was that, man, honestly, because the dude made a lot of money as an agronomist. What the hell? The, the, that's what's so stupid. It's like he made a ton of money being an agronomist, way more than outfitting. He only took like 30 guys a year, which another reason why, you know, 30 dudes on 250,000 acres. Yeah. I didn't see these other people's setups. And, and that's, that's where the problems really kind of started falling into place was, was the dude just loved people having success and winning and getting a deer uh-huh. more than he thought he would get in trouble uh-huh. because dude, when you go out there, there's nothing, there's nothing out, out there. there. Yeah. It's just like the wild West and they just kind of lived on their own terms, you know? And, mm-hmm. and, and so that's kind of where I, I ask myself all the time, you know, why he pushed it so far because he didn't need the money. Sure. And I just think he just didn't, he had an addiction to helping people, yeah. you know, be successful. And he loved it when someone got a big deer. And, uh, and so I, I, I understand, I, get I don't it. agree obviously, or yeah, condone right. it, but that I mean, definitely so, comes with so, the territory. I mean, you want, you want to see people be successful. I, I get it again. I obviously don't Who put out the one article that really threw it in, in down the wrong path. And for you and Sarah, well, that's the problem for us is like, because Sarah and I's um, popularity on social media, because we have such a large following, Anytime they mention us in an article, anywhere, it's always their number one article yeah. because it's the most shared, it's the most viewed. So Gear Junkie does one. You know, all these people, they're just wanting clicks. They don't care that they're trying to ruin our life. They don't care about any of that stuff. They they get more clicks. They get more advertising dollars. Yeah. So they extrapolate this story to be as horrible and as horrendous as possible just to get as much clicks as possible so then they make more ad revenue. And so that's the issue that that came from us. So like CNN, Forbes, Fox. So did it affect I mean, Bomar Nutrition? No, not a penny. Yeah, no one cares. Yeah, I it's just like, wondered. I mean, because you know, it, yeah. it's because you're being brought into that light. You never know, man. I mean, especially around the hunting scenario in mainstream, right? I mean, people don't like hunting on, in mainstream America. <laughs> Yeah, our, our business would probably be 50% bigger if we didn't hunt, to be honest. So yeah. that's a, that's a talking point. It's like Sarah and I put our necks out there to stand up for us hunters and do all this. And we would make way, way more money if we did not promote hunting or share our sides of hunting or do any of that. Because hunting is the main scrutiny we've been oh, I brought, bet. Yeah. brought us. Yeah. Unbelievable wow. you know, detriment to our family and everything else over the years. And it's like, why do we do it? And it's because we're diehard bow yeah, hunters. That's who you are. It's who we are and what we and what we love. And I'm not willing to sacrifice that for any dollar. Hmm. And and so with Bowman Nutrition, it's just it's so separate and so far removed from the hunting side of things that it never even got noticed. So this didn't yeah. even but on your your Bomar 
uh, you know, on the bow hunting side. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, the, the problem was our company was scaling and growing. And so it's hard to say, like, would it grown more? Sure. We just we make really good products, you know, with our nose button. A lot of people use them. Um, a lot of top end guys, the best of the best in the world use them. And yeah, really Levi uses it. them, right? Yeah, Levi uses them. Jeremy I Flynn mean, uses one. I do. <laughs> I, I use two. One on my one on my recurve and one on my compound. <laughs> oh, thanks, guys. Yeah, it, it, it makes a big difference, you know, because, I mean, again, I could get into that product if you'd like, but I think having a good product, I, that what, what we noticed was we didn't see the sales necessarily declining. We saw people promoting that they're using the product decline because they, they didn't want to be started. associated. Exactly. So they liked it so much. Like I'm not taking this off my bow. This thing makes a big difference. But I'm not going to brag about it. I'm, I'm not going to go out of my way to brag about it is basically the difference that we saw. And that's all changing now. You know, it was hot and heavy. People just don't care. I think, I think the world wanted a bigger, you know, grand finale mm -hmm. from what was happening. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Wow, they didn't lose any of their hunting rights because we didn't poach. That was going to be my other question. Yeah, yeah, we can do because you play you play guilty to something, right? The conspiracy charge. To yeah. conspiracy charge. It to be true, but that and doesn't that doesn't affect your hunting rights anywhere or anything. No. Okay. Nebraska, which sucks. Now, does um, that follow a pack law? Because isn't there a pack law in the states that, like, if let's say Nebraska drop, drops yours, then Iowa could or somebody else. Does that exist? Uh, it, it does exist, but it doesn't exist for us because these weren't poaching charges. Okay. So that's where, again, dude, clarity for everyone listening on this, right? Because the first thing I think I talked to you about, I was like, well, can if Josh loses his license in Nebraska, there's a pack law. Like, does that affect his license in Iowa and elsewhere? You're right. saying no because Depends it's not poaching. Right. Well, it's not poaching. And again, I mean, everyone says I'm a poacher. It's so stupid. I'm like, right. the, literally what we were charged with, with conspiracy says I couldn't approach. You can't conspire sure. to go murder someone, yeah. go in a crowded room, shoot them in the face, and yeah. they fall over dead, and then you're found guilty for That's conspiracy. conspiracy. Yeah. You, you, you did it. <laughs> you conspire to murder someone you've already murdered. It's no longer conspiracy. No different than we can't conspire to poach if we've already poached. Well, and I mean, like, you're, you, you know, you, and kudos to you, Josh. I mean, you're coming out and saying, hey, listen, we should have known better, right? I mean, you're admitting we should have known better. That said, like, it's still pretty freaking subjective. I mean, especially when you're talking about 250,000 acres and 30 guys, like, unless you're seeing it, it's well, just assumptions, and how, right? how far did that go, too, Josh? Because, like, why would you guys be any more guilty of conspiracy than every other person that hunted at Hunting Hills? Oh, or, they all or, got or, it. Or whatever it is. They all got it? Oh, yeah. It was one of the largest um, busts ever. So they wow. all got it. Everyone. Everybody... Um, just turned over and said, yep, did it. Whoops. Sorry. Pay my fines. I can't hunt for five years. Uh, sorry. And they all, there's like 20 or 20 of them or something. How can got they hit. hold everybody accountable for, you should have known. Or is no, there... they got hit with actual poaching charges. Oh, the well, ones that, well, who were that, hunting over bait. Well, that I understand. But like how many people can they re really hold accountable for like conspiracy saying you should have known? Cause yeah, I mean, I would assume there were well, other so people they, hunting well, like now, you guys were right. That they weren't hunting over bait. They were just there yeah they they didn't get hit they they should have got hit with conspiracy well that's what I, I guess that's what we're asking is it because of your popularity that you think you got targeted yeah. no shit i hate saying the word famous but well, well i mean it is and yeah because they weren't well known they just said oh whatever we don't care and then they just moved on wow. but yeah they also so sure. <laughs> but none of them in their defense none of them went three times a year for four years either well yeah you know? that's true and that's so true we were there more than everybody that's else what I was and you probably had a closer relationship yeah. relationship with jacob than they yeah, did yeah okay. exactly and they let jacob do all the work yeah i was like dude you're going to put feet out let me help man yeah i'm out there and feed with them you know yeah, and yeah. and so that was the problem it's like there was way more evidence against us for that reason and so i can run through the evidence i mean it was crazy all that stuff if you want but no the the evidence the reason why we would have fought this all the way to the end and i and i think with pretty high level certainty that we would have got off clean um, with everything, but we did plead guilty to conspiracy for, a, I'll, I'll explain it to you. So based on the evidence. So I want you guys, now that you've seen all the articles and you kind of understand um, what has been said about us based on us not even poaching, right. us having all baiting charges dropped, poaching charges dropped, all hunting violations dropped, 
all got off scot-free of all the actual hunting violations, but you see the articles, how they're written now. Mm -hmm. so now imagine an article written with e with evidence of me dumping feet on the ground. <laughs> yeah. Now imagine an article of a text messages of me sending to Jacob saying, dude, I can't shoot him. He's in the feed, LOL. Uh, 200 yards away and I'm shooting a bow. It's a joke. Yeah. Obviously, I can't him in the feed. Out of context. But out of context, what does that sound like? Yeah. Sure. That sounds like I can't shoot him. He's in the feed. Yeah. Sarah in a tree stand sitting over top of a bait pile. And there's a picture on her phone with a giant bait pile in front of her. She was hunting coyotes. She had already tagged out of her buck. But who else? Out of context. Know? Yeah. Taken out of context. I mean, there's a picture of feed and cheese in the deer stand, but she already killed her buck and was tagged out. Mm -hmm. And so that's where. That's where things get a little squirrely sure. and all this stuff. But she ended up did end up killing a coyote, which is badass and cool. But mm -hmm. again, you know, all that taken out of context, the reason why we took and it gets way worse um, with what Sarah said in text messages, because she was just learning how to hunt. Sarah was a vegetarian when I met her in 2014 mm -hmm. and it's a true story. And then literally we're hunting at this place in 2015. Wow. So she's a girl in boy camp with all a bunch of men she's trying to fit in so she says dumb things um and so one of the things she said was uh, i'll get in trouble for this but it's hilarious so i'm gonna say it anyways <laughs> yeah just lay it out i don't even care. we'll take it so out of context sarah, don't worry <laughs> it's great it's so funny so sarah called all the hen turkeys hillary clinton's she loves turkey hunting so when she would shoot a, a turkey in the fall, you know, she's like, oh, shot another Hillary Clinton in the face. Dinner's on me, boys. And it's just horrible. Like, oh, man, I missed Hillary Clinton tonight. God, I really was hoping to smack her. You know, just, just, just the most horrendous text you can uh, imagine. She's not in know. any political seat, so it doesn't matter anyways anymore. Yeah, but imagine as a Bomber Nutrition brand that that is now on the headline. Yeah. Bomber wishes to kill Hillary Clinton. Uh. And, and, I mean, so when when we looked at that, we're like, okay, this is pretty damning. And the God's honest truth. Yeah, like, yeah that we, looks bad. That looks bad. <laughs> okay, that looks bad. I can I, see that. I get it. It looks bad. We would have won, I'm pretty confident, because they wouldn't have brought that conspiracy charge to us like, you know, a couple months before our trial date. Sure. And so, like, hey, by the way, we'll we'll do all this. And they kind of organized all this with our lawyers. And I don't know, like, how it all kind of got. They brought it to us for sure. And then the lawyers and all that stuff kind of finessed it. But they wouldn't have given that type of deal if there was a slam dunk win for them yeah. at all. Because that would have looked really bad on them. Oh, yeah, here's millions of dollars we invested of your guys' taxpayer money. Oh, by the way, they didn't do anything. Oops. Yeah, that would have been Sorry. bad. So if they're like, hey, we'll get a conviction and that conviction's conspiracy, it's still a conviction. It's still a win in it's our It's still books. a win in the books. And for us, like I was fine with it because it was true. You know, I mean, the way the conspiracy charge is, I was like, are we, did yeah. we poach? Nope. Did we, I said, are you dropping all poaching charges? Yep. What about hunting violations? Yep. Can I still hunt? Yes. Okay. Is there anything that would stop me from doing what I'm doing now? No. They're like, you can't hunt Nebraska anymore. I'm like, will you agree to that? I'm like, well, I haven't hunted Nebraska. I don't care about Nebraska right now because of everything that happened. I wasn't going to go back and deer hunt. I said, but I love Nebraska. It's a great state. I said, I'd like to hunt there. So that's the only sucky part about it. So, and um, what's the ban on that? Lifetime or five years or? It was just, it was supposed to be one year. And then the judge was like, I'm giving you three years. I'm like, oh crap. And it was all because of social media. Jeez. When I did my post. When I did my post, it was supposed to be one year. I said, hey, they're dropping all the baiting charges. They took that as me not taking um, – they took it out of – not out of context, but they had a lot of people like message them saying I wasn't taking responsibility for my charge. And and I was like, wait a second. I am Yeah, so he wanted to make, a, make an example. Wow. He wanted to make an example out of it. I'm like, what the heck, man? So – so it did go from one year to three years, which does suck. Um, but but it doesn't honestly, affect any other state. I mean, everything else, no, life goes on. And I wasn't deer hunting out there anyways. And did you guys and have so, some no, substantial fines too, Josh? Yeah, but nowhere near as much as people thought. It's only it was it was a lot. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. It was like seventy five thousand. Oh um, wow! Total for conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And here's why: because of the Lacey Act. So yeah. when you're dealing with the Lacey Act, if you use a vehicle, 
Well, now that's in part of it. So because we drove a vehicle, um, that vehicle should have been, um, we conspired to uh, go hunt at this place when they were doing illegal activities. That means whatever we were using to get there was needed to be paid for in terms of some sort of like Lacey Act rule where it's like, I don't know the exact word for it, but it's in, added in the fine. So then the value of the truck, the trailer, all of this stuff that we used, but then we got hit with a triple whammy because we owned a company, Bomar, Bomar Bow Hunting LLC. It was a media oh. company. So Sarah got hit for the truck. I got hit for the truck. And Bomar Bow Hunting got hit for the truck. So all of our fines were triple. And even though it was the same person, same act. So that's why we had to pay a buttload in fines. But we didn't have to pay as much as everyone else, which is another thing. People are like, oh, they just have money. They bought themselves out of this. And I don't have more money than the United States government. I can't buy myself out of any of this. Are you kidding me? And so, so we did get hit with fines, but it was middle of the road of fines. We didn't lose any hunting rights or any of that stuff. And so, I mean, all in all, I truly believe what the verdict was, was true and fair. Sure. We should have known better. And I think a lot of people could have ended up in that same scenario and probably yeah. would have done similar things that I did with the decisions I made of not calling, you know, the law on their buddies. That uh, that truck is not the truck that you burned, is it, Josh? No, that <laughs> truck I burned. I love that truck. Everyone says I lit that truck on fire. Uh, I, I had to bring it up. I mean, I love what that truck. I mean, what what happened with that? So I was just doing controlled burns. We we're burning off all the extra thatch that was dead on our farms. Yeah, uh, on our food plots, and it was the last plot. And I usually just drive a four wheeler around, but I'm like. The four wheeler needed gas and the tire was kind of flat. And I'm like, I don't, I have one plot left. I'll just open my car door and just do it out of the truck. I'm like, it's not that big of a deal. So when you do a controlled burn, you got to do a back burn, which yeah. is basically where you go up, you burn 10 to 15 feet, sometimes 30 feet. I usually do 30. It just doesn't get enough speed. It dies yeah, out of into the, the wind usually. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so I go to the opposite side of the food plot to the opposite side of the, where the wind's blowing. And so as I'm driving, the wind should be blowing towards the timber yep. and the wind switches when I'm up there. So it's blowing back into my fender. And so I'm like, oh, I better go faster. I don't want to burn my truck. I didn't think it would catch on fire. I thought I'd just discolor the paint, you know, and I'm like, I don't want to do this because it was a show truck. It was a, an awesome truck. I love that thing. And it was a big F-350 and, and the guy used it as a show truck for, he owned a, one of the bedlining businesses. Oh yeah, so yeah. It, 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 like the spray-ins. Yeah, one yeah. of those brands. The fenders were all done nice, and and I, I love that thing. And and you try replacing a truck in freaking 2021. Or yeah, 2021. it ain't happening. No, and so obviously my insurance covers for what I paid for the vehicle, not what it would cost to replace an F350 in 2022. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy. None of this makes any sense for people um, if they actually think about it in terms of for views. I mean, and I don't make any money from Instagram views. So what is that going to do? Well, man, I heard everything from, yeah, you did it for views. I've heard somehow it was in connection with this whole Nebraska thing. I mean, there were all, this is the, this is the internet, right? I mean, there's all these spins that come out of this thing. Yeah. And again, I was an idiot. So I deserve everything that's coming for me for this because I should not have been using my truck. I should have, there's a lot of things we'll dive through. I want to tell the, finish the story of how it yeah, happened, yeah. my, my mess ups and stuff. So I go to the other end and I start the fire, right? And the wind's blowing to me when it's supposed to be blowing the other direction. Yeah, no so way. Like, yeah, so now the fire's blowing into the truck, like towards the fender. So I haul ass. I get to the other side of the, the food plot, and now the wind is blowing the direction it's supposed to be blowing, which is back into the same stupid fender. And so I'm almost done with the food plot. I get about halfway and I look back and my fender is on fire. I'm like, oh crap. Well, I can't just stop because now I have flames coming in on this side, flames coming in on this side. So I haul ass all the way to the end of the 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 food plot and I hop out and all I have is my my uh, leaf blower. I mean, when you do control burns, you don't have fire. No, 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 no. You, you have, you have a leaf and blower blow and a rake. <laughs> a blower and a rake. So I get my leaf blower on it and it's out. It's like there's a little tiny smoldering. I'm like, oh, my God, I screwed my truck up. But the thing broke off the end and it stopped blowing and then the flames caught on fire again i get it back together and then it gets into the bed of the truck where there is feed sacks mm. and when those feed sacks went up i had a propane tank back there holy all this shit, shit. Like, 
I'm like, I'm back there. I burn myself on my shoulder, like almost third degree burns where my meat's hanging out. And I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, my truck is going to go under. We have $5,000 in camera equipment in the back seat. Yeah. We have one. I mean, dude, it was crazy. So I'm like, get all the shit out of the truck right now. We had the drone case, all the camera work. So I dive into there and the fire is like blazing into the, uh, through the bed of the truck into the window. And it's like the window is stopping it. And so I'm feeling the heat like on my face <laughs> as I'm in the back of the truck. And I, we had all this filming because we were filming the control burn with the drone and the camera. We were doing a normal production. You, so weren't, by, you weren't by yourself then. You had a cameraman or a couple oh, of I, had a, I had a cameraman. Okay. And so when he set the camera down, he set it down and he just set it towards everything. Because that's my rule with my guys. I'm like, listen. If I get eaten alive by a lion and and <laughs> you I'll better get on camera. <laughs> I was like, it better be on camera or I will come back and haunt you. Holy said, shit. And so that's my rule. I said, I, you're not gonna help me in any scenario that I need help to where <laughs> if I'm drowning or any of that stuff, you just keep filming. I said, the reason is is like that is when the juiciest stuff happens, like the most fun in an episode it happens when shit's going down the hardest yeah. and so i tell those extremes because if i didn't tell those extremes god i would hope they would stop a lion from attacking me but the reason why i say it at those extremes is because in the times where they feel it's threatening when it's really not they still record right like for example my skid steer is about to tip over with a with a blind on it right and i'm on a hill and i'm about to tip over what are they going to do they can't do anything, right? Wow. And so in that scenario, it's better just to film no. it happen and just it, – it's freaking stupid and it's like, okay, here's me being an idiot again and me trying, whatever. But then throwing the camera down and then running over to make sure I'm okay isn't going to solve any problems, right? Sure. But that's that's why I have that rule in place. So he did a good job. He put the camera down facing the vehicle and we're getting all this stuff out, right? And the fire is blazing into the truck now and I'm diving in and I'm just throwing everything out. I got all this paperwork and all this stuff. And I didn't put this in the video because it it probably would have got taken down for one, but it it was really dangerous. I had a bunch of bullets in the back seat uh, behind the thing. I didn't know. I forgot about back there. I'm a big prepper, so I, I keep guns yeah. and stuff. So yeah. different and, and bullets and all this. And, dude, I get out of there, and the freaking guns start going off. No. <laughs> freaking 223s. Boom, boom, and they're firing, and I'm like, "Holy oh my God. shit, dude!" And I was just, but I had one more thing I had to get out of there, and it was stupid now, but it was one of our big, big cameras, and I freaking dive in there and grab that thing, get it out, and freaking bullets start shooting through the thing, and we clear out, and we're filming all this thing, and I was just like, "Oh my God, I'm such an idiot. Why did I do that?" I'm like, "I can't believe I went back in there," and then the same thing is just fire everywhere, and then we had another problem. We look over there and the fire that we had lit is now catching up to the truck where we have all of our gear laying on the ground 10 or 20 yards from the truck on fire. So I'm like, what are we going to do? We have to get all this stuff in there. So then we take off running and the flames are coming and we're like melting. This fire is so hot because now the propane tank blew and propane tanks don't blow up. They blow and it just shoots this geyser of fire out of the bed of the truck. It is just going a thousand miles an hour and it's just so incredibly hot you can't imagine so i'm like melting as we're picking up our stuff and running into the timber and my poor camera guy as i'm like he's like he would did not sign up for this you know obviously. <laughs> yeah. so he's like who do i work for like what is going he's on he's like here? it's been fun so, dude but <laughs> yeah. yeah he's like all right i'm gonna I'm go out. back to filming something else this sucks <laughs> So we get everything into the timber and I call the fire department. They come up, they, they put out the fire and it was so hot. It melted the frame of the truck. Holy shit, dude. Crazy. And so they're like, all right, well, you need to get a wrecking crew out here to get the truck off the farm. And I'm like, nope. I said, I want that truck to stay right here because I need a reminder of being a moron. And this is going to remind me, this is now the F-350 food plot. So that is, that truck is still there to this day. Wow. <laughs> That's yeah, crazy, man. I mean, if I was going to do some reviews, it would not be burn my truck up. It'd be like ramping my truck through a ground blind or something. That would be way more fun and entertaining. Yeah. But I wouldn't light it on fire. Wow. It's a, well, it's a, it's a good reminder that shit happens fast. Yeah. Especially with it fire. Shit, fire fire is dangerous. 
yeah, it shit happens to me a lot faster than. Uh, so it, it same with Jared. You, yeah. you and Jared, it's called, it's called a stupid gene. It's what drives us to do great things. You, you both are yeah. strong as bulls, but then you just yeah. you just go into the china shop and wreck it. Sometimes the china shop well, can't handle it. You know what it is? I actually know why this happens. It's because we're unwavering optimists. Yeah. So we're so optimistic that <laughs> what bulls, can go wrong? <laughs> we're like, oh, it'll 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 be okay. Oh, well, I mean, I he, got he ripped his finger it'll, off it, on it, a tree stand on a tree stand stick. Yeah, yeah. it ripped See his that? finger off. Oh my God! Yeah, that looks horrible. I and, bet you that's a lost a, tr- lost a tooth the other day. Out. Lost the tooth the other day in a ribeye. And yeah, and I mean, uh, he yeah. just keep. Well, it was like two days later. He came back to work, and he was like, "Yeah, I'm fine." I was yeah. like, "Dude, you lost the finger." Dude, that's crazy. I'm, fr- I'm familiar with injury. I've been I've I've been through the ringer. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. But but yeah, that's that's where you know. There's I mean plug it in, you know, that's where a lot of us end up. But, you know, I spend so much time doing all this stuff and it's always at the extreme. Bad stuff's going to happen. Shit's going to hit the fan. And when it does, I just have a camera recording. Shit's the fan for a lot of people. They just don't have it on video. Well, you know? and, I, and I think <laughs> that's where, you know, because of where you and Sarah are in the viewership side of things, you know, little things get spun and then it just keeps spinning out there in different circles and different things, you know, and, and whether it's the Nebraska thing or the truck thing, like, I, I mean, even do go back to your whole Under Armour bear spearing I- incident, yeah. right? I mean, con- the whole constantly. unethical, you're a horrible person. I can't believe you do that. Yeah. Constantly. It's just, there, there are a lot of things that, well, and, and I'd remember, I mean, that was, when was that? That was a while ago. Is that 2014? 15, I think, 15? 2016. Maybe. Like, there was a point there where, like, it happened, and then, like, I don't know if you, like, I don't know if you actually, like, apologize. Something came out, and then people were like, oh, he's just, you know, he's not standing up for hunters then. <laughs> it was like, no, so, dude, you couldn't so, win. This was recently. I mean, so, so Under Armour, the rehash that a little bit, because I just recently posted that video again. Um, there's two things I remember from that. One, Under Armour gave into the pressures of the anti hunters. Sure. They, and so what people don't realize about that is during ATA, which is in January, I went there and I said, hey, I'm going to be spearing a bear. I'm going to wear your gear. Are you guys OK with this? I know you don't sponsor me. You sponsor my wife, but it's going to be on video. Um, if I am successful with this, you know, this could this could, you know, it's going to get a lot, a lot of views. Of yeah. Yeah. They're like, they're like, dude, this is awesome. This message, it goes really well with our message. It'd go where you don't belong. The ultimate predator. You have our full support. This is awesome. They sent me gear for it. Like it was a lot of support. And so Sarah and, was sponsored by Under Armour, but you weren't at the time. I, I wasn't, correct. Okay. And so I said, well, where do, should I go and do this? And they said, oh, you need to go to an outfitter that we sponsor, which is the 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 rivets out there. That was like the best bear hunting outfitter um, in Canada, mm-hmm. which they are. So like, um, they don't like me. They have me blocked on all their platforms. Um, hate my guts for what happened. But if you're looking to do a black bear hunt, that's the place to go. Mm. And so I raving oh, reviews. See if, you can, <laughs> see if you can get me back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to come a, back. Put no, in a good word so, for me. Wait. So they blo- just because of this whole incident, like they just yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't blame them. You know, they got kind of sucked into the limelight, but they they didn't get any of the public scrutiny. They didn't get the death threats and all that stuff. And nothing had happened to them. Um, yeah. But it just stopped bear hunting as much. People aren't as excited about doing it. You know. Yeah. But uh, what ended up happening was um, I do it. I was successful. I harvest this bear with a spear and end up being a giant, like seven over seven foot Boone and Crockett skull monster bear. I would have speared a small bear. I would have been fine with. As long as he's mature, I didn't care, but it happened to be just this mega monster. Well, and tying the track side, right? You were a javelin thrower. This isn't like, yeah. I mean, it, not he, your first spear that you've not, thrown. Yeah, it's not your first oh, rodeo, I, man. I this, this big bodybuilder guy, you know, and I was an all-American javelin thrower. I still hold the university record <laughs> yeah. for this throw, you know, and every day that was my warm-up. You know, I'd throw out an empty Gatorade bottle and I would just throw my javelin at it to warm my shoulder up and I'd get further and further away. And so I did this for years. And so I found out, I was like, man, it'd be a dream of mine to build my own spear and then take it spear hunting. And um, a buddy, Tim Wells, messaged me. He said, yeah. hey, they are going to be banning spear hunting next year. If you are going to do this spear hunt, you need to do it now. And mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, crap. 
So that's what kind of got everything going, you know, and that's where I booked this hunt for that spring. Um, I'm successful with it. Under Armour post it on their page. History has been made. It's me holding the spear, all that stuff. And four months goes by nothing. And then a European place watched the video. They said I was a sadistic American, made it out to be this crazy murderous thing. Damn became, Europeans. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, know. Absolute <laughs> global news. Um, everyone did a piece on it and they're just like beating me alive. I mean, I mean, it was, it was way, way worse than the Nebraska thing. I mean, a thousand times worse. We had d hand delivered messages. So letters in our mailbox that didn't have stamps on them saying, I know where you live. I'm going to skin you and your family alive. Well, like, that's insane, man. Well, and you know, what's crazy yeah. is I don't think if you would have done that to a whitetail, you wouldn't have gotten near the kickback. It's the bear. It's just like the wolf. Like these, these, these animals are held in mainstream views so much differently than something like a deer or, or an elk or whatever. Well, this is what I said recently when someone said I, I turned my back on this and it's not true. I, I, they asked me if I regretted it and I said, no, I would do it again. I regretted how I filmed it. Sure. So I filmed it to be as viral as possible. I didn't film it to tell the best story. Mm -hmm. that's the difference. And I regret that. I regret the fact that I didn't show that I was this, you know, all American javelin thrower. And I had trained many years to prepare for this moment. And I yeah. practiced relentlessly until I destroyed an entire life-size target um, with a spear because I threw it so thousands of times to prepare for this moment. I, I didn't show any of those things because I thought it would be too boring. Sure. I didn't show eating the bear. I didn't show any of that stuff. I just showed all the action and that is what put it put it out there but what really made it bad is they had a biologist review the video and say the bear easily could have lived for 16 hours before it died what and it suffered oh yeah i mean the literally the bear ran 60 yards and died like it was dead i mean bear can run over 30 miles an hour that's four seconds of time or less he was dead within five to six seconds and what happened is blade i got 27 inches of penetration and that 16 inch blade, five inches wide, it goes through the middle of his body, liver back towards his guts. And it's sticking out of him like this. He takes off running and then hits a tree. Yeah. And that spear goes whoosh, through his organs up through everything else. It just, when we gutted that thing, the guide said, I've never seen so much trauma on a bear, even shot with a seven millimeter. Yeah. He said, this is insane. It was it it bled out so fast it bursted all the blood vessels through its neck and everything it was crazy mm. on what was happening but so anyways the so under armor turns their back and that that story finishes where they they totally lied they said they made a post they call us and they say we're going to have to in order for this to go away we're going to have to say that we don't condone spear hunting and I said, that is a terrible idea. You will regret doing that. You cannot do that. You did. You were lying. They're like, well, this is what we have to do. And by the way, we're also dropping your wife. I'm like, great. Mm. And so we made a post. It said, this is all we did. And this is what I remember the most from this experience. Not the death threats, not anything else. It's what I'm going to say next. It's really powerful. And I miss this about the hunting community. We posted, we said, Under Armour gave into the pressures of the anti-hunters and they're going to say they don't condone spear hunting, a legal spear hunt. And so what's next? Are they only going to condone uh, rifle hunting because archery is is an inefficient way to hunt an animal in comparison to a rifle? And that was it. And then the entire hunting community banded together and stood up against Under Armour. And they burned all of their clothes. They were burnt. I don't know if you guys remember. I this do. I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah hats and it wasn't because of us um I, I don't take credit for that i just the what i loved about that is the hunting community rallying around a cause well that was that, it it brought out it brought out something that the entire community could say yeah we're we're going to stand against that and that that's really powerful and i and i saw the power it had under armor stock tanked like insane i don't think they've ever recovered their hunting branch went down to dead. two employees. Yeah. I'm not, I'm speaking, you know, loosely. I just know that they're, it's not sure. as big. It's dead. Um, yeah. And I mean, you go to their social media, they got like 600,000 subscribers and they get like 300 likes. A post. Well, they, I mean, they recently shit can cam cam Haynes too. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, they couldn't keep the lights on. And yeah. again, it's just the power of all of us banding together, giving Under Armour the middle finger. And, and because they turn their back on us hunters, I, I, I hate that there's an, a company because I would also argue, well, Under Armour stuck their neck out um, for hunters when they're not a hunting community. And, and, you know, there's an argument for that too, but they should never have turned their back on us. Yeah. That's um, on the well, PR when there side. was money to be made, but then when the going got tougher, there was a threat of their, you know, yeah, they cave. bigger business. They a cave. lot of, a, a lot of businesses do. Yeah, you know, especially anybody that's got mainstream taps. A lot of them, a lot of them. I mean, to your own admission, Josh. I mean, obviously, your Beaumont Nutrition could be a lot bigger if you would cave to the hunting to say, yeah, oh, you sure. know, we're not, we're not going to highlight this anymore. Same thing with our political views of being Republican. Absolutely, I mean, if we didn't all that stuff. I mean, a lot of Democrats buy protein, and yeah, we yeah. just alienate the crap out of ourselves by sure. standing up for what we believe is right and and true <laughs> and. You know, I've never been money motivated by any of this stuff. So it, it none of that really matters um, money wise. It's what the truth is and it what I care about most. Same thing with videos. I mean, my God, how many people say I'm terrible for hunting? You're horrible. You take so many unethical shots and oh my God, it's the worst. Oh my God, I read all the comments and some of them, you know, I'm just like, that just bothers the heck out of me. You get praised for anything good, Josh. Like, and I don't say that like, it, sure. it, well, because I saw, um, I don't know, recently you and Sarah did a camp for inner city kids, introducing them to the outdoors. Yeah. I mean, yeah. do people it, acknowledge that? No. No, they don't. I mean, Sarah and I have donated. They love to the hate. Meals. I mean, I mean n none of that stuff gets recognized. I mean, we've donated over $2 million to our military overseas with product. I mean, we've sent pallets and pallets of pallets of products to them um, into different bases and and I mean, my God, in terms of uh, schools and all that other stuff, we're, we're starting to build schools in Africa now. Um, we've supplied school, current schools, orphanages, all this stuff. We do all of this. We were doing this before we made money and we do it more now than ever. And then we co-started a, a, um, a company, a nonprofit called Kids in the Outdoors, where we take inner city kids, you know, and introduce them to uh, just fishing, hunting, archery, and and it's so fun. And our partner Stephen McBee on that, you know, he's more of like the guy that runs all this stuff right. and and kind of helps, you know, facilitate all of it. But that's where you know we we do a lot of stuff, you know, for this and um, and do our best to introduce a lot of people to the outdoors. And we get thousands of people that get into the outdoors because we do voice what we say on social media on our non-hunting platforms like our fitness accounts and do all that. So we bring thousands of people in mm -hmm. and all it takes is just one guy mm -hmm. to say, Hey man, or one girl, you know, I was never a hunter. I got into hunting and I'm feeding my family now because of you. Thank you. I got into archery because of you. Thank you. And that makes all the death threats from the non hunters, all the profits lost, all that stuff worth it because in, or one of those little kids catching their first fish or shooting the bow for the first time and hitting a bullseye, like, all of that stuff matters way more than any dollar you could ever make or any of those things. And, and for me, that's what matters when it comes to the litmus test of what I filter things through. And I'm like, okay, should I post or not post this? It's not, will this make me more money or get me more views or do any of that stuff? It's like, is this content I want to watch? Is this content that is not necessarily going to hurt or help hunting? It's a, is it just content that's enjoyable to watch? Is yeah, it entertaining? Yeah, yeah. Is it fun? Would I want to watch this? And and that's what matters because for me, I'm never going to make a video for people that don't want to watch it to appease people that can't be appeased on a topic just to, to polish my halo that I'm some, you know, perfect outdoorsman. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing in the world. And anybody that changes their content style to appease the anti-hunters or the non-hunters are literally dying on the vine, if not already dead. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I agree. They are not creating content for their fellow brothers, their fellow outdoorsmen. They're creating content for people that you cannot make happy watching that video. To them, you're killing a kitten. And there's no way you can film a kitten being slaughtered yeah. that will make them happy. It won't work. So yeah. it doesn't, it's not going to work. So why on earth would anyone gear their content to that? And, and again, some of the stuff that I share and post, it definitely, you know, is borderline, but I, I don't know, man. I mean, I, I personally, 
you know what I think when it comes to the ethical argument or what's ethical and unethical? Because I take far shots. I've killed a lot of shit really far. I killed, a, I haven't posted this video, but I killed an ostrich, you know, at 140 yards in Africa. <laughs> Holy um, shit. That's crazy. An ostrich. <laughs> Couldn't get closer. Well, it was, I'm Friggin assuming it was a headshot with a guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's friggin, we couldn't get any closer, so I killed him out there. And then the other one I killed was 118, that world record grants I killed. You know, I've killed a lot of animals past 100 yards, and they're like, you're the most unethical person in the world. How could you do that? And I honestly, that's a fair argument. But my argument is, is, Tell me a distance an animal's never been wounded, and that'll be the distance that I shoot. Yeah. Yeah. I've been and wounded at two yards. <laughs> there's, I guarantee if you looked at the data, there's more animals wounded at 20 yards than 110. Yeah. yeah. And so, I'm like, there's a, every distance an animal is wounded. It's not based, sure. an ethical argument is not based on whether or not the shot is close or too far or any of that. It depends on the skill of the hunter. If yeah, Dale Earnhardt man. Jr., hops in a car he can drive faster on a road safely than a mom in a minivan doing the same distance yeah it's it's it just depends on the person it's a personal decision well it's the false confidence too in a lot of this equipment and it, i mean i'll put compound bows in the same same argument there there's a lot of people that <clears throat> think they can go out and buy a new compound bow and they should be able to shoot 70 yards and they're not proficient at shooting 70 yards same thing with a crossbow. People put a three by nine scope on a crossbow and they'll think they can go out and shoot 80 yards because the company said so. Doesn't yeah, mean that you can't well, do that. And in fairness, like the odds of failure go up dramatic, dramatically the further, I mean, nobody's sure. saying that. Yeah, margin of error is a lot smaller. And in the same breath, you know, the, the chances of success are, are much greater the closer the distance. But I hear what you're sure. saying. Yeah, it's... And, and my argument would be, well, what are the factors at close distance? So say the archer is proficient enough to hit the bullseye at 120 yards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That same archer can shoot 20 yards with the same success as 100 in terms of targets. Sure. We'll, we'll just set that aside. I, I don't know if that does. Ex does that exist, Josh? You're yes, saying You're saying an archer that can shoot 20 yards and 100 yards, um, you know, over a thousand arrows right because obviously the more you shoot the bigger quantity size that that doesn't exist sample size um, Sam so i'm i'm saying for the sake of the argument of what i was going to say next okay sorry so but yeah i mean i can hold a half a minute of angle at 100 yards when my setup's perfect which means i can hold a five inch group at 100 yards consistently every single time no different than like uh, if uh, and maybe the wind blows sure there's, there's variation in those shots variations my shot cuts loose a little bit low or something like that but when my bow is really dialed in yep. and i'm at my best i can hold a half a minute of group or which it's five inches okay and sometimes it's even better than that two to three inches if the conditions are perfect and so let's let's take let's just say for sake of argument for this this particular ethics ethical shot at 20 yards and 100 yards the archer can hit the same spot every single time okay, okay. just for the argument so what factors would take play for someone missing at 20 yards? Movement of the target. Movement of the target. Wind. Then hearing the bow going off, perhaps. Mm -hmm. they um, wind. There's wind. I mean, there's so many things, right? So then we'd Curvature we take that of the earth. at 100 yards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and then you put it at 100 yards. They don't hear the bow go off. They can't see you, most likely. You know, they don't know. There's no at 20 yards. You go, Mah. yeah, you're freaking rushing the shot. You're freaking out because you got no time. You know, any second this deer is going to freaking run away and ah, boom, and you're like, oh, I shot in the guts. What the heck was I doing? You know, at 100 yards, animals, let's say, relaxed, just not has no idea you're there. You're relaxed. You have more time to execute the shot. And again, all variables the same. They can't hear the bow go off. All they're going to hear is an arrow coming, and at that distance, maybe it's too late. And so if your bow shoots 300 feet per second, there's three feet in a yard. That's 100 yards, and the bow shoots 100 yards in one second. Now, again, that I understand if your bow shoots 300 feet per second at 100 yards, it's deaccelerating. It may shoot 250 by the time he gets there. Just an argument. Right. So now I need to be able to, to shoot 100 yards proficiently. I need to be able to predict what that animal can do in one and a half seconds. So I do not take shots very often. I don't say never because there's exceptions. 
but if all variables considering, I will shoot at that animal um, because I can predict where he's going to be in the next second to second and a half. He doesn't see me, doesn't know I'm there, doesn't know what's going on, and I can still make that shot. And I argue that I would have a higher success rate at 100 yards. Levi Morgan would have a higher success rate at 100 yards. Plug in, you know, the the Christopher Perkins, the the Jesse Broadwaters. I mean, all those people, they take 100-yard shots. I would argue that they would have higher success rates than an average guy at 20 yards. Because I think the average guy struggles really bad with executing a really great shot. Sure. And so I would argue that it depends on the skill of the archer. It depends on whether 100%. it's ethical or not. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the basis for what we said there is like, and it's just such a small fraction of guys that can shoot as good at 100 yards as they can at 20 yards. Uh, right. And so much so that I would argue that I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, and I'm, and, and maybe it is, but the greater the sample size at some point, right? It's just, it just isn't possible, right? So maybe, it, maybe in a hundred arrows, it is possible. Maybe in a thousand, it's like, well, maybe. I think you need, I think you need better friends that shoot better, you know? It's well, like, sure, don't we all? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you see like a Levi Morgan shoot a hundred yard group, you're, you're like, buddy, you better aim at a different spot. You're going to bust your knock. Well, sure, but I've also <laughs> seen that guy wound deer at 70 yards. You know, it does sure. happen, and it's because of the variables that we talked about. I, yeah, I, I would yeah. argue. And again, again, I'm saying from a, a general masses perspective. Levi lives I, five minutes up the road from us here. That's so awesome. He's right here. For yeah, you. he shot a bunch of tournaments around here. Yeah, yeah. So, so my argument is if a person trains and that person trains and they're efficient at 100 yards, I would argue that they're more ethical um, for taking that shot at 100 yards then I would argue that many archers I'm with that you on go this one. the week before they 100%. pick up their untuned bow, they grab it, they go out there, and the deer's at 25 yards, and they lob one at it and shoot it in the ass. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with oh, you on no that doubt. One. I'm no with doubt. you on that it's, one. That, that's my argument. And so yeah. now you take Levi and you put him at 20 yards. Of course it's going to be a, a more guarantee of a shot versus a hundred i'm not comparing that archer at yeah. 20 and 100 i'm just trying to say um all fairness in taking in consideration for someone that's that spent their life training to be a proficient they've super tuned their bows they know they can hit that spot every single time at what distance is that going to be considered unethical now if they know they can hit the middle? Sure. So here's an, here's an interesting twist on this, like for the sake of fleshing it out. Um, like yeah. Jer Jeremy and I know, and you probably do to some people who are fantastic archers, you know, c can shoot that hundred yard, you know, every yeah. time, every time you put them 20 yards from a whitetail, you know, especially a big one, you know, Boone or a 200 inch deer. Uh, and they just, they cannot, they do break it. down. They cannot do yeah. it. Um, what do you what do you think? What do you attribute that to? So that's that's a form of target panic. Any way you look at it, you know, if they if they don't have control over their shot, not then target they, panic, right? But buck fever, different well, things. You think target thing. panic? No, no, it's not the same thing. Target target well, panic so, would be the mental fear of I've suffered from target panic. We probably all have. Can't get to yeah. the target. You rush a shot. Buck fever is overwhelmed with emotion, uh, adrenaline. Okay. So you're you're not saying like you're just saying that they are out of control with Can't, their, cannot their manage their emotions to be able to execute a good shot yeah so that's that's something that just takes years of experience and training so for me i was that way and all it took was me goofing up on about a half a dozen deer before i realized like hmm i have plenty of time to get excited after this deer happens or after i shoot the deer so when mm. i switch when i was young and when I see that deer, I go into straight kill mode. And I don't know if this was for being a quarterback or whatever, but when stress increases and the pressure increases, I I found myself doing better and better. Hmm. Like when there's more on the line, I do better. I perform better. For some guys, when, the, when there's more pressure, they do worse. And for those guys, they just need to retrain how they think about that whole situation and process. Mm -hmm. And so they get excited, all this stuff. Maybe it's them seeing the antlers, so they got to look away from the antlers. They can't look at the antlers anymore. Um, maybe it's a, a neurofeedback loop that they need to disrupt. Like, okay, I'm not going to shoot the deer. I'm just going to pretend I'm not going to shoot him. He's going to walk in. I'm going to draw back, and I'm just going to put my pin behind his shoulder and just see how it feels. 
I'm not at whack. I'm like, okay. And they get their self through that to where they can execute a shot. Yeah. Whatever they got to do to convince themselves that they are not going to make that shot. And then they do it anyways, that type of thing, whatever that ends, that's what that person needs to do. Yeah. And again, if that person can't control it at 20 yards, there's no reason if they can shoot a bottle cap every time at hundred, they should be shooting I agree. 20 yards. Sure. I agree. You know? And so I, I, I think in all fairness, you know, what's ethical and what's unethical really depends on the person. And they got to be honest with themselves and what they feel comfortable with doing. And agree. And I don't shoot white tails very far. Now that deer is an exception to the rule because that was, the only opportunity I was ever going to have at him. And, and it was during gun season with a bow. And I'd set that spot up for that 70 yard shot. It was basically, I knew if he was better on my place, I couldn't get to my deer stand. So I'd set up this other ground blind where I could get in and out without him knowing I was there and then shooting and shoot yeah. him. It, um, it so. is relative to Josh. I mean, a lot of the comments about that being unethical are going to come from whitetail hunters, like in the Northeast, the Midwest, where a sure. majority yeah. of, of shots happen 40 yards and in, you know, 40 is even a stretch. You know, you go out I to, you go out to the that. West, you know, guys are hunting mule deer. I mean, especially mule deer. You get out in the, the big open yeah. country. Yeah, it's 70, like, 80 they're yards. Like, Dude, if you're not shooting 70 yards, like that's, that's, that's their 20, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I do not, I, I've had many opportunities where I've passed giant deer at further distances because I'm like, oh, I'm not wounding them. There's no chance. Their, their reaction times are a little switched on more than other animals. Um, they move a lot more. They're usually not standing still. Mm -hmm. A dumb mule deer will stand up and just stare at you. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Take I'll a shot. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. They're a white tail. They're kind of feeding. They're moving. And, you know, that's where, you know, set up. Oh, my God. We could talk about, you know speed bows versus heavyweight setups i mean my there's so much that we can discuss and talk about and i'm happy to talk we'll about say it, we'll save it for the next one okay we'll that's um, a good, a lot good to topic though yeah that oh my god i got a lot to say on that that is very contradicting to what many people think but i've done the research and we'll we'll save it for a different podcast but holy smokes <laughs> Ashby was wrong. I'll just say that. Well, and, you'll uh, you'll take off a bunch of people well, by here, saying just that. Just because I gotta know. Don't let's not go into why. How heavy? Is, what are you shooting? Eighty pounds? Ninety pounds? Uh, we'll save it. I we get started. <laughs> on it. You're not even gonna tell us. <laughs> I'm gonna text you after this to find out. Yeah. So my setup right now, um, I shoot eighty pounds. How heavy um, is your arrow? Total uh, arrow weight. With the so on it. about five hundred to yep. 550 grains perfect typically. yep i'm with you so Fix, fixed blade or expandable oh expandable all day uh, <laughs> which one what, I, are you, what are you shooting i'll argue and say shooting fixed blades for most people is unethical yeah wow. I, I could agree interesting what uh, we what, shoot expandables yeah, as well let, let's talk about the fixed blade expandable thing <laughs> this is a short <laughs> a short conversation yeah a short argument, expandables but, or you suck well, uh, for, for the re up front here josh we are 100 percent on the side of expandables yep. we're, we're with you okay. yep well play you can play devil's advocate all you want but if you think the fixed blades are better you're wrong so we you not everyone can be right <laughs> no. so i am i'm totally okay with this because listen at the end of the day we don't put broadheads on the tip of our arrows for the perfect shots because you could shoot a deer in the heart with a field point and he will die. Yes. You, so, so why would you base your first 200 your, incher would disagree? Yeah. No kidding. Right. Goodness. Like, <laughs> yeah. The whole of my own argument. And, and so that's the point. It's like, okay, so what, so whenever you're shooting an expandable or fixed blade, you want to give yourself the greatest chance to kill that animal as fast as possible. Yep. And so what kills an animal fast as possible is blood loss, obviously organ damage and all those things. Yes. And whether you're successful or not successful will depend on where you hit that animal. So if you hit the animal bad, you want the greatest room of error to give you the greatest chance of recovering that animal. Preach. A small, <laughs> tiny fixed blade is good for one thing, and that's going through Getting the scavenger. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So. Okay, so let's take a, an entire deer, 100% of this deer. What percentage of that, that deer does this scapula take up versus the entire body cavity that it can die? Yeah, a quarter. What would you guys guess? Yeah, a quarter, maybe, maybe a quarter. Maybe 25%. Yeah. So you're going to sacrifice 75% for the one 25%. Yep. Like, and that's being, that's being generous because most of the scapula you can actually shoot through with 
with uh, a, we have a, a depending bear. on your arrow setup and your bow. Yeah, That's we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's the the ridge, you know, the rigid part that that keeps that that will stop you. But I, I mean, I've I've hit the scapula. We've all hit the scapula. Um, if you hunt long enough, it'll it'll happen. And so, my argument though is like shoot for the seventy five percent. And then shoot whatever's going to give you the greatest chance of recovering that animal and killing it as fast as possible. Because that's what's best for the animal. It's what's best for you. But then let's 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 break that down a little bit further. Okay, so what would you consider to be the number one thing that kills a deer? Penetration or shot placement? Shot placement. Shot placement, yeah. 100%, right? Okay, so let's dive down that rabbit hole a little bit better. It's, well, you Would, can't, sometimes in, in a small percentage, you can't have one without the other. That's that's where the fixed blade guys will live, but I see sure. what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But let's, let's keep going. I, we, can, we can keep going down this rabbit hole a little bit. So, okay, so shot placement's number one with basically having the minimum poundage to be able to get into the, the cabin. Get, get okay. In. Yep. So getting in. So now shot placement. So Shot placement, you got to hit where your pin is. So a more forgiving bow is going to be better on hitting that shot that you're aiming at, right? Mm -hmm. So is a fixed blade with an inch and a half cut or an inch and a quarter, whatever, on the tip of your um, arrow going to be more or less forgiving than a tiny sleek back? Uh, less yeah, forgiving. Yeah, less, obviously. Yeah. Well, of course, less forgiving. You have to be a tuning genius to get your fixed blades to fly where your field points are. Mm -hmm. So now you got to ask yourself, are the average guys willing to burn a $15 broadhead no. on practicing and burn up a three or $400 target by shooting their fixed blades in there? Or do you think most of them just thread one on? That's it. And again, that's no, it. that's they, exactly what it is. They, they shoot. They'll say, well, I shot all summer. Okay. When did you put your fixed blade on? Well, right before I started hunting. That arrow won't even come close. The the ballistic. I grew um, up that way, right? Admittedly, yeah, that's how too. I hunted. We all did. Gr growing up, I shot, shot, shot. I screw on muzzy hunter grains or whatever, or thunderbolt yeah. one twenty five, and you're out there. Yeah, and that's yeah. how you hunted. And and nothing against those guys; they don't know any better, you know. But then they gut sure. shoot their deer, and they're like, "Oh, dang it, man." Oh, I shoulder shot him and all this. And it goes back to shot placement being number one. Yep. Penetration is not number one. Shot placement's number one, which that's so important because now you got to screw on whatever's the most, the most, the broadhead that's going to give you the most forgiveness for that shot placement. Number yep. one. Number two, if, if you, if you hit where you're aiming, you're not aiming at the scapula. So, so having a bow that is extremely well tuned is really difficult for one unless you're a bow tuning genius i mean you guys know what it takes to tune a bow to get like yep. perfect arrow flight with bare shaft flight no nope, we don't we're, 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 we're working on <laughs> we'll it take it to the we're bow working shop. on it yeah. <laughs> okay well the bow shop guys i mean they're not making money when they're tuning your setup so they're not going to treat it like sure. like you would yeah if you had endless hours of, of time and commitment to this they're going to get it to where it shoots paper tunes yep, sure. and that's it yep. paper tuning is the step one of like a 40 step process of getting a bow to be extremely forgiving. Mm. And so, so you get all this stuff and then you, you get the dialed sight guys, you know, that are going to be dialing their pins and they, they, they get their sight tape matched to their field points and not that, but it's a hundred grains, a hundred grains. You're not taking consideration the drag coefficients he created from the, the, the broadhead, even if it is a hundred grains, which, Weigh your broadheads, people, because most of them are like 102 to 105 grains. Yeah. So that alone would make you miss, let alone the drag created from it. Now you need more vein on the back. And mm -hmm. there's all these problems that fixed blades cause. Yep. And if you super tune your setups and do all these things, fixed blades will work. That's fine. But I would argue that for most people, they should shoot big expandables where it's legal. And if they don't and they shoot a fixed blade, then practice with them. But then make sure your field points and your fixed blades hit decently close. Because if they don't, that tells me that your broadhead is not tuned very well mm -hmm. or your your whole bow is not tuned very well. I still think, and, and mainly because <clears throat> I've done it in the past, I think there's a lot of marginal shots with fixed blades that are never recovered and that deer dies. Yeah. Talk to anyone that does tracking dogs. Ask them, okay. 
which one do you find more of the fixed blade hits or the expandable hits? That's all you need to know. Yeah. And their answer is always the same. The expandables, which ones bleed more expandables or fixed blades? Expandables. Yes. And which I, deer, which I, I think you can have the best of both worlds too. So like everything you said, we agree with, I think a hundred percent. Uh, and my set setup sounds very similar. So I'm shooting a Hoyt 80 pounds, 500 grain arrow. Uh, yeah, I'm like right at 500 with, you know, ethics outsert with 125 grain head. We're shooting the severs have shot the rage tripans up until recently. I think the severs a slightly better build, uh, the, the two inch cutting diameter, the bigger one. Um, and so we basically advocate for building your, you know, obviously the more, the more poundage you have with the heavier arrow, the better penetration you're going to have. Uh, you have to have durability on the broadhead side of things. Hence our switch to the sever, you know, it's a titanium ferrule with like very good steel on the blades. Uh, and they also will pivot to accommodate for hitting a hard surface. Um, I don't think that there is a, 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 a percentage of the white tailed deer that I won't get through. So penetration is solved. Like I'm through it. Once I'm through it, I need it to main, have its integrity and cut as much as possible on the way through. Right. And so taking in consideration the, the animal and bone density, like I used a rage tripan or a rage hypodermic on a stag yeah. in Tanzania. And when it hit the blade or hit the ribs, it pivoted my broadhead out and it slid right down the side of them, slid them wide open. Yeah. And that was, there's issues. There's definitely issues. Sure. Yes. Everything I said was based on, based on, you know, white tail bodies and bone. Right, structures. right, right. Yeah. Things change when you start hunting Cape Buffalo and doing all that 100%. stuff. Well, dude, I shot an elk with that setup, 15 grains less because I was shooting 100 grains because tripan doesn't come in a 125. So I shot an elk and I got it through one of his shoulders at 25 yards uh, last year. So same setup, awesome. same. So 80 pounds, 475 grain total setup, 100 grain rage tripan, got through the front shoulder, uh, ultimately killed the animal. I ended up putting another arrow on him, but it was a single lung. He was still alive. Like maybe an hour later, we come up on him in his bed. Uh, Absolutely. I, so, you know, with that exact scenario, I'm like, man, I, I don't think I would do that again. I think with an elk, I would consider switching to a fixed head or increasing the weight of my, ideally the, the front of my setup. So maybe I switch to 150 grain sever, right? In the case of an elk, something like that. Yeah, that's there's so many arguments with that, but soon enough, you guys won't have to worry about any of that. So, Bomar Archery, we've been working on a project for two years, and we're having something launch this fall. You are, yeah, oh, yeah. And uh, this is actually the first time we've mentioned it, and it's it it is unbelievable. We have a mechanical broadhead that out penetrates fixed blades. Holy it is, shit, it is unbelievable. How, how do your how do your boys get some prototypes? Oh, we'll get you hooked up. Ah, I mean, right. it's, it is scary. It will be the sharpest mechanical broadhead in the world. Um, we use a very unique process with cryogenic freezing the steel to where it changes the molecular structure of the steel. It's uh, so then we can get the blades even sharper. It's basically um, an ice bath for your <laughs> for your broadhead. Yeah. How, yeah, how, exactly. uh, how well, heavy? Um, we'll do 100 grain and uh, 125s. Beauty. Cool. It, dude, it's it's badass, and uh, it, all of our studies are showing it out penetrates. I will use this giant expandable on Cape Buffalo Hippo, all of it. Holy it, shit, it, dude! It is it is so sick. It's it's got stored energy in the actual broadhead itself. So when it deploys, it actually gains energy. So it's okay. a net positive energy. It's insane. It's what? the first innovation in technology that's ever been innovated in the outdoor in the broadhead space to awesome. this level. Can't yep. wait it's to like see it. Elon Musk made it made a broadhead. So and it'll be fall excited. of 23. Yeah, it'll be available this August. Oh, so wow. Yeah, it's it's awesome, guys. I'm real excited about it. And uh, it solves a lot of these problems, too. But it's it's pretty sweet, guys. I I, I don't want to say uh, too much. No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Very cool. I'm excited about it. All it's right. uh, come fall. It is definitely it'll be I will be putting a massive dent into the the industry with the broadhead world. Have you killed anything I mean, with it yet? Did, did, like, have you hunted with it this past season or? Yeah. 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 So we're getting, <laughs> yeah. A, we're getting some crazy, we're getting past it. So there's um, the study, uh, this one of the neighbors, a guy that we get, that had um, this broadhead it was a worst design a couple years ago, um, but same technology. The, the neighbor wanted his horse killed, but they wanted it shot with a bow because they didn't want to shoot a gun and then scare all the other horses because they were all kind of in the thing 
So he shot one with one of these broadheads with 65 pounds on a horse and he got a complete pass through. Jesus. So, yes. <laughs> through, his so, lo- through the lungs, like through the ribs? Yeah. 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 Wow. Just straight ribs. Yeah. A so horse is a big uh, animal. What's that? What's a horse weigh? 750 pounds? It's, it's as big as elk. Yeah. I mean, 800 pounds? Longer. Yeah. You know, bigger. Wow. Yeah. So we're talking like a total game changer in the broadhead industry. <laughs> and uh, we cut no corners. I mean, literally, our blades are made in Germany. You know, the best for all the other components are sourced from all the best places in the world. And then we build them here in America. Fantastic. Which is pretty cool. Damn, awesome. dude. That'll be really cool. Can we talk price point at all or, or can't share yet? No, I, I mean, I'm, I want to, I, Whatever. you look That's at fine. all my products, you look at all my products. I don't price gouge anybody. Sure. Like my goal is not to make money off my fellow brothers. My goal is to give them a product that makes a big difference for them. So I'm trying, it's got a lot of tech in this and it costs a lot of money yeah. with all the patents and all this stuff. I mean, there's multiple patents involved around this, but I'm still going to try to make it to where the a broadhead for a three pack is um, 60 bucks or less. There you go. Damn. Yeah, there you go. That's right in the sweet spot for sure. Yeah. Well, Rage sells their it, no collars, nothing like that, which is also pretty crazy. I, I want to another that's pretty badass. Um, most mechanicals require quite a bit of force to actually deploy the broadheads. Yep. Uh, multiple pounds because the inertia of the shot will actually deploy the blades. Right. Mm-hmm. The way we engineered ours is as the shots fired, it actually sucks the blades into the ferrule more. So then there, the blades will never deploy no matter how fast your bow is, but on impact, it only requires one pound of force to deploy the blades where severs, all these are between severs, rages. Um, I mean, kill zones are really bad. They're like, I, they're up there in terms of poundage, but usually it's between three and like eight pounds of pressure hmm. that is just lost upon impact yeah and ours ours is only one pound to deploy the blades but then obviously with our technology it actually has a net positive in energy once it's deployed damn so you get penetration so very it's, cool it's man cool. that's awesome yeah it's i'm pretty pumped speaking about our it. language yeah. there it's nice to yeah, find somebody I, dude there's so many people that are like just down that and i don't i don't know enough about like the if there was a conclusion that ashby drew like to say that he, well he was wrong in terms of an application to bow hunting like i just don't think ashby was killing whitetails yeah <laughs> right right well, well and, and i also don't think anything a lot that, of his tests on african game which i've done yeah you know yeah. like like i want to get into that speed conversation real quick we can have that argument versus heavy versus light setups because it's kind of parallel and well so Speed a thousand percent gives you an advantage in the woods over heavyweight. Sure. If you had to pick one, pick a faster setup. You don't want to miss fast, but you want to shoot at the fastest speed that your bow will shoot accurately. And I found for me that that is between six and six point three grains per pound. So if you shoot seventy pounds, yeah, six point three times seventy is four hundred and some change, maybe four forty. So you should shoot a four hundred forty grain arrow up until about 55 pounds. Once you get around 55 pounds and less, that number needs to go up for energy. Yeah, for energy, yeah. Yeah, and so you're gonna need more weight to get in. And I found speed is definitely, all these guys that run crazy FOC, in, 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 they're they're just, they're, it's And it's not, not right. because you of know? penetration, right, Josh? It's because of other factors in the woods, like- Speed, lift. speed, you need speed. I mean, yeah. the reason is, is like, the, the number one variable that will change when you're hunting a whitetail deer is from the time you range, and this is most animal across the across the database, unless you're shooting them over a bait pile, is when you range, you either adjust your sight or you're hooking up your release and you're going full draw. And that animal is very likely not in the same place that you range. Yep. So now you either are watching and you're an expert on judging distance that he moved exactly 3.5 yards. Or your or dial slightly yards. off. Yep. Yeah. And all this, you're going to have to hold for those variabilities in that, the, into the yardage differences. And that is what make people miss more than anything else, uh, excluding target panic, obviously. All variables considered a perfect shot, yardage variances. What gives you the best advantage is a faster bow. Yeah. Because if you shoot a 700 grain arrow and you got a bow that's shooting 230 feet per second, that variable distance, <laughs> yeah. three yards, you'll miss by eight to 10 inches. Exactly. Yeah. And, yep. and like, and, and again, if people that argue, well, speed doesn't make a difference, then why is there speed limits in archery tournaments? Yeah. They would not have those if they didn't give you an advantage. And that's yeah. where as a hunter, you got to take in all those considerations for what is 
going to give you the greatest chance of shot placement. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it goes back to that. Shot placement, you need to let your bow shoot as fast as possible. Now, I, I've had a bow that I could get 350, but my groups were really big, you know, and I, I slowed it down. Even though it tuned well, everything well, it just shot big groups. I slowed it down and it shot, you know, better at that 310 to 325 range. Yeah. And then, you know, so you just kind of have to experiment a little with it. And you're, and you're obviously trying to achieve the best of both worlds. Like there's a reason at 80 pounds that you shoot 500 grain arrow instead of a, a 400 grain arrow. We, we right. want to maximize penetration with an adequate amount of speed, which you feel is in that 300 range. Yeah, but you just don't need that much weight. I shot a hippo that weighed 8,000 pounds on the run with a 570 grain arrow and buried it up half the arrow with a two blade broadhead. Yeah. So it was running. So I had this cross friction as the arrow went into it. I was only about 12 yards, but still yeah. I shot him at 22 yards standing broadside, buried it up to the fletchings. And then he was quartering away at about 35 yards and buried up almost to the fletchings. Well, and 570, um, that's a heavy arrow. I mean, that's most, yeah. most guys are shooting 65, 70 pounds and they're probably shooting like a 400 ish grain arrow. Four, Except four for the Ashby guys who are shooting 600 but, grains and up. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and those guys are, yeah. Heavy. Most of them. I've, I've lost way more animals trying to buy into that heavy arrow bull crap. Single, because single of, because of your arrow too. placement. Because of placement. Placement. Yeah, makes everything sense. was great and I was I was off just by a little bit. One of the biggest typicals I would have ever killed in my life. I, I misjudged um the distance because as I went full draw, I saw a deer out there. His name was Wowser, 176 inch perfect typical tin. Wow. Monster with small brow tines to give you perspective on yeah. how big this sucker was. And I went full draw and he freaking saw a doe out in the field, took off running. I stopped and misjudged it. I thought he went five yards, went seven yards. And it hit low above the white line, but missed his heart. And, he, and I never got him. And he survived. I had him on camera for a couple more years. Um, he got recently killed last year by the neighbor. But, hmm. but yeah, I mean, if I was shooting a faster bow, yeah, then I would have been fine. Yeah. So, so, like, in fairness, I, I think everything that Ash, whatever, you know, those, that, that, that world is, is preaching in terms of penetration. Like, I think most of that is right. Where Jeremy and I have and certainly what you're saying is also true is that people don't nearly enough consider the speed when it, you know, in terms of range, the difference, accuracy. Okay. So both are important when it comes to the penetration thing, like where Jeremy and I are like, it seems like overkill is we're like, yes, I, I want to penetrate a hundred percent of the time. We agree that FOC and arrow weight uh, and also speed and bow weight play a big part of that. But of this is just like your 20 yard, hundred yard conversation here. If I can penetrate a hundred percent of the time with my setup, wouldn't I also want to maximize the cutting diameter that I can get while I'm going through it. And that's where we stray away. I'm like, so with the arrow builds that we've got and the shots that we take, you know, whatever, we're going to penetrate a hundred percent of the time. We're going to get the pass through. So why not shoot an expandable broadhead that uh, gives us continued accuracy and gives me the biggest cut and blood trail along yeah. with that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the deer's cavity is only 11 inches thick. Exactly. You know? Why do you, if you shoot a big enough broadhead, you don't need a, I need a pass through for blood trails. Yeah, with a fixed blade. Yes. You put a yep. two and a half inch broadhead through, you think that little arrow sticking in it is going to block that blood trail? You're going to have a geyser of blood coming out. And that's and, all I want. I want, I mean, where I hunt in timber, I need blood to find that deer. If that, if I make a great shot and I don't have blood, there's a chance I'm not recovering that deer. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've, I've had the suspicion, Josh, that like, I think guys shoot deer with fixed bait broadheads and more often than with expandables don't find them because they don't have the blood trail. They think, you know, it, it must be a non-lethal shot. Yep. hundred percent. That happens a lot. And it also depends on which mechanical you use, you know? So like if you use an over the top type of broadhead, um yeah. like a grim reaper or swack or any of those we should clarify kind of we should clarify there's some bad expandable broadheads this is true a hundred percent and so that's where it depends you We're mentioned one like, of them that's that, sh that schwacker dude i'm not a fan really no I've, I've had some pretty good luck with them so i i but i did not have good luck with anyone other than levi's because levi's has that curved blade okay and in Africa, when we were testing that, we had the straight blade version with a smaller cut. Yeah. And they did not penetrate very well on with That's Sarah's what we've setup. seen. Yeah, yeah, the penetration was not Which good, is a problem with, because the entry hole is very small, right? Because there is right. no cut on contact. So if you don't get an exit wound, you don't have any blood. 
Yeah, exactly. But but we found with Levi's curved blades, man, it got at least thirty to forty percent more penetration. Okay, just by having the curved blades. And clarifying and so, on yours, Josh, is it a cut on contact? Uh, you know, esque blades back expandable. Yeah, so it's a it's a rear deploying broadhead. Um, that's our that's, that's our wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. so, dude, I you guys are gonna freak out when you see this thing. It is the nastiest looking broadhead. Can you share it with us like after this? Is that okay? Yeah, I'll, I'll, right, I'll send right. it to you guys. As long as you make sure not to I share promise. it. I promise. Yeah, we will. We promise. Yeah, yeah. I'll die. You can't <laughs> share it with anyone. We've been working on this for two years. We're not telling anybody. Yeah, yeah, no, secret right. safe here. Well, it's my, just, my it, engineer, it's... Our engineer and partner in this, I mean, David Hauser and I have just, I mean, we have solved so many crazy problems that were impossible to solve. And, nice. And so, but it's, uh, it's modular too, which is really cool. So we'll get it to a point to where you'll be able to build your own custom broadheads, which will be really yeah. bad. And I, I think that, um, you know, so many people talk about the arrow and obviously being very impactful and even the bow, but that broadhead thing is just, you know, to the, going back to the point of people shooting a field point, screwing in a, a fixed blade and just going hunting. Like that is so critical. I mean, it, it, it makes a right. You could have, you know, a fairly shitty arrow set up and have the right broadhead and kill every deer you shoot. Um, yeah. it, it just, it means so much in, at least in the whitetail world, right. When, you know, we're talking about that 11 inch wide type cavity, but I think there's so many people fall into, like, I just haven't been able to get this like single bevel, like movement. You know, it just doesn't make sense. To it's me. an obsession with the scapula. It like, just doesn't it just, make sense to me at <laughs> yeah, all, man. Just, I, w I grew up like there's the crease behind the shoulder. Boom. That's where I'm aiming right on the crease behind the shoulder. Yeah. The, the, so when I use my longbow and stuff like that, like right now I haven't tested our broadhead with my longbow, but like sharpness in that point, that sharp yes. point is what I found matters the most. Yes. Um, so like iron wheels are really good, right? Yeah. They, razor sharp points uh, yep. good blades but dude they freaking they're 120 bucks for a pack of three yeah i mean Expensive. i make good money I'm, I'm still going like dang yeah. this one hurts the pockets you yeah. know i'm like and, and how am i gonna pr i'm not gonna burn one of those up to practice are you kidding no. me yeah i'm like great if i'm gonna shoot them i have to and i'm like now i have to buy six and i'm like oh this stings yeah and i'm just thinking i'm like but they're so small but they they work really well, yeah, right? They do well. So you get the small diameters, you get the small diameter, you get the cut, the single bevel version versus double bevel. From all of my findings, I have not found a single difference in terms of penetration. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that you would argue with it, still the rotation, you may get more of a cut. Um, but with the scapula thing, that doesn't make sense to me. No, like it, it stopped. It, yeah, it stops the rotation. Oh, it cracks it and allows it to go through maybe. Um, but I, I'm not, I'm not buying it. No. But yeah. Ours, you know, I I'll tell you more about it uh, off thing, but you guys, it's very scapula friendly. Well, I'm you glad will... we're on the same page there from a rear deploy. I would expandable. say exactly the same page. I don't know if we've ever had anybody on that was on such the same page with, <laughs> with broadhead and arrow setup. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the reason, I mean, again, the, their argument, well, what if it fails and there are some brands out there that are more susceptible to sure. failure. You know, yes. you know, and so I understand that argument. Um, the ones I do like, I I know you don't like them, but the Levi Morgan Swackers, like those ones have a really low failure rate because they're in the cavity before they open, right? Mm -hmm. So quartering away shots are nice. I don't like that there's not big entry holes in case I don't get the exit. Sure. I mean, I've never but, had a failure with a Rage Tripan. I'll say that. Uh, one issue I've had with the Rage Tripans that I'm hoping to eliminate with the Severs is I have seen some instances where uh, my entry wound is essentially bigger than my exit wound so it on initial impact it'll expand to its fullest potential and then as it goes through by some way it'll they'll come back in Squeeze. a little bit and so i don't get the well, i don't so get the maximum but those severs lock they they lock out mm -hmm. all the way so they can't come back in mm -hmm. yeah so what what i found with with those um i've had rages fail on me in tanzania uh, or not Tanzania, but in in uh, um, New Zealand. When yeah, I well, and I should clarify they, that's on white tails for my angle, right? Yeah, I haven't had one fail on a white tail. I would I would argue rages are are pretty good now. What in terms of you know blade failure and all that stuff? I mean, you can look at the design and be able to tell. Yeah, they're like, not they're not well, tough 
tough blades by any means. Those tri pans. That I mean, look I, at I them when they I come know. when they come through a deer. They don't look good when they come out. Yeah, and if they kill the deer, I don't care at the end of yeah, the day. I'm sure. like, all right, if, if it causes trauma, fine. But the problem that what you're running into, Jared, is that bigger entry hole. All that is is a reflection of energy, energy lost. Energy lost, I knew what you were going to say. Pressing, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you're pressing that skin in. So if this is the cavity of the deer, that tip's pressing, pressing, pressing. You're getting to those deployment blades, but it takes so much energy to deploy the blades. Yeah. Well, now the blades are deployed. You have skin sucked in. Yeah. Like this, right? Bigger surface and so area. And then that skin straightens out. So you're getting that bigger cut due to the slap effect. Yeah. But all that is, is a direct reflection of like, oh, I lost a lot of energy because it pressed that into the cavity so far. I Versus almost, yours a, only needing a pound to open. Pound yeah. of pressure. So That's you it. won't have that skin suck in effect. It should be open and cutting through. Boom. Exactly. Well, yeah, yeah for sure. A hundred percent. And so what's, what's going to be kind of crazy about, about this too, you can shoot it out of a Raven crossbow. We did it. Um, hmm. It was still only one pound of pressure just by the engineering design of how the blades are positioned. They can't there. open up on flight. They, they cannot open on flight. Um, and it's only in most other people that don't take in consideration with certain, um, mechanical broadheads and the argument for the fixed blade is a lot of the mechanical deployment arms are almost an inch wide sure you know three quarters or the blade profile of a rage sticks way out like this you yep. know it's 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 still three quarters of an inch in flight diameter somewhere around there you know and and swackers are a full inch i think um yeah severs are like three quarters of an inch and so you'll and have shot, that drag still that that you're experiencing still dealing with that drag and yep. so we we designed ours. It's extremely aerodynamic to where it only has 0.64 inches ever exposed at once, hmm. which is really 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 narrow, um, which is super cool. And so you you guys will see how that design works and all that stuff. Very but, cool. Uh, yeah, it's uh it's super cool. But yeah, I mean, it, if I was to pick a mechanical that's currently on the market right now, God, I mean. I, I wouldn't shoot severs. Um, I shot severs for a couple of years um, and we just did not get good penetration with those. I wasn't getting pass throughs with 80 pounds. I thought hmm. that was weird. I've heard and that's the only thing I've heard about from them negatively <clears throat> is that. They can why, fix it. Why, that's why, person why, that's been building yeah, why do you think that is? It, the reason is, is because the way that their blades sit, their deployment arms stick above their blades. And so yeah. when they deploy, I know there's always going to be more more leverage yeah. on the outside of the blade, which pushes the front blades up. Yeah. And so you're losing a quarter of an inch of your surf cutting surface area. And it's like shooting a blunt tip through it and it grabs a ton of tissue yeah. and sure. just stops, slows stops. it down. That yeah. is like my one beef as I look at it. Other than like the rubber band is I, I noticed that, too. I'm like, why can't they fix that? Do you know? Do you know what he's talking yeah, about? Yeah. So when they open up, it's like yeah, the it's, it's the flat, deployment flat, arms almost dull. are catching it. Yeah. I mean, that's the yeah, besides it, the tip. That's your first contact into an animal. Yeah. Right. And so they need to just change the structure of how it's engineered. I mean, it's not hard. I I I could just call and tell them. You know, it's not difficult to change. We should, we should the call geometry them. of it. Uh huh. We should call them. Yeah, <laughs> because they make a good broadhead. I love the ferrule design. I like yep. the whole pivoting idea. Yeah. It's not bad. Um. It's it's okay, you know. The problem that I found with those is when it pivots, it usually just pivots into other bone. Mm. You know, like if they hit one rib, it just yeah. pivots into another rib. The time that it works really well, and it actually saved my wife a deer once, was it hit the spine, but because there was no other bones that it pivoted into, it pivoted around the spine and went right into the cavity. Yeah. Or if you just catch the edge of the scapula, it'll pivot know? around. Yeah. Okay. So not yeah. the, not the severs. I would shoot severs. I. I would probably say the Swackers overall. Uh, just Le Le Levi's Swacker specifically. Levi's specific because they sharpen the deployment blade, so you at least get one inch cut mm -hmm. on the inside. Yeah, that bleeder. Yeah. Yeah, those that cut. And then you get the entry wound. And if you shoot enough poundage, you're you're in good shape. Yeah. Um, yeah, that the entrance is my only concern with the Schwacker is that I you know, I like the cut on contact. So if I don't get a pass through Right, shit happens. Well, and I'm trying to remember. I have a blood trail to remember and a significant yeah. one. When I shot those swackers, what? Because uh, our, our our arrow setup has evolved since then. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure. Yeah. 
And Bo's got more efficient. Yeah, Bo's you were probably shooting Maximas back then. No, I wasn't that. I I may have been Full Metal Jackets. Yeah, maybe. So yeah, oh, you were yeah. just balanced overall heavy. Yeah, <laughs> just heavy I arrow. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, I, uh, that'll be interesting, I probably, man. But, I mean, you've thought August, it through. Yeah, come, come August, there's going to be something else that people can 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 buy. Yeah, because we haven't so. we haven't shot severs yet. I yeah, mean, yeah. No, full disclosure, like we're we're basically transitioning from we've shot the rages, and I haven't shot anything with the sever. So, like, I I think it looks good. I like the design. I also see the issues that you're having with them. I've heard of other people saying the same thing that you're saying. So. Um, yeah, I mean, go watch this video of this deer. I shoot him at 27 yards out of an 85-pound bow with a 500-grain arrow, and I don't get a pass through. And yeah. that was I with mean, a sever? It was with a sever. But, dude, if you get in there, their blades are sharp, and yeah. the blood trails are insane. Um, yeah. And I've shot those and tested them. They're very durable. They don't break very easy. I appreciate a lot of things about that broadhead. But man, that's that one little thing. Man. Yeah. I mean, because there's not, there's not much worse than seeing that you know you know it's a good shot but then seeing that arrow just stop dead like yeah. i just i don't like that at all yeah that's the that's the 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 fixed blade argument there so they're like yeah. well i would get a i'd pass blow through right it through like, it yeah yeah and so again that argument is comparing a really good expandable to a a any fixed blade yeah. because there's bad fixed blades too and so that's i just want to be clear with that i mean there are quite a few bad ones out there but the broadhead industry hasn't had any innovation for a really long yeah, time. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, it, it has, uh, Sever is one of the newer, newer ones New out there. I mean, they've been around for yeah. five years. Yeah, but it's so. still, least, I mean, right? it, it's, five, yeah, yeah five, it's pivoting they, off they shoot of really well. They shoot really well quartering away. Um, I've shot animals almost ass to me and they go right in. Nice. They don't, they do not pivot away from that, which is, which I can appreciate. Yeah. So they keep on their line. So Sever's up there with the rear deploys. If I was to shoot one on a deer, I would probably shoot a rage. Hesitant about that. If I was to pick between a rage and a sever, my life depended on it. I'd probably shoot a sever just because I shoot enough poundage. I'm not too worried about right. The better, loss. it's better metal, better, better build. Yeah, exactly. But if I was to have my wife shoot with the, rage. the buck, yeah, I'd probably have her shoot a rage between the two. Yeah, but. If I had to choose between all three of the ones I've discussed, I'd have her shoot a swacker from Levi yeah. for sure. And the trend continues, because, dude, as you decrease poundage, like there does come a point where I don't think I would recommend an expandable at all, frankly. Uh, well, agreed. and maybe, you know, you brought up some really good points about accuracy and it definitely does affect that. Um, but as far as getting enough penetration, like at, at a 50, I don't know, 40, 50 pounds, wherever well, I mean, it sounds like stuff. it sounds like yours would because if it's got a one pound, yeah, you know, open, ours, ours would be the only one on the market. Low where kinetic I would energy. About yeah, well, I mean that goes. that's super interesting because I don't there isn't there is no other expandable broadhead that has better penetration than a fixed blade, correct? I mean, generally speaking, I guess no, it can't. No. Depends I mean, on the broadhead in terms of how they've all been designed with net loss, right? I mean, they right. they they. they all can. right, let's wrap this up so I can see the thing. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's, I'm, it's awesome. I'm curious. No. I, I I'm not. I when I tell you a fact, I'm not revealing it on the podcast, but I'll tell you guys off. When you hear how this thing works, you're going to be like, "Oh my god, I need." Why didn't right I now. think of that? They're, 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 they're cool. I mean, dude, we, I just can't wait to share it with someone because I've been so freaking pumped <laughs> about this thing for so long. I mean, this is a huge sticking over. point for us, and people yeah. listening to this know it. In that, because Jared and I are just. We, we hear it from a lot of different people and we just, we don't care. Like we're just an expandable guy. Like we want, this is what we want. We know what works, right? And, and given we're talking about whitetails predominantly here, we know right. what works. There are improvements that can be made. It's just, man, if, if you make this, like we're in. For, for raids, frankly, if they said, hey, we'll make a tri pan that's a little tougher in a 125, we probably would have never changed, but they didn't, right? They stayed at a hundred. Now what you're talking about, it it's got interest peaked yeah. a lot. Yeah, it's it's super cool. And it's been needed, honestly. I think a lot of these big corporations that buy these broadhead companies, everyone's sales are good, everyone's buying it. They don't need to innovate. They don't and innovate. The they, industry they, they doesn't have... innovate anymore, man. I mean, that's just it. Like, think of the innovation, you know, really, it's besides cell cams in the last, I don't know, 10 years. 
there's just not been much innovation. The only at like, all. if you want to call it innovation has been like adapting compound broadheads for crossbows. That's what's happened in the past couple of years. It's it's terrible. And it makes me really sad because people think innovation happens automatically and it doesn't. No. And it, there was a time when the industry was coming out with new stuff. ATA was so exciting. Oh. Like, what's coming out this year? This is going to be insane. It's all the, the technology with scent control and then broadhead innovation and tree stands and bows. Like everything was just growing. And then all these big corporations started buying up the innovators and just freaking put them on NDAs, non-competes, and then the whole thing went and took a crap. And it drives me nuts, yeah. which is why I'm so excited about what we're working on. Because, I mean, we've got so many products that no one even knows about that we're working on. And I love this. I mean, this is where I eat and breathe. I spend my money in the hunting space and well, create products for everyone. And there's still, there's a lot, you know, I think that situation that you're talking about in the industry has created like a, there's a stagnation of innovation and there's issues right like with broadheads is one of them we talked to another one on this podcast is like the frequency that's put out from these cell cameras it's like there's opportunity for innovation yeah uh, it's, it's just, just a lot of these companies don't want to do it because they're all about dollars and cents and and shelf space I and mean, they don't really care because if they're the only option on the shelf then what the hell is the people going to buy they're going to buy the only option on the shelf that's what and they the believe and these big companies that buy these these other companies, the people at the head of those big investment firms don't even hunt. No, so of course, of course they're putting yeah. people that are working their job. Like, hey, I would need your I need you to help me make something new for this year. There's no real motivation for them to make something so revolutionary. You know? Yeah, we call it the and grunt so, call wars. It's like a new grunt call every year. And it's like, no, it just makes the same. Those have only gotten worse. It's like, <laughs> give me that. Where do I find that old Magnum Roar? That's uh, the only one I, I, that's the only that's one I need. That's the only one I want, man. <laughs> Magnum Roar, I love it. Yeah, and that's the, again, I'm with <laughs> you guys. I'm with you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, we're working hard on a lot of projects to, to it's needed, man. That. I mean, it, it, so. because there is a group of us that thrive. I mean, we think this every freaking day, every day, yeah. it's all we think about. And so when you, when you lack innovation and change, I mean, frankly, we just start bitching about the same shit over and over again. Cause there's nothing else to talk about and we're not going to not right. talk about it. So I like, guess just yeah, exactly. It and, and physics doesn't get in the way for a lot of innovation for this, especially with broadheads. I mean, you should see some of the stuff we're working on. You'll see the, the one we're coming out with soon, but man, dude, there is some really cool stuff that can be done and it, it needs to be done. You know, if it, it helps you become a better hunter, a better shot, you know, then, then you need to have that for the, the efficacy of the animal and, and efficiency for you as a hunter, all that stuff, it matters. And it's sad that that's not a priority anymore for a lot of these big companies. It's not but for us. You know, that's that's where I eat and breathe every day is just innovating products and trying to make something better and cool. And I mean, you know, it's uh, it's just one of those things I just I'm super passionate about and love. And I'm excited to finally it's been a couple of years since we brought a new product to the market. And so it's been uh, it'll be launching this August and it'll be the first one for that. I think everyone's going to really freak out about. Heck yeah. Well, I mean, one thing I can say, dude, is I think a lot of people, if they listen to this at this point, I don't even know how long we've been on a while. Um, I would say that you're going to change a lot of minds in this podcast, not, not giving Jared and myself any credit whatsoever, but, um, you know, I, I think you're a misunderstood dude out there. Uh, just the way that content comes off and, and, you know, Jared was the first to tell me the other day when he talked, he's like, He's like, listen, he's like, Josh sounds like he's a pretty cool dude, you know? And it, and yeah. it's, and we don't mean that disrespectfully. It's just a lot of the times when people watch you and they see how frankly over the top passionate or excited or, or to yours, you know, like the eternal optimist in you, right. They're just like, ah, dude, he's just a big douchebag. You know, that's just how he, and it's, I think hearing this, like, I mean, dude, you're just like us. I mean, you you live this thing. You love this stuff, which is like, it's refreshing for Jared and I to have these conversations. It's why we do this podcast because it's like, man, there's got to be other people like us out there that they just think this, they just eat this, they breathe this. They like, they just want to talk about this all the time. Um, and right. I, I think people, I, I hope people that. listen to this and, and say there were, there were comments already. I just took like a little picture when we were on this thing. And they're like, they're like, please, you know, hopefully Josh, I, I'm able to give Josh another, another shot here. 
And I don't think that's disrespect to what you've done in the past. I just think that the misinterpretation that comes with your platform, um, you are always under scrutiny. And it's not that you guys are doing a bad job either, like that you need to change your content at all. It's like, it's, there's definitely a jealousy fact. There absolutely Absolutely is. Huge. You know, and it's not that, I don't think Jeremy and I thought, you. oh, Josh Josh is a bad dude, but all you hear about is like all the Nebraska thing and all this and that. And it's like, we don't know. Like, unless we get them on and talk, I mean, even you heard our uh, our Brandon podcast. It's like, we, we don't know. I don't know, Josh. We're speculating. Here's what we've heard. And like, so yeah, my comment to, to even from our very first interaction, dude, I, that's what I told you, man. I was like, this guy's like, just like us. I was like, this, this, I was like, Josh is a cool dude. I was like, I like him. <laughs> Thanks. Well, for me, you know, I, I appreciate you saying all that stuff and, and my personality, I'm, I'm an extrovert, obviously uh, on the outside, but I'm also very analytical. So I really think about problems and do all this stuff. And then when I get the solution, it's, it's so exciting for me that yeah. I, it's just comes across pompous, almost chauvinistic instead of just truly optimistic and excited about finding a solution or my deer or all this stuff. Cause you got to remember for me, I'm still that kid that grew up on a gravel road. Yeah, I get no it, neighbors, man. I get you know, it. Taking my TV gun out and shoot my first squirrel. That's where I live. And so when I see a big deer coming out and I'm just like, Oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. Or I shoot a fish and it's like, I just shot this giant fish. Like that's just the way that I am or I hit the bullseye or any of that yeah. stuff. It's just so exciting for me. And it can come across, you know, very, you know, polarizing, I guess would be the word. And definitely my personality, just the way that I look, I bring it upon myself. You know, I, you know, I do a lot of the things that I'm doing on the farm shirtless. And so I'm like, okay, now I got to put a shirt on that I'm sweaty and covered in grass and I'm doing all this for, I'm like, this sucks. I'm just doing it shirtless. Like this, yeah. like the yeah. fly trap videos. Like, a lot of the stuff, I, I mean, most of you guys probably do the same thing. And, oh, you're breaking breaking the like the rules of of nature. It's like you're not allowed to be like handsome and funny and a genius and like yeah. you know, have all this successful business, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Like people don't want to see that. Uh, but well, oh, there. Sure. I think to Jared's point on the jealousy, it, it's big. And and you know, I, I'm glad you kind of ta- told that story about the fitness side of things because. You know, uh, I'm an entrepreneur myself. I've had many failures. I've also been blessed to have many successes. And sometimes when I talk to people, I see their eyes roll on me like, oh, this dude just buying, spending, you know, 500 grand on this piece of ground or bragging about this. And it's like, dude, I had no land ever growing up, right? So like I get excited about getting on my tractor and planting a two acre food plot because I've never been able to do that before. Like, and this is my... And so like, I don't do it to brag. I do it because like, it's such an amazing feeling that I want to share it with other people. At the same time, I completely can understand if I'm on the other side and it seems like it's coming off as I'm bragging about it. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's hard for you too. Like you imagine if you, every single day you went on and told your entire story of how you got to where you are and you're able to buy a $500,000 piece of track. Like people would be like, okay, I get it. You're this super super dude that hit it big and had all, I mean, people would get annoyed with that. So you can't, there's can't. a time and a place for it and it's yeah. hard. And, and for me, I, I don't do a good enough job sharing that I get up at four 30 in the morning. Like this morning I got up at three fifty nine just because I was getting up before I said three fifty nine is better. And so set my alarm for three fifty nine. I got up and before that we got on the podcast at eight 30, you know, I went to the gym, I did the sauna, I did um, a little bit of cardio and did the cold plunge when I got home. I went submerged up to my neck in, you know, 39 degree water. And then after did all that, still didn't eat nothing, got dressed and came to the office. And and so my entire hardest part of my day is done before most people wake up. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't show that. And so they're like, this is impossible. How do you look like that? And, and still do all this other stuff. And it's like, well, I sleep on average five to five and a half hours a night. And most you know? people don't want to do that. And that's fine. We get that. It's just yeah. you're not going to get these other things if you don't sacrifice and work super, super hard. Like you're not going to – you can't just live a normal life and work eight to four and think like all these things can just happen. They're not right. They're not going to happen. No, and, and that's the thing. It's like what you do from nine to five – is what will put food on the table but what you do from the nine to the five is what will set your life up for for the for your generations you know and eventually that nine to five or i mean the five to the nine after your working hour because you got to provide for family pay bills and do all that stuff but most people 
in their life, they prioritize entertainment over education. Huge. And that's the biggest mistake. Yep. They, they prioritize entertainment over education. When they get home, they watch Netflix instead of read a book. They, they, when they drive in their car, they, they listen to the radio and memorize a song instead of memorizing, you know, business strategy or, you know, some sort of skill they're lacking in and all of that. And that's the real difference maker for, for a lot of people is what they're prioritizing in their quote unquote free time. And most people, instead of stepping up and, and doing the work, getting up early, going to the gym, not making excuses, they just fall back and they'd rather point fingers. And that happens. And I understand it. I put myself out there online or on the internet and the way that I generate content sometimes can be more, you know, clickbaity and, and that could be taken way out of context for sure. But I mean, at the end of the day, you got to create content, how people's palates are tuned to digesting it. Yep. And with TikTok and all this stuff, it's just changing. And if, if you sit back and say, I'm stuck in my ways, I'm going to keep filming and, ed and doing my thing. You're going to be the people that was in radio saying TV is a fad. It's never going to last. Mm -hmm. You're going to be the Facebooker that says Instagram's going to be a thing of the past. I'm sick into my Facebook and now you're left in the dust. Same thing with Instagram. TikTok's just going to be this little thing. It's never going to take off. But instead of asking yourself, you say, okay, well, why are people so gravitated to these new platforms? What is it about this content that's being created that makes this so more digestible than everything else. And you pay attention to all the clues. Next thing you know, that's all going to start transforming how you generate your own content because the youth is going to dictate how people view and watch content in the future because the youth get older. And mm -hmm. guess what the youth does? They show their older siblings, their brothers, their fathers, their moms, whatever. A, look at this cool video and the parents like it. Next thing you know, there's moms on TikTok, dads on TikTok, whatever. And they're all watching some short condensed videos. And so I post things the way that I post things because that's the right way to do in order to continue to grow an audience. Now, the audience growth is not the goal, but I enjoy sharing my, my videos with as many people as possible. No different than if you were telling a buck story. How fun is it for you to tell the story of how your deer died to the very first person you called? It's, it's exciting, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then as you tell it over and over and over again, it gets diluted. Yeah, he came in. I shot him at 20 yards by the time he told, told it for the 100th time. Yeah. And it, yeah, right, yeah. He came <laughs> in for 20 yards. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. You know? And so for me, when I film a hunt, I get to share that first time, like how you share that story with that first person when you're still in the deer stand of what happened. That's what I get out of sharing a hunt to thousands and millions of people. And, and I love that. And so I want to make sure I'm still reaching as many people as possible by changing the style of content that I create to make it as palatable as possible to the generations that are watching. And I don't know, for me, it's uh, it does require some change and some difference. And, and unfortunately, that can come across chauvinistic, pompous, however you want to say and, and categorize me as a douchebag. You know, I get that a lot. And, and I get it and understand. If I looked at myself through the lens that they see, I would think I'm a douche too. Yeah, yeah but, but I mean, but, look at your platform and I think, you know, it's not in a cocky way, but you just kind of have to like point at it and be like, well, doing something of right. Course. Right. I mean, yeah. that's what it comes well, down to. Maybe, you know, it's, but we, we are growing really fast and, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. You know, our YouTube channels definitely exploded, which I'm really grateful for. And I think we're, we just hit 800,000 subscribers. Wow. Morning, so. That's awesome. That's so, amazing. Yeah. Man. Very proud. We're rounding, yeah, we're, we're, ra we're rounding quick to 20,000. <laughs> yeah. We're getting there. We're getting there. It's so huge though. I mean, be grateful for that. We are grateful for it. Absolutely. It, what it took me 14 years to build on YouTube it took me 14 years to get to 100 million views, and that was posting pretty consistently. And then what we did in in 14 years, we started doing every single week um, mm -hmm. just recently. And so it was wow. crazy. And it's scaling down to where we're still doing, you know, between 150 and, and 200 million views a month. But that's what's so nuts is like it just it the, the hardest part is at the beginning. But changing the way that you you maybe film your content or edit it and changing it to where it's just more palatable to a lot of people, you'll get further ahead. And I think you we're know, all I, open to that. It's just it, it's kind of like you, Josh, like this is just 
how Jared and I do things in our style and, yeah. and, you know, we love this part of it. Like we're not going to force it to, well, you know. w- well, we love sharing like, uh, our perspective with people in this format, mm-hmm. right? That that's what it is. Yeah. So. And this is great. I love this long form for, for, for format yeah. because here's the other thing you have to remember how you gain a follower is not the same as how you gain a fan yeah. doing stuff like this is how you gain fans. Because how you gain followers, more of the clickbaity stuff, they kind of plug into the matrix. But if you never actually give them value to their life, other than just like, oh, look how good I am at doing X, Y, and Z, like that might get you a follower, but they're not, that's not going to make them like you. Right. Um, so how you get someone to like the, the platform and like your content to a point to where they become a fan is value driven content where you, are producing stuff that they enjoy and that enhances their life. You guys share a lot of information that people can take and the guests you have, they can pull bits and pieces like grocery shopping and they're like, oh man, this is really what I needed in my life. I'm I'm about to do this and I just learned something from there. So your your database, you're doing it right. You, you're saying a lot of helpful things and, and I don't see why your platforms aren't going to continue to keep growing. Sure. I think the transparency is the, if, if we could put a finger on something that, that I think we do well, that's like, it's not uh, super uh, innovative. It's like, we're just being true, just being truthful, having honest conversations about how we feel about it. You know, everything from mechanical broadheads to uh, crossbows, to what, to crossbows <laughs> and corn piles. Right. So, and it's just, you know, there's not a, enough of that. There's a lack of it in the industry. And yeah. So, we don't sugarcoat it. So well, a lot of people can't because you think about the Faradines and all these big corporations, what else do they own? Yeah. They own crossbows. They own a yeah. lot of competing products. That's right. And so if you're collecting a check from one of those companies and you go out there blasting crossbows, guess what they're going to do? They're going to come down hand and fist on you. So a lot of the influencers actually are handcuffed by their sponsors of what they can say and not say, yeah. which is why Sarah and I would never take the sponsorship route. Mm. They're like, screw that because it's not important enough for us. Yeah. And, and but if you're going to use the product anyway, yeah. and, and that's where it gets yeah. weird, right? Well, like, and, and you I, can't, you, I, we, we can't even really blame the content producer either. Cause it's like, that, that is the very nature of the industry it has been since we were all kids. It's like the manufacturers hold the to. dollars, you know, you have to pay to have your show on the outdoors channel. Right. And you, so you, you need, need sponsorships. You need to have money. It's a business. And, and, and I'm not against sponsorships. I'm against people that get quote unquote over sponsored and force the product. Yeah. I promote products all the time that I use that yeah. I don't even get paid for well, why wouldn't I just collect a check if I'm going to promote them anyways? Hey, give me, you know, a thousand bucks if, if I'm going to do that. Well, why wouldn't I do that? And so I'm not against sure. sponsorships. I'm against the people that 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 sign up for sponsorships for products they don't like, don't use, and don't believe. hundred percent. We, we agree. That, yeah, that's a bit, my man. I, yeah, I mean, it's, but, it's, it's all over. Because Jared and I have partners on this podcast. We use the products. We've mm-hmm. been using the products. We use them anyways. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's also and not very many for that reason. I was going to say, it's also reason. not our main revenue source. So, you know, but, but you need, but you need to have some sort of income coming in. So it is important, but I mean, for you guys, I mean, to have sponsors, I think that's really important and great. Again, it's like, oh, this show is sponsored by Lamborghini and I don't drive one, but here you go, guys. I, I like mm-hmm. them and thank you guys for sending me a check. You can feel it whenever it's forced. Yeah. No and that is the detriment to a lot of things, but a detriment to a lot of content is when it's forced like that. Absolutely. And, diluted down. Yeah. and hopefully not the detriment to this industry as, as a whole. I, I mean, it was on its way. I, I do think that YouTube and things like that have taken us away from what was a death spiral because, I mean, that's all it was. This entire industry was driven by who paid me last year didn't want to pay this year. So I'm now saying this is the best crossbow or this is the best trail camera or whatever. Um, but I think right. YouTube exactly. has pulled us away from that just a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, it helped, you know, and, and that's the number one rule I have because we obviously own archery companies and we sponsor people because it's a great way to market products. I'm like, well, you got to love the product. You got to sure. actually use it. Yeah. And, um, and like, if they don't actually like it or use it, I don't care how good they are. Yeah. Why but would you yeah, sponsor I, them? Makes no I'm sense. Like, I'm like, no, I don't care. I don't, I don't need your name. You know, I, I want you to be able to use the product and make sure you like it. Cause you'll promote it differently whenever you actually use it and like it. It's just a lot and easier that- to promote it when you actually use it and like it. And I think that your audience receives it way better. 
Oh, hundred percent. I agree. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, again, want to be clear, I'm not against sponsorships. It's just, I hate when they control the narrative sure. yeah. and, and don't allow people to actually express themselves, which you guys don't seem to care. About. <laughs> yeah, we don't give a shit. It literally is in the contract. It's kind of like, Hey, we do. What we're we a partner, <clears throat> but we're going to do what we want anyways. You know, I love it. That's, it's, what, you it's sign nice up. that's what you sign up for. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is so awesome. Uh, it's refreshing to hear, you know, whenever I listen to your guys' uh, podcast. Uh, cool. Thank fun, you. Man. Well, listen, dude, yeah. we appreciate it. We took up a shitload of your time today, but I, I really do think, um, I mean, thank you. I mean, because it, it's a cool to have this discussion and, and again, meet somebody that is very much on our same plane of like, this guy eats it, he sleeps it, he breathes it like this. These are the people we want to talk to. And I, I really think that a lot of our audience is going to listen to this and say, oh, shit, maybe I, I had it wrong about Josh Bomar. Yeah. Or maybe they're like, God, I was definitely right. He is. Yeah. <laughs> what a, what a, what a douche. What a douche. Well, dude, the fact, the, fact that you, the fact that you showed up and like took four or five hours out of your day here to, to take this like yeah. seriously and, and, you know, the conversations leading up to this, I think goes a long way for us and says a lot about who you are as a person. And uh, so we thank you for that. Yeah, no problem, guys. I know we're all in the same bow hunting family. We all love bow hunting, and I appreciate the heck out of that. Anytime I have a conversation with a fellow family member in the bow hunting community, I, it's fun for me. I've seen what you guys are doing. It's great, and I'm happy and grateful to be a part of it. Awesome. We appreciate your support. No problem. Thank you, man. See you guys. All right, buddy. See ya. Woo! <laughs> I don't know if I need a like cigarette after that or like what. Uh, a cigarette sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> we could go for a cigarette. It's like four and a half hour podcast. It may be the longest yet. Dare I say, Josh Belmar's pretty legit. I mean, I would have to say I don't know if I was skeptical coming straight into the podcast because we had some discussions about it, but two three weeks ago, yeah, I would have been pretty skeptical of it. Uh, hearing him out. Dude's legit in my book. Yeah, he, I like him. <laughs> he has he has he has changed the changed my perspective on Josh Bomar. Yeah, from from three weeks ago and before to now, it is. Uh, I would dare well, call the dude I, a friend. And I didn't have a, a, any bad content but it's just unanswered questions about like most recently has been the, the Nebraska lawsuit and it just ne you know negative uh, whatever media. But uh, so well, I think it all comes. It all ends up. You know, and it and, is third and, party. And for, in fairness, skepticism around the amount of success he's had on 200 Amount enters. of success. Nebraska. This whole truck incident. The bear thing. Like, all of this stuff comes together. And then you kind of watch Josh, who admittedly is kind of this, like, happy-go-lucky, you know, eternal optimist dude. And you're like, guy just seems douchey to me. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's too, too much, right? And he would admit, and I think... Like he's a bit over the top. Like mm -hmm. when he figures these solutions out, he is a bit over the top on it, but it's just him, you know? And I mean, that's why we kind of have these podcasts is like you have that conversation and like, I'll come out of it and say, yeah, he's not a douchebag. Like it, Josh is legit. Like he's just like us. Yeah. Dude loves it, eats it, you know, sleeps it, how he comes off and how he says it. And I think to, I think he pointed out like his stature makes it seem different. Like, if he was built like me, probably wouldn't come off nearly as douchebag. Well, that's like. what I said. Is like pe people don't want to accept that somebody can. That's what I'm saying. Is is be that built? You know, be that handsome, be that funny, be like all the success that you see somebody have. Yeah, so people don't like, want to oh, believe he's fake. there's got to be something. He's, there's something he's fake about. Yeah. No, he just. I mean, <laughs> like. You know, it's crazy. The dude didn't mean to burn his freaking truck up. <laughs> like yeah. it's in his. It was stupid, and he knows it. I shouldn't have did it, but like, you know, I, I think just again, how all of these things kind of play into it. Um, the Nebraska thing, it, it's a weird piece. Cause like interesting how he admits like, yeah, we should have known better, but clearly he did nothing wrong. Well, and dude, I can, I can sympathize with their position in that. If like, not that they were having as much success as some other people, but they were having some success and, and hunting a really cool place in Nebraska. So I, I can understand like not wanting to admit that maybe you kind of think something not right is happening because yeah, nobody wants to do that. Yeah, you don't want to disrupt the relationship you have with that person, and but and that doesn't make it right. And that's you know, I think Josh is uh, well to the evidence to though that, that that evidence would not look good, right? If you were saying no, we're completely innocent, 
Yeah. And that evidence starts coming out. It would not look good across, yeah. especially the board. with sounds like the friendship that maybe he had with uh, mm-hmm. with the owner and stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, having asked him directly, like I. Uh, you know, I believe that he's innocent of, <laughs> to of Josh's, all the prior charges. To Josh's credit on this one, it, I mean, that's the best explanation I've heard on the whole situation. Yeah, well, it just took the right person asking the question. <laughs> like, <laughs> everything else I've heard before, I'm just like, that's a bit sketchy. I get, you know, yeah. but that was pretty freaking clear. Yeah. Um, On that. So, I mean, yeah, I, it, you know, and obviously uh, the, the kind of what started it for us was like, yeah, all right, this dude's killed six, two hundreds, like something you got 4,000 acres, you know, of which a, a large chunk of it is in Iowa. It's worth questioning. It's, I mean, dude, because it's just like, uh, I think he appreciated the question. He does for it. sure. Well, it's, and you know what? I mean, it, there's a lot to be said for just like being a good person and doing the right thing. Cause there's been a lot of opportunities sure. where after a win you get investigated and then it turns out like you're legit. Mm-hmm. And I know probably not everybody can say the same, um, you know, cause no. so no, that wasn't like a low key jab at anybody. <laughs> That's just like a, could have been, you know, th- no, it, been. no, it's just a, you know, there, there's uh there's a lot to be said for just uh, living your life above mm-hmm. reproach and doing things legit. And, it, you know, if you can have success with those, you know. Uh, yeah, good for him, man. I mean, obviously from a business side, you know, even what we talked about, some off podcast stuff. I mean, the dude is is smart. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure Sarah is too. Um, you know, and obviously they have a very, very successful business. Mm-hmm. Like super, I mean, Bo, Bomar Archery is very successful, Right. But I mean, in terms of like their Bomar nutrition, like that, that is a serious company. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I, I think that, and it's not by chance like that they're smart. I, maybe that's where it's kind of, you know, almost comical a little bit is like the Josh that you see in the content versus like, you know, talk to Josh from a, like a legitimate financial business. Like he's smart, but if you watch the content, that's Josh having fun. And so you don't get that like Josh smart business type guy. Right. Yeah, sure. Um, but to his point, it's, it's two different things, right? They do Bomar archery and stuff because in bow hunting, cause they love that side of things. Right. That, that is their passion. Uh, as is the fitness side. It's just the Bomar nutrition is the business end of things. Mm. Um, kind of business in the front party in the back type of thing. Yeah. So, but no, cool to have Josh on and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I I would say come out of there and say, you know, if you had second uh, second guess or you had doubts about Josh I, Bomar, I'd, I'd, I'd reconsider him. I'd say he's hunter certified. He is hunter certified. We'd have to get him like a triple X shirt or something. I don't know what size <laughs> he wears, but yeah, I, I I would say that he's he's legit, and I I would definitely um I I probably take back anything I said about him in the past. <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah no well, that's what it's all about dude Ch- it's changing cool, your man. mind and yeah you know, meeting good people and cool discussion that is what it. we're doing so we appreciate josh coming on and uh we'll catch y'all next week later take me oh.